The Prose Edda by Snorri Sturluson. Translated by Arthur Gilchrist Brodur, 1888 to 1971. Translator's Introduction. The life of Snorri Sturluson fell in a great but contradictory age, when all that was noble and spiritual in men seemed to promise social regeneration, and when bloody crimes and sordid ambitions gave this hope the lie. Not less than the rest of Europe, Scandinavia shared in the bitter conflict between the law of the spirit and the law of the members. The North, like England and the continent, felt the religious fervor of the Crusades, passed from potential anarchy into union and national consciousness, experienced a literary and spiritual revival, and suffered the fury of persecution and of fratricidal war. No greater error could be committed than to think of the northern lands as cut off by barriers of distance tongue and custom from the heart of the continent and in consequence as countries where men's thoughts and deeds were more unrestrained and uncivilized even as england france and germany acted and reacted upon one another in politics in social growth in art and in literature so all three acted upon scandinavia and felt the reaction of her influence Nearly thirty years before Snorri's birth, the Danish kingdom had been the plaything of a German prince, Henry the Lion, who set up or pulled down her rulers as he saw fit. And during Snorri's boyhood, one of these rulers, Valdemar I, contributed to Henry's political destruction. In Norway, Sverir Sigurdsson had swept away the old social order and replaced it with one more highly centralized, had challenged the power of Rome without and that of his own nobles within, like Henry II of England and Frederick Barbarossa. After Sferi's death, an interregnum followed, but at last there came to the throne a monarch both powerful and enlightened, who extended the reforms of Sferir, and having brought about unity and power, quickened the intellectual life of Norway with the fructifying influence of French and English literary models under the patronage of this ruler hakon hakonarsson the great romances notably those of chretien de Troyes, were translated into norse some of them passing over into swedish danish and icelandic somewhat later matthew paris the great scholar and author who represented the culture both of england and of france spent eighteen months in norway though not until after snorri's death iceland itself in part through norway in part directly drew from the life of the continent simunder the learned who had studied in paris founded a school at odi sturla sigvatsson snorri's nephew made a pilgrimage to rome and visited germany and snorri himself shows in the opening pages of his heims kringla or history of the kings of norway the influence of that great romantic cycle the matter of troy snorri sturluson was in the fullest sense a product of his time the son of a turbulent and ambitious chieftain sturla Tordsson of fam in western iceland he was born to a heritage of strice and avarice the history of the sturlung house like that of douglas in scotland is a long and perplexed chronicle of intrigue treachery and assassination in all of which snorri played an active part but even as among the douglases there was one who however deep in treason and intrigue yet loved learning and poetry and was distinguished in each so snorri involved by sordid political chicanery found time not only to compose original verse which was admired by his contemporaries but also to record the myths and legends the history and poetry of his race in a prose that is one of the glories of the age the perplexing story of snorri's life told by his nephew sturla Tordsen, may well be omitted from this brief discussion a careful and scholarly account of it by erica magnusson will be found in the introduction to the sixth volume of the saga library from snorri's marriage in eleven ninety nine to his assassination at the hands of his son-in-law gizur torvaldsson in twelve forty one there was little in his life which his biographer could relate with satisfaction his friends his relatives his very children snorri sacrificed to his insatiate ambition 
as chief and as lawman he gave venal decisions and perverted justice he purposed at any cost to become the most powerful man in iceland there is even ground for belief that he deliberately undertook to betray the republic to hakon of norway and that only his lack of courage prevented him from subverting his country's liberty failure brought about his death for snorri who had been a favourite at the norwegian court incurred the king's suspicion after fifteen years had passed with no accomplishment and daring to leave norway against hakon's command he fell under the royal displeasure gizur his murderer proved to have been acting at the express order of the king eriker magnusson in the admirable biography to which i have referred attempts to apologize for snorri's faults on the ground that he really compares very favourably with the leading contemporary godar or chieftains of the land it is true that he made no overt attempt to keep his treacherable promise to norway but i think it is by no means certain that repentance stayed his hand indeed familiar as he was with the hopelessly anarchical conditions of his native land its devastating feuds its plethora of lawless unscrupulous chiefs all striving for wealth and influence none inspired with a genuine affection for the commonwealth nor understanding the fundamental principles of democracy snorri may well have felt that it were far better to endure a foreign ruler who could compel union and peace if this was the motive underlying his self-abasement at the norwegian court and his promises to hakon then weakness alone is sufficient to account for his failure if he had no such purpose he must be regarded as both weak and treacherous it is with relief that we turn to snorri's works to find in them at least traces of genuine nobility of spirit the unscrupulous politician kept sound and pure some corner of his heart in which to enshrine his love for his people's glorious past for the myths of their ancient gods half grotesque and half sublime for the christ-like boulder for promethean odin and tyr sacrificing eye and hand to save the race for the tears of freya the tragic sorrows of gudrun the pitiful end of svanhildr the magnificent all devastating fire of ragnarok his interest in these wondrous things like scott's love for the heroes beliefs and customs of the scottish folk was i think primarily antiquarian indefatigable in research with an artist's eye for the picturesque a poet's feeling for the dramatic and the human he created the most vivid vital histories that have yet been penned accurate beyond the manner of his age gifted with genius for expression divining the human personalities the comic or tragic interplay of ambitions passions and destinies behind the mere chronicled events he had almost ideal qualities as an historian poet he was too though the codified rules the cryptic phrase and conventional expression which indeed bound together the words of the singers of ancient scandinavia must spoil his verse for us yet it is well to remember that in his own lifetime not his natural prose but his artificial poetry was famous throughout the north snorri's greatest work is undoubtedly the heimskringla beginning with a rationalized account of the founding of northern civilization by the ancient gods he proceeds through heroic legend to the historical period and follows the careers of his heroes on the throne in eastern courts and camps or on forays in distant lands from the earliest times to the reign of sverrir who came to the throne in eleven eighty four five years after the author's birth the materials at snorri's disposal says magnusson were oral tradition written genealogical records old songs or narrative lays such as tildos tale of the inglings and avin's haloga tale poems of court poets that is historic songs which people knew by heart all from the days of hairfair down to snorri's own time and most store he says we set by that which is said in such songs as were sung before the chiefs themselves or the sons of them and we hold all that true which is found in these songs concerning their wayfarings and their battles of the written prose sources he drew upon he only mentions ari the learned's book probably as it seems to us because in the statements of that work he had as implicit a faith 
as in the other sources he mentions and found reason to alter nothing therein while the sources he does not mention he silently criticizes throughout rejecting or altering them according as his critical faculty dictated before snorri's time there existed only separate disjointed biographical monographs on norwegian kings written on the model of the family sagas of iceland snorri's was a more ambitious task discerning that the course of life is determined by cause and effect and that in the lives of kings widely ramified interests national and dynastic came into play he conceived a new idea of saga writing the seed of cause sown in the preceding must yield its crop of effect in the succeeding reign this the writer of lives of kings must bear in mind and so snorri addresses himself to writing the first pragmatic history ever penned in any teutonic vernacular the heimskringla the evidence for snorri's authorship of heimskringla is not conclusive but Figfusson's demonstration is accepted by most scholars. We may safely assume, apart from the general tendency of the external evidence, that one and the same author must have written the histories and the prose edda. A comparison of the names of skalds and skaldic poems mentioned in both works will show that the author of each had a wide acquaintance with the conventional poetic literature of Scandinavia, particularly of Iceland, and that, if we suppose two distinct authors, both men had almost precisely the same poetic equipment each of the works under consideration begins with a rationalization of the odinic myths and reveals an identity of attitude toward the ancient faith furthermore the careful reader will be charmed with the sinewy style of both the heimskringla and the edda and will be obliged to admit the close similarity between them in structure and in expression finally vigfusson has shown that they exhibit occasionally a remarkable identity of phrase the prose edda is undoubtedly by snorri it is preserved in three primary manuscripts codex regius early fourteenth century codex wormianus fourteenth century named from ole vorm from whose hands it passed in seventeen o six into the hands of arni magnusson and codex upsaliensis about thirteen hundred perhaps a direct copy of snorri's own text this last manuscript and also the arna magnaean vellum number seven forty eight which preserves a portion of the text testify unmistakably to snorri's authorship the codex even gives in detail the subjects of the three divisions of the book these three divisions but for the evidence of the manuscripts might seem to afford ground for assuming plural authorship the first part the gilfagining or beguiling of gilfi is an epitome of odinic mythology cast in the form of a dialogue between gilfi a legendary swedish king and the triune odin snorri though a christian tells the old pagan tales with obvious relish and often in the enthusiasm of the true antiquary rises to magnificent heights ever and again he fortifies his narrative with citations from the poetic edda the great treasure house of scandinavian mythological and heroic poetry one passes from gilfagening to skalds kaparmal with very little shock in spite of the great difference in subject and treatment which the author has attempted rather skilfully to modulate through a second dialogue the questioner this time is one egir and replies are made by the god bragi famed for eloquence and the gift of poetic expression this intermediate dialogue called bragaredur or bragi's discourses strikes the keynote of the entire book and really reconciles the first section to the second and third whose dissimilarity to gilfagening had led some scholars to believe that one or the other is not snorri's work the god relates several adventures of the aesir of the same character as those recounted in gilfagening and concludes with a myth concerning the origin of the poetic art from this point on barely maintaining the fiction of the dialogue snorri makes his work a treatise on the conventional vocabulary and phraseology of skaldship for the guidance of young skalds the third section of the edda is the hatatal or enumeration of meters and combines three separate songs of praise one on king hakon a second on skuli bardson the king's father-in-law and most powerful vassal 
and a third celebrating both. Each of the hundred and two stanzas of the work belongs to a distinct metric type or subtype, and between stanzas Snorri has inserted definitions, occasionally longer notes or comments. We are now in a position to see the purpose and the artistic unity of the prose Edda. The entire work is a textbook for apprentice poets. Gilfagening, conceived in the true antiquarian spirit, supplies the mythological and legendary background which in the christian age that had superseded the vivid old heathen days a young man might not know or might avoid do not lose sight of these splendid tales of the fathers snorri by implication says to the youthful bard but remember always that these old legends are to be used to point a moral or adorn a tale and not to be believed or to be altered without authority of ancient skalds who knew them Belief is sin. Tampering with tradition is a crime against scholarship. The second and third sections, Skalds Kaprama and Hatatal, offer the rules of composition and drive them home by means of models drawn in the one case from acknowledged masters of the craft, in the other by the example of a complete skaldic trilogy, the work of a man who was accepted by his own time as a worthy successor of Bragi, Kormaker and Einar. A needed transition from the literary to the technical portion of the book is supplied by Bragaridur, which narrates in the same spirit as Gilfagening further useful tales and concludes with a mythological account of the skaldic art. Even the prologue, which many scholars consider spurious, is an integral part of the work, a fact established by Snorri's single address in the character of the author to beginners in this apostrophe he refers to the prologue remember these tales are to be used only as chief skulls have used them and must be revered as ancient tradition but are neither to be believed nor to be tampered with regard them as i have indicated at the beginning of this book the beginning of the book is a summary of the biblical story of the creation and deluge followed by a rationalized account of the rise of the ancient pagan faith according to which the old gods appear not as deities but as men the word edda as applied to the whole work has long furnished scholars with material for disputation the different theories regarding it need not be restated here it is the translator's personal opinion that magnusson's etymology if not established is at least the most satisfactory one likely to be offered Magnusson points out that Snorri passed the interval between his third and nineteenth years at Odi, under the fostering of the grandson of Simundur the Learned. The Simundur, who had studied at Paris, had founded a school at Odi, that Snorri became the author of a book which was called Edda, and that this book contains in its first section a prose paraphrase of many of the songs from the elder or poetic Edda, together with a number of quotations from that work. Now the poetic Edda was ascribed by its earliest recorded possessor, Bishop Brynjolf Svensson, to Simondur. And while it is improbable that Simondur composed the poem, it is highly probable that it once formed part of his library at Odi. There Snorri may have learned to know it, and we may assume that he gave the prose edition the name of its poetical original. That original, the mother manuscript, he thinks would naturally have been called the book of or at odi which would be expressed in icelandic either as odabok or as edda following in the latter case accepted linguistic laws snorri's familiarity with the elder or poetic edda is demonstrated by his frequent quotations from voluspa havamal grimnismal vafrudnismal alvinsmal or alvismal and grotansungr he knew Lokasena as well, but confused three stanzas, apparently failing to remember the order in his original. One poem that he mentions is lacking in the poetic Edda as we know it. Heimdallr Galdr, the song or incantation of Heimdallr. Moreover, he makes seventeen citations from other poems, which, although lost to us, evidently form portions of the original Eddic collections or belong to the same traditional stock the disappearance of the manuscript which snorri used is a great loss the first translation of the prose edda was published at copenhagen in sixteen sixty five when the complete text appeared 
with Latin and Danish interpretations. This was entitled Edda Islandorum on Chronicum 1215 Islandice conscripta per Snoronem Sturlai nunc primum Islandice Danice et Latine ex antiquis codicibus in lucem prodit opera p j resengi the standard danish translation is that of r nierup copenhagen eighteen sixty five in seventeen forty six j gurinson printed at upsala the first swedish version with a latin translation gurinson's original was the codex upsaliensis anders upstrom made an independent translation in eighteen fifty nine in seventeen fifty five and fifty six there appeared at copenhagen a work of the greatest importance for the study of scandinavian antiquities in england malaise monument de la mythologie et de la poésie des celtes et particulièrement de anciens scandinaves this book which comprised a general introduction on the ancient scandinavian civilization a translation of gilfagening and a synopsis of skalska parmal and hatatal was turned into english by bishop percy under the title of northern antiquities percy claimed to know gurunson's text as well as the french northern antiquities was published at london in seventeen seventy and was reprinted at edinburgh in eighteen o nine with editions by sir walter scott the best-known translation and the only complete one which is at all trustworthy is that in latin combined with the icelandic text in the arnamagnean edition copenhagen eighteen forty eight to eighty seven in eighteen forty two g w dasent the translator of njal's saga and a prominent scholar in the scandinavian field printed at stockholm his prose or younger edda which contains a translation of gilfagening and of the narrative passages of skalska parmal a similarly incomplete english version was printed at chicago in eighteen eighty by rasmus b anderson professor anderson also edited a combined translation of both eddas the poetic edda by benjamin thorpe and the prose edda by i a blackwell blackwell's translation which stops with braga redur had first appeared at london in eighteen forty seven together with an abstract of erbigya saga by scott samuel lang's translation is likewise incomplete a french version of gilfagening la fascination de gulfi was published at strasbourg by f g bergman a second edition appeared in eighteen seventy one so far as i can ascertain the first translation into german was the work of friedrich ruse berlin eighteen twelve this contains a long historical introduction and ends with the story of the Wulsungs in skalska parmal karl zimrock's die jüngere edda published in eighteen fifty one and reprinted in eighteen fifty five although incomplete is more accurate than any earlier translation and is remarkable for its literary excellence the most scholarly rendering into german is by hugo gering leipzig eighteen ninety two but unfortunately includes only the narrative portions of the book until nineteen hundred the best edition of snorri's edda was by torleifer jonsson copenhagen eighteen seventy five this was superseded by finur jonsson's splendid danish edition in nineteen o seven professor jonsson produced an icelandic edition which forms volume forty one of the islandinga zuger published at reykjavik it was fortunate for me that these last two editions appeared before i began my work professor jonsson provided me with an excellent text and second in value only to this with an index and an invaluable icelandic prose rephrasing of the skaldic verses i regret exceedingly that the highly technical nature of hatatal forbids translation into english there are to be sure more or less usually less accurate translations into scandinavian and into latin even in the excellent arnamagnean edition many of the glosses are purely conjectural in any attempt to convey into english a vocabulary which has no equivalent in our language must fail skaldska parma however is here presented complete for the first time in english to those who have helped me i wish to express my deepest appreciation first of all to professor william henry schofield i owe a debt of gratitude 
which is more than four years old and has increased beyond computation dr henry goddard leach my first instructor in scandinavian literature gave me my single greatest intellectual stimulus and thereby determined the current of my work dr frederick w leader of harvard university deserves my thanks for his devoted assistance in reading proof a task as dreary as it is essential i am also indebted for valuable suggestions to mr h w rabe of simmons college it is a great satisfaction to acknowledge these debts incurred in the course of a labor which has been my delight for several years i should however do injustice to those who have aided me as well as to myself if i did not assume full responsibility for the faults of the translation whatever these may be i trust that the book may perform some service in bringing before the english reading public a greater portion of snorri's classic treatise than has previously been accessible the reader will perceive the value of the edda if he will compare it for legendary and antiquarian interest with the mabinogion and will also realize that the edda is a masterpiece of style style that no translator can ever reproduce a g b cambridge massachusetts july first nineteen sixteen end of introduction prologue in the beginning god created heaven and earth and all those things which are in them and last of all two of humankind adam and eve from whom the races are descended and their offspring multiplied among themselves and were scattered throughout the earth but as time passed the races of men became unlike in nature some were good and believed on the right but many more turned after the lusts of the world and slighted god's command wherefore god drowned the world in a swelling of the sea and all living things save them alone that were in the ark with noah after noah's flood eight of mankind remained alive who peopled the earth and the races descended from them and it was even as before when the earth was full of folk and inhabited of many then all the multitude of mankind began to love greed wealth and worldly honour but neglected the worship of god now accordingly it came to so evil a pass that they would not name god and who then could tell their sons of god's mighty wonders thus it happened that they lost the name of god and throughout the wideness of the world the man was not found who could distinguish in aught the trace of his creator but not the less did god bestow upon them the gifts of the earth wealth and happiness for their enjoyment in the world he increased also their wisdom so that they knew all earthly matters and every phase of whatsoever they might see in the air and on the earth one thing they wondered and pondered over what it might mean that the earth and the beasts and the birds had one nature in some ways and yet were unlike in manner of life in this was their nature one that the earth was cleft into lofty mountain peaks wherein water spurted up and it was not needful to dig longer for water there than in the deep valleys so it is also with beasts and birds it is equally far to the blood in the head and the feet another quality of the earth is that in each year grass and flowers grow upon the earth and in the same year all that growth falls away and withers it is even so with beasts and birds hair and feathers grow and fall away each year this is the third nature of the earth that when it is opened and dug up the grass grows straightway on the soil which is uppermost on the earth boulders and stones they liken to the teeth and bones of living beings thus they recognized that the earth was quick and had life with some manner of nature of its own and they understood that she was wondrous old in years and mighty in kind she nourished all that lived and she took to herself all that died therefore they gave her a name and traced the number of their generations from her the same thing moreover they learned from their aged kinsmen the many hundreds of years have been numbered since the same earth yet was and the same sun and stars of the heavens but the courses of these were unequal some having a longer course and some a shorter from things like these the thought stirred within them that there might be some governor of the stars of heaven one who might order their courses after his will and that he must be very strong and full of might this also they held to be true that if he swayed the chief things of creation he must have been before the stars of heaven and they saw that if he ruled the courses of the heavenly bodies he must also govern the shining of the sun and the dews of the air and the fruits of the earth 
whatsoever grows upon it and in like manner the winds of the air and the storms of the sea they knew not yet where his kingdom was but this they believed that he ruled all things on earth and in the sky the great stars also of the heaven and the winds of the sea wherefore not only to tell of this fittingly but also that they might fasten it in memory they gave names out of their own minds to all things this belief of theirs has changed in many ways according as the peoples drifted asunder and their tongues became severed one from another but all things they discerned with the wisdom of the earth for the understanding of the spirit was not given to them this they perceived that all things were fashioned of some essence two the world was divided into three parts from the south extending into the west and bordering on the mediterranean sea all this part was called africa the southern quarter of which is hot so that it is parched with the sun the second part from west to north and bordering on the ocean is called europa or enea its northern part is so cold that no grass grows upon it and no man dwells there from the north and all down over the eastern part even to the south is called asia in that region of the world is all fairness and pride and the fruits of the earth's increase gold and jewels there also is the centre of the earth and even as the land there is lovelier and better in every way than in other places so also were the sons of men there most favoured with all goodly gifts wisdom and strength of the body beauty and all manner of knowledge three near the earth's centre was made that goodliest of homes and haunts that ever have been which is called troy even that which we call turkland this abode was much more gloriously made than others and fashioned with more skill of craftsmanship in manifold wise both in luxury and in the wealth which was there in abundance there were twelve kingdoms and one high king and many sovereignties belonging to each kingdom in the stronghold were twelve chieftains these chieftains were in every manly part greatly above other men that have ever been in the world one king among them was called munon or mennon and he was wedded to the daughter of the high king priam her who was called troon they had a child named tror whom we call thor he was fostered in thrace by a certain war duke called luricus but when he was ten winters old he took unto him the weapons of his father he was as goodly to look upon when he came among other men as the ivory that is inlaid in oak his hair was fairer than gold when he was twelve winters old he had his full measure of strength then he lifted clear of the earth ten bearskins all at one time and then he slew duke loricus his foster-father and with him his wife laura or glora and took into his own hands the realm of thrace which we call trudheim then he went forth far and wide over the lands and sought out every quarter of the earth overcoming alone all berserks and giants and one dragon greatest of all dragons and many beasts in the northern half of his kingdom he found the prophetess that is called sibyl whom we call sif and wedded her the lineage of sif i cannot tell she was fairest of all women and her hair was like gold their son was loridi who resembled his father his son was einridi his son vingitor his son vingener his son moda his son magi his son seskef his son bedvig his son atra whom we call anar his son iterman his son heremod his son skjaldan whom we call skuld his son biaf whom we call biar his son yat his son gudolfer his son finn his son friallaf whom we call friedleifer his son was he who is named Vodin, whom we call odin he was a man far famed for wisdom and every accomplishment his wife was frigida whom we call frigg four odin had second sight and his wife also and from their foreknowledge he found that his name should be exalted in the northern part of the world and glorified above the fame of all other kings therefore he made ready to journey out of turkland and was accompanied by a great multitude of people young folk and old men and women and they had with them much goods of great price and wherever they went over the lands of the earth many glorious things were spoken of them so that they were held more like gods than men they made no end to their journeying till they were come north into the land that is now called saxland there odin tarried for a long space 
and took the land into his own hand far and wide in that land odin set up three of his sons for land wardens one was named vegdeg he was a mighty king and ruled over east saxland his son was vitgils his sons were vita heingester's father and sigar father of svebdeg whom we call svebdegir the second son of odin was beldeg whom we call baldr he had the land which is now called westphalia his son was brandr his son frodigar whom we call frodi his son freovin his son uvig his son gavis whom we call gave odin's third son is named sigi his son reyrir these the forefathers ruled over what is now called frankland and thence is descended the house known as Vulsungs. from all these are sprung many and great houses then odin began his way northward and came into the land which they call reitgotland and in that land he took possession of all that pleased him he set up over the land that son of his called skuldr whose son was Freelifer, and thence descends the house of the skuldungs these are the kings of the danes and what was then called reitgotland is now called jutland five after that he went northward where the land is called sweden the king there was named gilfi when the king learned of the coming of those men of asia who were called aesir he went to meet them and made offer to them that odin should have such power in his realm as he himself wielded and such well-being followed ever upon their footsteps that in whatsoever lands they dwelt were good seasons and peace and all believed that they caused these things for the lords of the land perceived that they were unlike other men whom they had seen both in fairness and also in wisdom the fields and the choice lands in that place seemed fair to odin and he chose for himself the site of a city which is now called sigtun there he established chieftains in the fashion which had prevailed in troy he set up also twelve headmen to be doomsmen over the people and to judge the laws of the land and he ordained also all laws as there had been before in troy and according to the customs of the turks after that he went into the north until he was stopped by the sea which men thought lay around all the lands of the earth and there he set his son over this kingdom which is now called norway this king was semingar the kings of norway traced their lineage from him and so also do the jarls and other mighty men as is said in the hale Gjatal. odin had with him one of his sons called ingvi who was king in sweden after him and those houses come from him that are called inglings the aesir took wives of the land for themselves and some also for their sons and these kindreds became many in number so that throughout saxland and thence all over the region of the north they spread out until their tongue even the speech of the men of asia was the native tongue over all these lands therefore men think that they can perceive from their forefathers names which are written down that those names belong to this tongue and that the aesir brought the tongue hither into the northern region into norway and into sweden into denmark and into saxland but in england there are ancient lists of land names and place names which may show that these names came from another tongue than this end of prologue gilfagening sections one through ten here begins the beguiling of gilfi one king gilfi ruled the land that men now call sweden it is told of him that he gave to a wandering woman in return for her merry-making a ploughland in his realm as much as four oxen might turn up in a day and a night but this woman was of the kin of the aesir she was named gefjun she took from the north out of jutenheim four oxen which were the sons of a certain giant and herself and set them before the plough and the plough cut so wide and so deep that it loosened up the land and the oxen drew the land out into the sea into the westward and stopped in a certain sound there gefjun set the land and gave it a name calling it zelund and from that time on the spot whence the land had been torn up is water it is now called the luger in sweden and bays lie in that lake even as the headlands in zelund thus says bragi the ancient skald gefjun drew from gilfi gladly the wave troves freehold till from the running beasts sweat reeked to denmark's increase the oxen bore moreover 
eight eyes gleaming brow lights, over the fields wide booty, and four heads in their ploughing. 2. King Gilfi was a wise man and skilled in magic. He was much troubled that the Aesir people were so cunning that all things went according to their will. He pondered whether this might proceed from their own nature, or whether the divine powers which they worshipped might ordain such things. He set out on his way to Asgard, going secretly, and clad himself in the likeness of an old man, with which he dissembled. But the Aesir were wiser in this matter, having second sight, and they saw his journeying before ever he came, and prepared against him deceptions of the eye. When he came into the town, he saw there a hall so high that he could not easily make out the top of it. Its thatching was laid with golden shields after the fashion of a shingled roof. So also says Tjoldolfr of Vin that Valhalla was thatched with shields. On their backs they let bean, sore battered with stones, Odin's hall shingles, the shrewd seafarers. In the hall doorway, Gilfi saw a man juggling with lances, having seven in the air at one time. This man asked of him his name. He called himself Gangleri and said he had come by the paths of the serpent and prayed for lodging for the night, asking, who owns the hall the other replied that it was their king and i will attend thee to see him then shalt thou thyself ask him concerning his name and the man wheeled about before him into the hall and he went after and straightway the door closed itself on his heels there he saw a great room and much people some with games some drinking and some had weapons and were fighting then he looked about him and thought unbelievable many things which he saw and he said all the gateways ere one goes out should one scan for tis uncertain where sit the unfriendly on the bench before thee he saw three high seats each above the other and three men sat thereon one on each and he asked what might be the name of those lords he who had conducted him in answered that the one who sat on the nethermost high seat was a king and his name is har but the next is called Jafnhar, and he who is uppermost is called Thridi. Note, high, equally high, and third. Then Har asked the newcomer whether his errand were more than for the meat and drink which were always at his command, as for every one there in the hall of the high one. He answered that he first desired to learn whether there were any wise men there within. Har said that he could not escape whole from thence unless he were wiser and stand thou forth who spearest who answers he shall sit three gangleri began his questioning thus who is foremost or oldest of all the gods har answered he is called in our speech allfather but in the elder asgard he had twelve names one is allfather the second is lord or third of hosts the third is nikar or spear lord the fourth is nikudr or striker the fifth is knower of many things the sixth fulfiller of wishes the seventh far-speaking one the eighth the shaker or he that putteth the armies to flight the ninth the burner the tenth the destroyer the eleventh the protector the twelfth gelding then asked gangleri where is this god or what power hath he or what hath he wrought that is a glorious deed har made answer he lives throughout all ages and governs all his realm and directs all things great and small then said Jafnhar, he fashioned heaven and earth and air and all things which are in them then spoke thridi the greatest of all is this that he made man and gave him the spirit which shall live and never perish though the flesh frame rot to mould or burn to ashes and all men shall live such as are just in action and be with himself in the place called gimle but evil men go to hell and thence down to the misty hell and that is down in the ninth world then said gangleri what did he before heaven and earth were made and har answered he was then with the rime giants four gangleri said what was the beginning or how began it or what was before it har answered as is told in voluspa erst was the age when nothing was nor sand nor sea nor chilling stream waves earth was not found nor ether heaven a yawning gap but grass was none then said jafnhar 
it was many ages before the earth was shaped that the mist world was made and midmost within it lies the well that is called vergelmir from which spring the rivers called svul guntra fjorm fimbatul slider and hrid srilger and ilger vid leipter gul is hard by hell gates and thridi said yet first was the world in the southern region which is called muspel it is light and hot that region is glowing and burning and impassable to such as are outlanders and have not their holdings there he who sits there at the land's end to defend the land is called surtur he brandishes a flaming sword and at the end of the world he shall go forth and harry and overcome all the gods and burn all the world with fire thus is said in voluspa surtur fails from the south with switch-eating flame on his sword shimmers the son of the war gods the rock crags crash the fiends are reeling heroes tread hellway heaven is cloven five gangleri asked how were things wrought ere the races were and the tribes of men increased then said har the streams called ice waves those which were so long come from the fountain heads that the yeasty venom upon them had hardened like the slag that runs out of the fire these then became ice and when the ice halted and ceased to run then it froze over above but the drizzling rain that rose from the venom congealed to rhyme and the rhyme increased frost over frost each over the other even into ginungagap the yawning void then spake jafenhar ginungagap which faced toward the northern quarter became filled with heaviness and masses of ice and rhyme and from within drizzling rain and gusts but the southern part of the yawning void was lighted by those sparks and glowing masses which flew out of muspelheim and thridi said just as cold arose out of niflheim and all terrible things so also all that looked toward muspelheim became hot and glowing but ginungagap was as mild as windless air and when the breath of heat met the rhyme so that it melted and dripped life was quickened from the yeast drops by the power of that which sent the heat and became a man's form and that man is called ymir but the rhyme giants call him argilmir and thence are come the races of the rhyme giants as it says in voluspa the less all the witches spring from vitolf all the warlocks are of vilharm and the spell singers spring from swarthead all the ogres of ymir come but concerning this says vaftrudnir the giant out of the ice waves issued venom drops waxing until a giant was thence are our kindred come all together so it is they are savage for ever then said gangleri how did the races grow thence or after what fashion was it brought to pass that more men came into being or do ye hold him god of whom ye but now spake and jafenhar answered by no means do we acknowledge him god he was evil in all his kindred we call them rhyme giants now it is said that when he slept a sweat came upon him and there grew under his left hand a man and a woman and one of his feet begat a son with the other and thus the races are come these are the rhyme giants the old rhyme giant him we call ymir six then said gangleri where dwelt ymir or wherein did he find sustenance our answered straightway after the rhyme dripped there sprang from it the cow called audumla four streams of milk ran from her udders and she nourished ymir then answered gangleri wherewithal was the cow nourished and har made answer she licked the ice blocks which were salty and the first day that she licked the blocks there came forth from the blocks in the evening a man's hair the second day a man's head the third day the whole man was there he is named buri he was fair of feature great and mighty he begat a son called bor who wedded the woman named besla daughter of Butorn the giant and they had three sons one was odin the second vili and the third ve and this is my belief that he odin with his brothers must be ruler of heaven and earth we hold that he must be so called so is that man called whom we know to be mightiest and most worthy of honour and ye do well to let him be so called seven then said gangleri what covenant was between them or which was the stronger and har answered the sons of bor slew ymir the giant lo where he fell there gushed forth so much blood out of his wounds 
that with it they drowned all the race of the Rime Giants, save that one whom giants call Bergamir escaped with his household. He went upon his ship, note, literally mill bench or mortar, end note, and his wife with him, and they were safe there. And from them are come the races of the Rime Giants, as is said here untold ages ere earth was shapen then was bergelmir born that first i recall how the famous wise giant on the deck of the ship was laid down eight then said gangleri what was done then by boar's sons if thou believe that they be gods har replied in this matter there is no little to be said they took ymir and bore him into the middle of the yawning void and made of him the earth of his blood the sea and the waters the land was made of his flesh and the crags of his bones gravel and stones they fashioned from his teeth and his grinders and from those bones that were broken and jafnhar said of the blood which ran and welled forth freely out of his wounds they made the sea when they had formed and made firm the earth together and laid the sea in a ring round about her and it may well seem a hard thing to most men to cross over it then said thridi they took his skull also and made of it the heaven and set it up over the earth with four corners and under each corner they set a dwarf the names of these are east west north and south then they took the glowing embers and sparks that burst forth and had been cast out of muspelheim and set them in the midst of the yawning void in the heaven both above and below to illumine heaven and earth they assigned places to all fires to some in heaven some wandered free under the heavens nevertheless to these also they gave a place and shaped them courses it is said in old songs that from these the days were reckoned and the tale of years told as is said in voluspa the sun knew not where she had housing the moon knew not what might he had the stars knew not where stood their places thus was it ere the earth was fashioned then said gangleri these are great tidings which i now hear that is a wondrous great piece of craftsmanship and cunningly made how was the earth contrived and har answered she is ring-shaped without and round about her without lieth the deep sea and along the strand of that sea they gave lands to the graces of giants for habitation but on the inner earth they made a citadel round about the world against the hostility of the giants and for their citadel they raised up the brows of ymir the giant and called that place midgard they took also his brain and cast it in the air and made from it the clouds as is here said of ymir's flesh the earth was fashioned and of his sweat the sea crags of his bones trees of his hair and of his skull the sky then of his brows the blithe gods made midgard for sons of men and of his brain the bitter mooded clouds were all created nine then said gangleri much indeed they had accomplished then methinks when earth and heaven were made and the sun and the constellations of heaven were fixed and division was made of days now whence come the men that people the world and har answered when the sons of boar were walking along the sea strand they found two trees and took up the trees and shaped men of them the first gave them spirit and life the second wit and feeling the third form speech hearing and sight they gave them clothing and names the male was called oscar and the female embla and of them was mankind begotten which received a dwelling place under midgard next they made for themselves in the middle of the world a city which is called asgard men call it troy there dwelt the gods and their kindred and many tidings and tales of it have come to pass both on earth and aloft there is one abode called hlidskjalf and when allfather sat in the high seat there he looked out over the whole world and saw every man's acts and knew all things which he saw his wife was called frigg daughter of frugvin and of their blood is come that kindred which we call the races of the aesir that have peopled the elder asgard and those kingdoms which pertain to it and that is a divine race for this reason must he be called allfather because he is father of all the gods and of men and of all that was fulfilled of him and of his might the earth was his daughter and his wife on her he begot the first son which is asa thor strength and prowess attend him wherewith he overcometh all living things ten 
Nurfi or Narfi is the name of a giant that dwelt in Jotunheim. He had a daughter called Night. She was swarthy and dark, as befitted her race. She was given to the man called Nagalfari. Their son was Audr. Afterwards, she was wedded to him that was called Anar. Jord was their daughter. Note. Jord equals Earth. End note. Last of all, Dayspring had her, and he was of the race of the Aesir. Their son was Day. He was radiant and fair after his father. Then all father took Night and Day her son, and gave to them two horses and two chariots, and sent them up into the heavens to ride round about the earth every two half days. Night rides before with the horse named Frosty Mane, and on each morning he bedews the earth with the foam from his bit the horse that day has is called sheen mane and he illumines all the air and the earth from his mane end of gilfagening sections one through ten gilfagening the beguiling of gilfi section eleven then said gangleri how does he govern the course of the sun or of the moon har answered a certain man was named mundifari who had two children they were so fair and comely that he called his son moon and his daughter sun and wedded her to the man called glenner but the gods were incensed at that insolence and took the brother and sister and set them up in the heavens they caused sun to drive those horses that drew the chariot of the sun which the gods had fashioned for the world's illumination from that glowing stuff which flew out of muspelheim those horses are called thus early wake and all strong and under the shoulders of the horses the gods set two wind bags to cool them but in some records that is called iron coolness moon steers the course of the moon and determines its waxing and waning he took from the earth two children called beel and hyuki they that went from the well called birgir bearing on their shoulders the cast called segir and the pole simu their father is named vinfinner these children follow moon as may be seen from the earth twelve then said gangleri the sun fares swiftly and almost as if she were afraid she could not hasten her course any the more if she feared her destruction then har made answer it is no marvel that she hastens furiously close cometh he that seeks her and she has no escape save to run away then said gangleri who is he that causes her this disquiet har replied it is two wolves and he that runs after her is called skul she fears him and he shall take her but he that leaps before her is called hati prodvitnison he is eager to seize the moon and so it must be then said gangleri what is the race of the wolves har answered a witch dwells to the east of midgard in the forest called ironwood in that wood dwell the troll women who are known as ironwood women the old witch bears many giants for sons and all in the shape of wolves and from this source are these wolves sprung the saying runs thus from this race shall come one that shall be mightiest of all he that is named moonhound he shall be filled with the flesh of all those men that die and he shall swallow the moon and sprinkle with blood the heavens and all the air thereof shall the sun lose her shining and the winds in that day shall be unquiet and roar on every side so it says in voluspa eastward dwells the old one in ironwood and there gives birth to fenrir's brethren there shall spring of them all a certain one the moon's taker in troll's likeness he is filled with flesh of fey men reddens the god seats with ruddy blood gouts swart becomes sunshine in summers after the weather all shifty wit ye yet or what thirteen then said gangleri what is the way to heaven from earth then har answered and laughed aloud now that is not wisely asked has it not been told thee that the gods made a bridge from earth to heaven called bifrist thou must have seen it it may be that ye call it rainbow it is of three colours and very strong and made with cunning and with more magic art than other works of craftsmanship but strong as it is yet must it be broken when the sons of muspel should go forth harrying and ride it and swim their horses over great rivers thus they shall proceed then said gangleri to my thinking the gods did not build the bridge honestly 
seeing that it could be broken, and they able to make it as they would. Then Har replied, The gods are not deserving of reproof because of this work of skill. A good bridge is Bifrost, but nothing in this world is of such nature that it may be relied on when the sons of Muspel go a harrying. 14. Then said Gangleri, What did Allfather then do when Asgard was made? Har answered, In the beginning he established rulers, and bade them ordain fates with him, and give counsel concerning the planning of the town. That was in the place which is called Idafield, in the midst of the town. It was their first work to make that court in which their twelve seats stand, and another, the high seat which all father himself has. That house is the best made of any on earth, and the greatest. Without and within, it is all like one piece of gold. Men call it Gladsheim. They made also a second hall. That was a shrine which the goddesses had, and it was a very fair house. Men called it Vingolf. Next they fashioned a house, wherein they placed a forge, and made besides a hammer, tongs, and anvil, and by means of these all other tools. After this they smithied metal and stone and wood, and wrought so abundantly that metal which is called gold, that they had all their household ware and all dishes of gold. And that time is called the Age of Gold before it was spoiled by the coming of the women, even those who came out of Jutenheim. Next after this, the gods enthroned themselves in their seats and held judgment, and called to mind whence the dwarves had quickened in the mould and underneath in the earth, even as do maggots in flesh. The dwarves had first received shape and life in the flesh of Ymir, and were then maggots, but by decree of the gods had become conscious with the intelligence of men and had human shape and nevertheless they dwell in the earth and in stones. Modsugnir was the first, and Durin the second, so it says in Voluspa. Then strode all the mighty to the seats of judgment, the gods most holy, and together held counsel. Who should of dwarves shape the peoples from the bloody surge in the blue one's bones? They made many in man's likeness, dwarves in the earth, as Durin said. And these, says the Sibyl, are their names, Ni and Nidi, Nordri and Sudri, Austri, Vestri, Altufer, Dvalin, Nar, Nain, Nipinger, Dain, Bifer, Bafer, Bomber, Nori, Ori, Onar, Oin, Mjodvitnir, Viger and Gandalfir, Vidalfir, Thorin, Fili, Kili, Fundin, Vali, Thror, Throin, Fekker, Liter and Viter, Nir, Nirader, Reker, Radsvider. And these also are dwarves and dwell in stones, but the first in mould. Draupnir, Dogvari, Hur, Hugstari, Pledjulfer, Gloin, Dori, Ori, Dufer, Anvari, Heptifili, Har, Sviar. And these proceed from Svarin's Hauger to Aurvangar on Europlain. And thence is Lovar come. These are their names. Skirfir, Birfir, Skafider, Ai. Alfir, Ingvi, Aikinsjaldi, Faler, Frosti, Fider, Ginar. 15. Then said Gangleri, Where is the chief abode or holy place of the gods? Har answered, That is at the ash of Yggdrasil. There the gods must give judgment every day. Then Gangleri asked, What is to be said concerning that place? Then said Jafnhar, The ash is greatest of all trees and best its limbs spread out over all the world and stand above heaven three roots of the tree uphold it and stand exceeding broad one is among the aesir another among the rime giants in that place where aforetime was the yawning void the third stands over niflheim and under that root is fergelmir and nidhogr gnaws the root from below but under that root which turns toward the rime giants is mimir's well wherein wisdom and understanding are stored and he is called Mimir who keeps the well. He is full of ancient lore, since he drinks of the well from the Galarhorn. Thither came Allfather and craved one drink of the well, but he got it not until he had laid his eye in pledge. So says Voluspa, All know I, Odin, where the eye thou hiddest, in the wide-renowned well of Mimir. Mimir drinks mead every morning from Valfather's wage. Wit ye yet, or what? The third root of the ash stands in heaven, and under that root is the well which is very holy, that is called the well of Urdur. There the gods hold their tribunal. 
Each day the ^sir ride thither up over Bifrost, which is also called the ^sir's Bridge. These are the names of the ^sir's steeds: Sleipnir is best, which Odin has; he has eight feet. The second is Gladr; the third, Gillir; the fourth, Glenr; the fifth, Skeldbrimir; the sixth, Silfrintoppr; the seventh, Sinir; the eighth, Gisl; the ninth, Falhofnir; the tenth, Gulltoppr; the eleventh, Letfeti. Baldr's horse was burnt with him, and Thor walks to the judgment and wades those rivers which are called thus Kormt and Urmt, and the Kerlaugs twain, them shall Thor wade every day when he goes to doom at Ash Yggdrasil. For the Aesir's bridge burns all with flame, and the holy waters howl. Then said Gangleri, Does fire burn over Bifrost? Har replied, That which thou seest to be red in the bow is burning fire. The hill giants might go up to heaven if passage on Bifrus were open to all those who would cross. There are many fair places in heaven, and over everything there a godlike watch is kept. A hall stands there fair under the ash by the well, and out of that hall come three maids who are called thus Urdur Verdandi Skuld. These maids determine the period of men's lives. We call them Norns, but there are many Norns those who come to each child that is born to appoint his life these are of the race of the gods but the second are of the elf people and the third are of the kindred of the dwarves as it is said here most sundered in birth i say the norns are they claim no common kin some are of aesir kin some are of elf kind some are dvalin's daughters then said gangleri if the norns determine the weirds of men then they apportion exceeding unevenly seeing that some have a pleasant and luxurious life but others have little worldly goods or fame some have long life others short har said good norns and of honourable race appoint good life but those men that suffer evil fortunes are governed by evil norns sixteen then said gangleri what more mighty wonders are to be told of the ash har replied much is to be told of it an eagle sits in the limbs of the ash and he has understanding of many a thing and between his eyes sits the hawk that is called vedderfulnir the squirrel called ratatusker runs up and down the length of the ash bearing envious words between the eagle and nidhugger and four hearts run in the limbs of the ash and bite the leaves they are called thus dain dvalin duner durathror moreover so many serpents are in fair gelmir with nidhugger that no tongue can tell them as is here said ash yggdrasil suffers anguish more than men know of the stag bites above on the side it rotteth and nidhugger gnaws from below and it is further said more serpents lie under yggdrasil's stock than every unwise ape can think goin and moin grafvitnir's sons Grabakr and Grafuldr, Ofnir and Svafnir, I think shall a tear the trunk's twigs. It is further said that these Norns who dwell by the well of Urdur take water of the well every day, and with it that clay which lies about the well, and sprinkle it over the ash, to the end that its limbs shall not wither nor rot. For that water is so holy that all things which come there into the well become as white as the film which lies within the eggshell as is here said i know an ash standing called yggdrasil a high tree sprinkled with snow-white clay thence come the dews in the dale that fall it stands ever green above urdur's well that dew which falls from it onto the earth is called by men honey-dew and thereon are bees nourished two fowls are fed in urdur's well they are called swans and from those fowls has come the race of birds which is so called seventeen then said gangleri thou knowest many tidings to tell of the heaven what chief abodes are there more than at urdur's well har said many places are there and glorious that which is called alfheimer is one where dwell the peoples called light elves but the dark elves dwell down in the earth and they are unlike in appearance but by far more unlike in nature the light elves are fairer to look upon than the sun but the dark elves are blacker than pitch then there is also in that place the abode called Breidablik, and there is not in heaven a fairer dwelling. There too is one called Glitnir, whose walls and all its posts and pillars are of red gold. 
but its roof of silver. There is also the abode called Himinbjorg. It stands at heaven's end by the bridgehead, in the place where Bifrus joins heaven. Another great abode is there, which is named Valaskjof. Odin possesses that dwelling. The gods made it and thatched it with sheer silver, and in this hall is the Hlidskjof, the high seat so called. Whenever Allfather sits in that seat, he surveys all lands. At the southern end of heaven is that hall which is fairest of all, and brighter than the sun. It is called Gimle. It shall stand when both heaven and earth have departed, and good men and of righteous conversation shall dwell therein. So it is said in Voluspa, A hall I know standing than the sun fairer, thatched with gold and Gimle bright. There shall dwell the doers of righteousness, and ever and ever enjoy delight. Then said Gangleri, What shall guard this place when the flame of Surtur shall consume heaven and earth? Har answered, It is said that another heaven is to the southward and upward of this one, and it is called Anlanger. But the third heaven is yet above that, and it is called Vidblain, and in that heaven we think this abode is. But we believe that none but light elves inhabit these mansions now. 18. Then said Gangleri, whence comes the wind? It is strong, so that it stirs great seas, and it swells fire. But strong as it is, none may see it, for it is wonderfully shapen. Then said Har, that I am well able to tell thee. At the northward end of heaven sits a giant called Hrasvelger. He has the plumes of an eagle, and when he stretches his wings for flight, then the wind rises from under his wings, as is here said. Hrasvelger hight he, who sits at heaven's ending, giant in eagle's coat. From his wings, they say, the wind cometh all menfolk over. 19. Then said Gangleri, Why is there so much difference that summer should be hot but winter cold? Har answered, A wise man would not ask thus, seeing that all are able to tell this. But if thou alone art become so slight of understanding as not to have heard it, then I will yet permit that thou shouldst rather ask foolishly once than that thou shouldst be kept longer in ignorance of a thing which it is proper to know. He is called Svasudr, who is father of summer, and he is of pleasant nature, so that from his name whatsoever is pleasant is called sweet. But the father of winter is variously called Vindulyoni or Vindsvalar. He is the son of Vasadr, and these were kinsmen grim and chilly-breasted, and winter has their temper. 20. Then said Gangleri, Who are the Aesir, they in whom it behooves men to believe? Har answered, The divine Aesir are twelve. Then said Jafnhar, Not less holy are the Asinjur, the goddesses, and they are of no less authority. Then said Thridi, Odin is highest and eldest of the Aesir. He rules all things, and mighty as are the other gods, they all serve him as children obey a father. Frigg is his wife, and she knows all the fates of men, though she speaks no prophecy. As is said here, when Odin himself spake with him of the Aesir, whom men call Loki, Thou art mad now, Loki, and reft of mind. Why, Loki, leavest thou not off? Frigg, methinks, is wise in all fates, though herself say them not. Odin is called Allfather because he is father of all the gods. He is also called father of the slain, because all those that fall in battle are the sons of his adoption. For them he appoints Valhalla and Vingolf, and they are then called champions. He is also called God of the Hanged, God of Gods, God of Cargoes, and he has also been named in many more ways, after he had come to King Geiruder. We were called Grimmer and Gangleri, Herion, Hjelmberi, Thekr, Thridi, Thudr, Udr, Elblindi, Har, Sadr, Svipal, San Gital, Ertaiter, Hnikar, Biliger, Baleger, Bolverke, Fjulnir, Grimnir, Glapsvider, Fjulsvider, Sidhuter, Sidskeger, Sigfuder, Nikuder, Alfuder, Atrider, Falmatir, Oski, Omi, Jafenharb, Biflindi, Gundlir, Arbader, Svidur, Svidrir, Yelker, Kjalar, Vidur, Thror, Eger, Thunder, Vakr, Skilfinger, Vafudr, Roptatir, Gautir, Feratir. Then said Gangleri, exceeding many names have ye given him, and by my faith it must indeed be a goodly wit that knows all the lore and the examples of what chances have brought about each of these names. 
Then Har made answer, It is truly a vast sum of knowledge to gather together and set forth fittingly. But it is briefest to tell thee that most of his names have been given him by reason of this chance. There being so many branches of tongues in the world, all peoples believed that it was needful for them to turn his name into their own tongue, by which they might the better invoke him and entreat him on their own behalf. But some occasions for these names arose in his wanderings, and that matter is recorded in tales. Nor canst thou ever be called a wise man if thou shalt not be able to tell of those great events. End of sections 11 through 20 of Gilfagening, the Beguiling of Gilfi. Section 21 to 34 of the Beguiling of Gilfi. 21. Then said Gangleri, What are the names of the other Isir, or what is their office, or what deeds of renown have they done? Har answered, Thor is the foremost of them, he that is called Thor of the Isir, or Oku Thor. He is the strongest of all the gods and men. He has his realm in the place called Thrudvagnar, and his hall is called Bilskirnir. In that hall are five hundred rooms and forty. That is the greatest house that men know of. It is thus said in Grimnismal, five hundred floors and more than forty, so reckon I Bilskirnir with bending ways. Of those houses that I know of hall roofed, my sons I know the most. Thor has two he-goats, that are called tooth nasher and tooth gritter and a chariot wherein he drives and the he-goats draw the chariot therefore he is called uku thor he is also three things of great price one is the hammer mjolnir which the rhyme giants and the hill giants know when it is raised on high and that is no wonder it has bruised many a skull among their fathers or their kinsmen he has a second costly thing best of all the girdle of might and when he clasps it about him, then the godlike strength within him is increased by half. Yet a third thing he has, in which there is much virtue, his iron gloves. He cannot do without them when he uses his hammer shaft. But no one is so wise that he can tell all his mighty works. Yet I can tell thee so much tidings of him that the hours would be spent before all that I know were told. 22. Then said Gangleri, I would ask tidings of more Isir. Har replied, The second son of Odin is bolder, and good things are to be said of him. He is best, and all praise him. He is so fair of feature and so bright that light shines from him. A certain herb is so white that it is likened to Baldr's brow. Of all grasses it is whitest, and by it thou mayest judge his fairness both in hair and in body. He is the wisest of the Aesir, and the fairest spoken and most gracious, and that quality attends him that none may gainsay his judgments. He dwells in the place called Bridebleak, which is in heaven. In that place may nothing unclean be, even as is said here. Bridebleak tis called, where Baldr has a hole made for himself. In that land where I know lie fewest baneful runes. 23. The third among the Aesir is he that is called Njordur. He dwells in heaven in the abode called Noatun. He rules the course of the wind and still sea and fire. On him shall men call for voyages and for hunting. He is so prosperous and abounding in wealth that he may give them great plenty of lands or of gear, and him shall men invoke for such things. Njordur is not of the race of the Aesir. He was reared in the land of the Vanir, but the Vanir delivered him as hostage to the gods, and took for hostage in exchange him that men called Hunir, he became an atonement between the gods and the Vanir. Nirdir has to wife the woman called Skadi, daughter of Thiazi the giant. Skadi would fain dwell in the abode which her father had had, which is on certain mountains in a place called Thrymheimer, but Nirdir would be near the sea. They made a compact on these terms. They should be nine nights in Thrymheimer, but the second nine in Noatun. But when Njordur came down from the mountain back to Noatun, he sang this lay. Loath were the hills to me. I was not long in them. Nights only nine. To me the wailing of wolves seemed ill after the song of swans. Then Skadi sang this. Sleep could I never on the seabeds for the wailing of waterfowl. He wakens me who comes from the deep, the sea mew every morn. 24. 
then skadi went up onto the mountain and dwelt in thrymheimr and she goes for the more part on snowshoes and with a bow and arrow and shoots beasts she is called snowshoe goddess or lady of the snowshoes so it is said thrymheimr tis called where thiazi dwelt he the hideous giant but now skadi abides pure bride of the gods in her father's ancient freehold twenty four njordr and noatun begot afterward two children the son was called freyr and the daughter freya they were fair of face and mighty freyr is the most renowned of the aesir he rules over the rain and the shining of the sun and therewithal the fruit of the earth and it is good to call on him for fruitful seasons and peace he governs also the prosperity of men but freya is the most renowned of the goddesses she has in heaven the dwelling called Fulkvanger, and wheresoever she rides to the strife she has one half of the kill an odin half as is here said Fulkvanger tis called where freya rules degrees of seats in the hall half the kill she keepeth each day and half odin half her hall sesrumnir is great and fair when she goes forth she drives her cats and sits in a chariot she is most conformable to man's prayers and from her name comes the name of honour fru by which noble women are called songs of love are well pleasing to her it is good to call on her for furtherance in love twenty five then said gangleri great in power do these aesir seem to me nor is it a marvel that much authority attends you who are said to possess understanding of the gods and know which one men should call on for what boon soever or are the gods yet more har said yet remains that one of the aesir who is called tyr he is most daring and best in stoutness of heart and he has much authority over victory in battle it is good for men of valour to invoke him it is a proverb that he is tyr valiant who surpasses other men and does not waver he is wise so that it is also said that he that is wisest is tyr prudent this is one token of his daring when the aesir enticed fenris wolf to take upon him the fetter gleipnir the wolf did not believe them that they would loose him until they laid tyr's hand into his mouth as a pledge but when the aesir would not loose him then he bit off the hand at the place now called the wolf's joint and tyr is one-handed and is not called a reconciler of men twenty six one is called bragi he is renowned for wisdom and most of all for fluency of speech and skill with words he knows most of skaldship and after him skaldship is called brager and from his name that one is called bragerman or woman who possesses eloquence surpassing others of women or of men note brager as a noun means poetry as an adjective it seems to mean foremost thus the phrase brager kaula seems to be foremost of men with apparent reference to poetic preeminence his wife is idun she guards in her chest of ash those apples which the gods must taste whensoever they grow old and then they all become young and so it shall be even unto the weird of the gods then said gangleri a very great thing methinks the gods entrust to the watchfulness and good faith of idun then said har laughing loudly twas near being desperate once i may be able to tell thee of it but now thou shalt first hear more of the names of the aesir twenty seven heimdallr is the name of one he is called the white god he is great and holy nine maidens all sisters bore him for a son he is also called halinskidi and gulintani his teeth were of gold and his horse is called gold top he dwells in the place called himminbjorg hard by bifrist he is the warder of the gods and sits there by heaven's end to guard the bridge from the hill giants he needs less sleep than a bird he sees equally well night and day a hundred leagues from him and hears how grass grows on the earth or wool on sheep and everything that has a louder sound he has that trumpet which is called gjallarhorn and its blast is heard throughout all worlds heimdallr's sword is called head it is said further himimbjorg tis called where heimdallr they say a has his housing there the god sentinel drinks in his snug hall gladly good mead and furthermore he himself says in heimdallr galdr i am of nine mothers the offspring 
of sisters nine am i the son twenty eight one of the aesir is named hudr he is blind he is of sufficient strength but the gods would desire that no occasion should rise of naming this god for the work of his hands shall long be held in memory among gods and men twenty nine vidar is the name of one the silent god he has a thick shoe he is nearly as strong as thor in him the gods have great trust in all struggles thirty one is called ali or vali son of odin and rinder he is daring in fights and a most fortunate marksman thirty one one is called ullr son of sif stepson of thor he is so excellent a bowman and so swift on snowshoes that none may contend with him he is also fair of aspect and has the accomplishments of a warrior it is well to call on him in single combats thirty two for seti is the name of the son of baldr and nanna daughter of nep he has that hall in heaven which is called glitnir all that come to him with such quarrels as arise out of lawsuits all these return thence reconciled that is the best seat of judgment among gods and men thus it is said here a hall is called glitnir with gold tis pillared and with silver thatch the same therefore said he bides a full day through and puts to sleep all suits thirty three also numbered among the aesir is he whom some call the mischief monger of the aesir and the first father of falsehoods and blemish of all gods and men he is named loki or lupter son of farbauti the giant his mother was laufi or nal his brothers are bileister and helblindi loki is beautiful and comely to look upon evil in spirit very fickle in habit he surpassed other men in that wisdom which is called slate and had artifices for all occasions he would ever bring the aesir into great hardships and then get them out with crafty counsel his wife was called sigin their son nari or narfi thirty four yet more children had loki angerboda was the name of a certain giantess in jutunheim with whom loki gat three children one was fenris wolf the second jormungandr that is the midgard serpent the third is hell but when the gods learned that this kindred was nourished in jutunheim and when the gods perceived by prophecy that from this kindred great misfortune should befall them and since it seemed to all that there was great prospect of ill first from the mother's blood and yet worse from the father's then all fathers sent gods thither to take the children and bring them to him when they came to him straightway he cast the serpent into the deep sea where he lies about all the land and this serpent grew so greatly that he lies in the midst of the ocean encompassing all the land and bites upon his own tail hell he cast into niflheim and gave to her power over nine worlds to apportion all abodes among those that were sent to her that is men dead of sickness or of old age she has great possessions there her walls are exceeding high and her gates great her hall is called sleet cold her dish hunger famine is her knife idler her thrall sloven her maidservant pit of stumbling her threshold by which one enters disease her bed gleaming bale her bed hangings she is half blue black and half flesh colour by which she is easily recognised and very lowering and fierce the wolf the aesir brought up at home and tyr alone dared to go to him to give him meat but when the gods saw how much he grew every day and when all prophecies declared that he was fated to be their destruction then the aesir seized upon this way of escape they made a very strong fetter which they called legindir and brought it before the wolf bidding him try his strength against the fetter the wolf thought that no overwhelming odds and let them do with him as they would the first time the wolf lashed out against it the fetter broke so he was loosed out of legindir after this the aesir made a second fetter stronger by half which they called dromi and bade the wolf try that fetter saying he would become very famous for strength if such huge workmanship should not suffice to hold him but the wolf thought that this fetter was very strong he considered also that strength had increased in him since the time he broke Ledingir, it came into his mind that he must expose himself to danger if he would become famous 
so he let the fetter be laid upon him now when the aesir declared themselves ready the wolf shook himself dashed the fetter against the earth and struggled fiercely with it spurned against it and broke the fetter so that the fragments flew far so he dashed himself out of dromi since then it passes as a proverb to loose out of Ledinger or to dash out of dromi when anything is exceeding hard after that the aesir feared that they should never be able to get the wolf bound then all father sent him who was called skirnir freyr's messenger down into the region of the black elves to certain dwarves and caused to be made the fetter called gleipnir it was made of six things the noise a cat makes in footfall the beard of a woman the roots of a rock the sinews of a bear the breath of a fish and the spittle of a bird and though thou understand not these matters already yet now thou mayest speedily find certain proof herein that no lie is told thee thou must have seen that a woman has no beard and no sound comes from the leap of a cat and there are no roots under a rock and by my troth all that i have told thee is equally true though there be some things which thou canst not put to the test then said gangleri this certainly i can perceive to be true these things which thou hast taken for proof i can see but how was the fetter fashioned har answered that i am well able to tell thee the fetter was soft and smooth as a silken ribbon but as sure and strong as thou shalt now hear then when the fetter was brought to the aesir they thanked the messenger well for his errand then the aesir went out upon the lake called umsvartnir to the island called lingvi and summoning the wolf with them they showed him the silken ribbon and bade him burst it saying that it was somewhat stouter than appeared from its thickness and each passed it to the others and tested it with the strength of their hands and it did not snap yet they said the wolf could break it then the wolf answered touching this matter of the ribbon it seems to me that i shall get no glory of it though i snap asunder so slender a band but if it be made with cunning and wiles then though it seem little that band shall never come upon my feet then the aesir answered that he could easily snap apart a slight silken band he who had before broken great fetters of iron but if thou shalt not be able to burst this band then thou wilt not be able to frighten the gods and then we shall unloose thee the wolf said if ye bind me so that i shall not get free again then ye will act in such a way that it will be late ere i receive help from you i am unwilling that this band should be laid upon me yet rather than that ye should impugn my courage let some one of you lay his hand in my mouth for a pledge that this is done in good faith each of the aesir looked at his neighbour and none was willing to part with his hand until tyr stretched out his right hand and laid it in the wolf's mouth but when the wolf lashed out the fetter became hardened and the more he struggled against it the tighter the band was then all laughed except tyr he lost his hand when the aesir saw that the wolf was fully bound they took the chain that was fast to the fetter and which is called gelgja and passed it through a great rock it is called gul and fixed the rock deep down into the earth then they took a great stone and drove it yet deeper into the earth it was called thviti and used the stone for a fastening pin the wolf gaped terribly and thrashed about and strove to bite them they thrust into his mouth a certain sword the guards caught in his lower jaw and the point in the upper that is his gag he howls hideously and slaver runs out of his mouth that is the river called van there he lies till the weird of the gods then said gangleri marvellous ill children did loki beget but all these brethren are of great might yet why did not the aesir kill the wolf seeing they had expectation of evil from him har answered so greatly did the gods esteem their holy place and sanctuary that they would not stain it with the wolf's blood though so say the prophecies he shall be the slayer of odin end of sections twenty one to thirty four of the gilfagening or the beguiling of gilfi the beguiling of gilfi section thirty five then said gangleri which are the asinjur har said frigg is the foremost she has that estate which is called fensalir and it is most glorious the second is saga she dwells at sokvabekar and that is a great abode the third is fear she is the best physician 
The fourth is Gefjun, she is a virgin, and they that die maidens attend her. The fifth is Fulla, she also is a maid, and goes with loose tresses and a golden band about her head. She bears the ashen coffer of Frigg, and has charge over her footgear, and knows her secret counsel. Freya is most gently born, together with Frigg, she is wedded to the man named Odur. Their daughter is Hnoss, she is so fair that those things which are fair and precious are called Hnasir. Odur went away on long journeys, and Freya weeps for him, and her tears are red gold. Freya has many names, and this is the cause thereof, that she gave herself sundry names when she went out among unknown peoples, seeking Odur. She is called Mardul and Hurn, Geffen, Sir, Freya, Sir. Freya had the necklace Brisingamen. She is also called Lady of the Vanir. The seventh is Sjöfin. She is most diligent in turning the thoughts of men to love, both of women and of men. And from her name, love-longing is called Sjafni. The eighth is Lofin. She is so gracious and kindly to those that call upon her that she wins all fathers or Frigg's permission for the coming together of mankind in marriage, of women and of men, though it were forbidden before or seemed flatly denied. From her name such permission is called leave, and thus also she is much loved of men. The ninth is Var. She hearkens to the oaths and compacts made between men and women, wherefore such covenants are called vows. She also takes vengeance on those who perjure themselves. The tenth is Vur. She is wise and of searching spirit, so that none can conceal anything from her. It is a saying that a woman becomes ware of that of which she is informed. The eleventh is Sin. She keeps the door in the hall and locks it before those who should not go in. She is also set at trials as a defense against such suits as she wishes to refute. Thence is the expression that Sin is set forward when a man denies. The twelfth is Hlin. She is established as keeper over those men whom Frigg desires to preserve from any danger. Thence comes the saying that he who escape leans. Snotra is thirteenth. She is prudent and of gentle bearing. From her name, a woman or a man who is moderate is called Snotr. The fourteenth is Na. Her, Frigg sends into diverse lands on her errands. She has that horse which runs over sky and sea and is called Hoof Tosser. Once when she was riding, certain of the Vanir saw her course in the sky, then one spake, What flieth there, what fareth there, or glideth in the air? She made answer, I fly not, though I fare, and in the air glide on Hoof Tosser, him that hums Kerpir, gat with Gardrofa. From Gna's name, that which soars high, is said to Gnefa. Sol and Bil are reckoned among the Asinur, but their nature has been told before. 36. There are also those others whose office it is to serve in Valhalla, to bear drink and mind the table service and ale flagons. Thus are they named in Grinnismal, Hrist and Mist, I would have bear the horn to me, Skeguld and Skugul, Hildur and Thrudur, Hluk and Hrfjotur, Gul and Gairahud, Rangrider and Radgrider, and Regenleif, these bear the Einherjar ale. These are called Valkyrs. Them Odin sends to every battle. They determine men's feyness and award victory. Gudr and Rota and the youngest Norn, she who is called Skuld, ride ever to take the slain and decide fights. Jord, the mother of Thor, and Rinder, Vali's mother, are reckoned among the Asinjur. 37. A certain man was called Gimir, and his wife Arboda. She was of the stock of the hill giants. Their daughter was Gerdr, who was fairest of all women. It chanced one day that Freyr had gone to Hlidskalf and gazed over all the world. But when he looked over into the northern region, he saw on an estate a house great and fair and toward this house went a woman when she raised her hands and opened the door before her brightness gleamed from her hands both over sky and sea and all the worlds were illumined of her thus his overweening pride in having presumed to sit in that holy seat was avenged upon him that he went away full of sorrow when he had come home he spake not he slept not he drank not 
no man dared speak to him then hjordr summoned to him skirnir freyr's foot page and bade him go to freyr and beg speech of him and ask for whose sake he was so bitter that he would not speak with men but skirnir said he would go albeit unwillingly and said that evil answers were to be expected of freyr but when he came to freyr straightway he asked why freyr was so downcast and spake not with men then freyr answered and said that he had seen a fair woman and for her sake he was so full of grief that he would not live long if he were not to obtain her and now thou shalt go and woo her on my behalf and have her hither whether her father will or no i will reward thee well for it then skirnir answered thus he would go on his errand but freyr should give him his own sword which is so good that it fights of itself and freyr did not refuse but gave him the sword then skirnir went forth and wooed the woman for him and received her promise and nine nights later she was to come to the place called bari and then go to the bridal with freyr but when skirnir told freyr his answer then he sang this lay long is one night long is the second how can i wait through three often a month to me seemed less than this one night of waiting this was to blame for freyr's being so weaponless when he fought with belly and slew him with the horn of a heart then said gangleri tis much to be wondered at that such a great chief as freyr is would give away his sword not having another equally good it was a great privation to him when he fought with him called belly by my faith he must have rued that gift then answered har there was small matter in that when he and belly met freyr could have killed him with his hand it shall come to pass that freyr will think a worse thing has come upon him when he misses his sword on that day that the sons of muspel go a harrying thirty eight then said gangleri thou sayest that all those men who have fallen in battle from the beginning of the world are now come to odin in valhalla what has he to give them for food i should think that a very great host must be there then har answered that which thou sayest is true a very mighty multitude is there but many more shall be notwithstanding which it will seem all too small in the time when the wolf shall come but never is so vast a multitude in valhalla that the flesh of that boar shall fail which is called serimnir he is boiled every day and is whole at evening but this question which thou askest now i think it likelier that few may be so wise as to be able to report truthfully concerning it his name who roasts is andrimnir and the kettle is eldrimnir so it is said here andrimnir has an eldrimnir serimnir sodden best of hams yet how few know with what food the champions are fed then said gangleri has odin the same fare as the champions har answered that food which stands on his board he gives to two wolves which he has called geri and freki but no food does he need wine is both food and drink to him so it says here geri and freki the war mighty glutteth the glorious god of hosts but on wine alone the weapon glorious odin a liveth the ravens sit on his shoulders and say into his ear all the tidings which they see or hear they are called thus hugin and munin he sends them at daybreak to fly about all the world and they come back at undernmeal thus he is acquainted with many tidings therefore men call him raven god as is said hugin and munin hover each day the wide earth over i fear for hugin lest he fare not back yet watch i more for munin thirty nine then said gangleri what have the champions to drink that may suffice them as abundantly as the food or is water drunk there then said har now thou askest strangely as if all father would invite to him kings or earls or other men of might and would give them water to drink i know by my faith that many a man comes to valhalla who would think he had bought his drink of water dearly if there were not better cheer to be had there he who before had suffered wounds and burning pain unto death i can tell thee a different tale of this the she-goat she who is called hydrun stands up in valhalla and bites the needles from the limb of that tree which is very famous and is called leradur and from her udders mead runs so copiously that she fills a ton every day 
that tun is so great that all the champions become quite drunk from it then said gangleri that is a wondrous proper goat for them it must be an exceeding good tree from which she eats then spake har even more worthy of note is the heart eikthrini which stands in valhalla and bites from the limbs of the tree and from his horns distils such abundant exudation that it comes down into vergelmir and from thence fall those rivers called thus sid fid sukon sukin aikin svul guntra fjorm fimbultu gipul gupul gumul garfimul those fall about the abodes of the aesir these also are recorded tin vin tul hul grad guntren nit nut nun hrun vina fegsvin chodnuma forty then said gangleri these are marvellous tidings which thou now tellest a wondrous great house valhalla must be it must often be exceeding crowded before the doors then har answered why dost thou not ask how many doors there are in the hall or how great if thou hearest that told then thou wilt say that it is strange indeed if whosoever will may not go out and in but it may be said truly that it is no more crowded to find place therein than to enter into it here thou mayest read in grimnismal five hundred doors and forty more so i deem stand in valhalla eight hundred champions go out at each door when they fare to fight with the wolf forty one then said gangleri a very mighty multitude of men is in valhalla so that by my faith odin is a very great chieftain since he commands so large an army now what is the sport of the champions when they are not fighting or replied every day as soon as they are clothed they straightway put on their armour and go out into the court and fight and fell each other that is their sport and when the time draws near to undern meal they ride home to valhalla and sit down to drink even as is said here all the einherjar in odin's court deal out blows every day the slain they choose and ride from the strife sit later in love together what thou hast said is true odin is of great might many examples are found in proof of this as is here said in the words of the aesir themselves ash yggdrasil's trunk of trees is foremost and skidbladnir of ships odin of aesir of all seeds sleipnir bifrost of bridges and bragi of skalds habrok of hawks and of hounds garmer forty two then said gangleri who owns that horse sleipnir or what is to be said of him hor answered thou hast no knowledge of sleipnir's points and thou knowest not the circumstances of his begetting but it will seem to thee worth the telling it was early in the first days of the gods dwelling here when the gods had established the midgard and made valhalla there came at that time a certain right and offered to build them a citadel in three seasons so good that it should be staunch and proof against the hill giants and the rhyme giants though they should come in over midgard but he demanded as wages that he should have possession of freya and would fain have had the sun and the moon then the aesir held parley and took counsel together and a bargain was made with the right that he should have that which he demanded if he should succeed in completing the citadel in one winter on the first day of summer if any part of the citadel were left unfinished he should lose his reward and he was to receive help from no man in the work when they told him these conditions he asked that they would give him leave to have the help of his stallion which was called Svadilfari and loki advised it so that the right's petition was granted he set to work the first day of winter to make the citadel and by night he hauled stones with the stallion's aid and it seemed very marvellous to the aesir what great rocks that horse drew for the horse did more rough work by half than did the right but there were strong witnesses to their bargain and many oaths since it seemed unsafe to the giant to be among the aesir without truce if thor should come home but thor had then gone away into the eastern region to fight trolls now when the winter drew nigh unto its end the building of the citadel was far advanced and it was so high and strong that it could not be taken when it lacked three days of summer the work had almost reached the gate of the stronghold then the gods sat down in their judgment seats and sought means of evasion 
and asked one another who had advised giving freya into jotunheim or so destroying the air and the heaven as to take thence the sun and the moon and give them to the giants the gods agreed that he must have counselled this who is wont to give evil advice loki laufiarsson and they declared him deserving of an ill death if he could not hit upon a way of losing the right his wages and they threatened loki with violence but when he became frightened then he swore oaths that he would so contrive that the right should lose his wages cost him what it might that same evening when the right drove out after stone with the stallion svadilfari a mare bounded forth from a certain wood and whinnied to him the stallion perceiving what manner of horse this was straightway became frantic and snapped the traces asunder and leaped over to the mare and she away to the wood and the right after striving to seize the stallion these horses ran all night and the right stopped there that night and afterward at day the work was not done as it had been before when the right saw that the work could not be brought to an end he fell into giant's fury now that the aesir saw surely that the hill giant was come thither they did not regard their oaths reverently but called on thor who came as quickly and straightway the hammer mjolnir was raised aloft he paid the right's wage and not with the sun and the moon nay he even denied them dwelling in jotunheim and struck but the one first blow so that his skull was burst into small crumbs and sent him down below under niflhel but loki had such dealings with Faldifari that somewhat later he gave birth to a foal which was grey and had eight feet and this horse is the best among gods and men so is said in voluspa then all the powers strode to the seats of judgment the most holy god's council held together who had the air all with evil envenomed or to the etin race odours made given broken were oaths then bond and swearing pledges all sacred which passed between them thor alone smote there swollen with anger he seldom sits still when such he hears of forty three then said gangleri what is to be said of skidblood near that which is best of ships is there no ship equally great who replied skidbladnir is best of ships and made with most skill of craftsmanship but nagelfar is the largest ship muspel has it certain dwarves sons of ivaldi made skidbladnir and gave the ship to freyr it is so great that all the aesir may man it with their weapons and armaments and it has a favouring wind as soon as the sail is hoisted whithersoever it is bound but when there is no occasion for going to sea in it it is made of so many things and with so much cunning that then it may be folded together like a napkin and kept in one's pouch forty four then spake gangleri a good ship is skidbladnir but very great magic must have been used upon it before it got to be so fashioned has thor never experienced such a thing that he has found in his path somewhat so mighty or so powerful that it has overmatched him through strength of magic then said hur few men i ween are able to tell of this yet many a thing has seemed to him hard to overcome though there may have been something so powerful or strong that thor might not have succeeded in winning the victory yet it is not necessary to speak of it because there are many examples to prove and because all are bound to believe that thor is mightiest then said gangleri it seems to me that i must have asked you touching this matter what no one is able to tell of then spake jafenhor that we have heard say concerning some matters which seem to us incredible but here sits one near at hand who will know how to tell true tidings of this therefore thou must believe that he will not lie for the first time now who never lied before gangleri said here will i stand and listen if any answer is forthcoming to this word but otherwise i pronounce you overcome if ye cannot tell that which i ask you then spake three d now it is evident that he is resolved to know this matter though it seemed not to us a pleasant thing to tell this is the beginning of this tale uku thor drove forth with his he-goats and chariot and with him that ass called loki they came at evening to a husbandman's and there received a night's lodging about evening thor took his he-goats and slaughtered them both after that they were flayed and borne to the cauldron when the cooking was done then thor and his companions sat down to supper thor invited to meet with him the husbandman and his wife and their children 
the husbandman's son was called thjalfi and the daughter of ruskva then thor laid the goat hides farther away from the fire and said that the husbandman and his servants should cast the bones on the goat hides thjalfi the husbandman's son was holding a thigh bone of the goat and split it with his knife and broke it for the marrow thor tarried there overnight and in the interval before day he rose up and clothed himself took the hammer mjolnir swung it up and hallowed the goat hides straightway the he-goats rose up and then one of them was lame in a hind leg thor discovered this and declared that the husbandman or his household could not have dealt wisely with the bones of the goat he knew that the thigh bone was broken there is no need to make a long story of it all may know how frightened the husbandman must have been when he saw how thor let his brows sink down before his eyes but when he looked at the eyes then it seemed to him that he must fall down before their glances alone thor clenched his hands on the hammer shaft so that the knuckles whitened and the husbandman and all his household did what was to be expected they cried out lustily prayed for peace offered in recompense all that they had but when he saw their terror then the fury departed from him and he became appeased and took of them in atonement their children thjalfi and ruskva who then became his bond servants and they follow him ever since end of gilfagening sections thirty five to forty four section forty five thereupon he thor left his goats behind and began his journey eastward toward jutunheim and clear to the sea and then he went out over the sea that deep one but when he came to land he went up and loki and thjalfi and ruskva with him then when they had walked a little while there stood before them a great forest they walked all that day till dark thjalfi was swiftest footed of all men he bore thor's bag but there was nothing good for food as soon as it had become dark they sought themselves shelter for the night and found before them a certain hall very great there was a door in the end of equal width with the hall wherein they took up quarters for the night but about midnight there came a great earthquake the earth rocked under them exceedingly and the house trembled then thor rose up and called to his companions and they explored farther and found in the middle of the hall a side chamber on the right hand and they went in thither thor sat down in the doorway but the others were farther in from him and they were afraid but thor gripped his hammer shaft and thought to defend himself then they heard a great humming sound and a crashing but when it drew near dawn then thor went out and saw a man lying a little way from him in the wood and that man was not small he slept and snored mightily then thor thought he could perceive what kind of noise it was which they had heard during the night he girded himself with his belt of strength and his divine power waxed and on the instant the man awoke and rose up swiftly and then it is said the first time thor's heart failed him to strike him with a hammer he asked him his name and the man called himself skrymir but i have no need he said to ask thee for thy name i know that thou art asa thor but what hast thou dragged away my glove then skrymir stretched out his hand and took up the glove and at once thor saw that it was that which he had taken for a hall during the night and as for the side chamber it was the thumb of the glove skrymir asked whether thor would have his company and thor assented to this then skrymir took and unloosened his provision wallet and made ready to eat his morning meal and thor and his fellows in another place skrymir then proposed to them to lay their supply of food together and thor assented then skrymir bound all the food in one bag and laid it on his own back he went before during the day and stepped with very great strides but late in the evening skrymir found them night quarters under a certain great oak then skrymir said to thor that he would lay him down to sleep and do ye take the provision bag and make ready for your supper thereupon skrymir slept and snored hard and thor took the provision bag and set about to unloose it but such things must be told as will seem incredible he got no knot loosened and no thong end stirred so as to be looser than before when he saw that this work might not avail then he became angered gripped the hammer mjolnir in both hands 
and strode with great strides to that place where Skrymir lay, and smote him in the head. Skrymir awoke and asked whether a leaf had fallen upon his head, or whether they had eaten and were ready for bed. Thor replied that they were just then about to go to sleep. Then they went under another oak. It must be told thee that there was then no fearless sleeping. At midnight Thor heard how Skrymir snored and slept fast, so that it thundered in the woods. Then he stood up and went to him, shook his hammer eagerly and hard, and smote down upon the middle of his crown. He saw that the face of the hammer sank deep into his head. And at that moment Skrymir awoke and said, What is it now? Did some acorn fall on my head? Or what is the news with thee, Thor? But Thor went back speedily and replied that he was then but new wakened, said that it was then midnight and there was yet time to sleep thor meditated that if he could get to strike him a third blow never should the giant see himself again he lay now and watched whether skrymir were sleeping soundly yet a little before day when he perceived that skrymir must have fallen asleep he stood up at once and rushed over to him brandished his hammer with all his strength and smote upon that one of his temples which was turned up but skrymir sat up and stroked his cheek and said some birds must be sitting in the tree above me i imagined when i awoke that some dirt from the twigs fell upon my head art thou awake thor it will be time to arise and clothe us but now ye have no long journey forward to the castle called utgardr i have heard how ye have whispered among yourselves that i am no little man in stature but ye shall see taller men if ye come into utgardr now i will give you wholesome advice do not conduct yourselves boastfully for the henchmen of utgarda loki will not well endure big words from such swaddling babes but if not so then turn back and i think it were better for you to do that but if ye will go forward then turn to the east as for me i hold my way north to these hills which ye may now see skrymir took the provision bag and cast it on his back and turned from them across the forest and it is not recorded that the aesir bade him godspeed section forty six thor turned forward on his way and his fellows and went onward till midday then they saw a castle standing in a certain plain and set their necks down on their backs before they could see up over it they went to the castle and there was a grating in front of the castle gate and it was closed thor went up to the grating and did not succeed in opening it but when they struggled to make their way in they crept between the bars and came in that way they saw a great hall and went thither the door was open then they went in and saw there many men on two benches and most of them were big enough thereupon they came before the king utgarda loki and saluted him but he looked at them in his own good time and smiled scornfully over his teeth and said it is late to ask tidings of a long journey or is it otherwise than i think that this toddler is oku thor yet thou mayest be greater than thou appearest to me what manner of accomplishments are those which thou and thy fellows think to be ready for no one shall be here with us who knows not some kind of craft or cunning surpassing most men then spoke the one who came last who was called loki i know such a trick which i am ready to try that there is no one within here who shall eat his food more quickly than i then utgarda loki answered that is a feat if thou accomplish it and this feat shall accordingly be put to the proof he called to the farther end of the bench that he who was called logi should come forth on the floor and try his prowess against loki then a trough was taken and borne in upon the hall floor and filled with flesh loki sat down at the one end and logi at the other and each ate as fast as he could and they met in the middle of the trough by that time loki had eaten all the meat from the bones but logi likewise had eaten all the meat and the bones with it and the trough too and now it seemed to all as if loki had lost the game then utgarda loki asked what yonder young man could play at and thialfi answered that he would undertake to run a race with whomsoever utgarda loki would bring up then utgarda loki said that was a good accomplishment and that there was great likelihood that he must be well endowed with fleetness if he were to perform that feat yet he would speedily see to it that the matter should be tested then utgarda loki arose and went out and there was a good course to run on over the level plain 
then utgarda loki called to him a certain lad who was named hugi and bade him run a match against thjalfi then they held the first heat and hugi was so much ahead that he turned back to meet thjalfi at the end of the course then said utgarda loki thou wilt need to lay thyself forward more thjalfi if thou art to win the game but it is none the less true that never have any men come hither who seem to me fleeter of foot than this then they began another heat and when hugi had reached the course's end and was turning back there was still a long bolt shot to thjalfi then spake utgarda loki thjalfi appears to me to run this course well but i do not believe of him now that he will win the game but it will be made manifest presently when they run the third heat then they began the heat but when hugi had come to the end of the course and turned back thjalfi had not yet reached mid-course then all said that that game had been proven next utgarda loki asked thor what feats there were which he might desire to show before them such great tales as men have made of his mighty works then thor answered that he would most willingly undertake to contend with any in drinking utgarda loki said that might well be he went into the hall and called his serving boy and bade him bring the sconce horn which the henchmen were wont to drink of straightway the serving lad came forward with a horn and put it into thor's hand then said utgarda loki it is held that this horn is well drained if it is drunk off in one drink but some drink it off in two but no one is so poor a man at drinking that it fails to drain off in three thor looked upon the horn and it did not seem big to him and yet it was somewhat long still he was very thirsty he took and drank and swallowed enormously and thought that he should not need to bend oftener to the horn but when his breath failed and he raised his head from the horn and looked to see how it had gone with the drinking it seemed to him that there was very little space by which the drink was lower now in the horn than before then said utgarda loki it is well drunk and not too much i should not have believed if it had been told me that asa thor could not drink a greater draught but i know that thou wilt wish to drink it off in another draught thor answered nothing he set the horn to his mouth thinking now that he should drink a greater drink and struggled with the draught until his breath gave out and yet he saw that the tip of the horn would not come up so much as he liked when he took the horn from his mouth and looked into it it seemed to him then as if it had decreased less than the former time but now there was a clearly apparent lowering in the horn then said utgarda loki how now thor thou wilt not shrink from one more drink than may be well for thee if thou now drink the third draught from the horn it seems to me as if this must be esteemed the greatest that thou canst not be called so great a man here among us as the aesir call thee if thou give not a better account of thyself in the other games than it seems to me may come of this then thor became angry set the horn to his mouth and drank with all his might and struggled with the drink as much as he could and when he looked into the horn at least some space had been made then he gave up the horn and would drink no more then said utgarda loki now it is evident that thy prowess is not so great as we thought it to be but wilt thou try thy hand at more games it may readily be seen that thou gettest no advantage hereof thor answered i will make trial of yet other games but it would have seemed wonderful to me when i was at home with the aesir if such drinks had been called so little but what game will ye now offer me then said utgarda loki young lads here are wont to do this which is thought of small consequence lift my cat up from the earth but i should not have been able to speak of such a thing to asa thor if i had not seen that thou hast far less in thee than i had thought thereupon there leaped forth on the hall floor a grey cat and a very big one and thor went to it and took it with his hand down under the middle of the belly and lifted up but the cat bent into an arch just as thor stretched up his hands and when thor reached up as high as he could at the very utmost then the cat lifted up one foot and thor got this game no further advanced then said utgarda loki this game went even as i had foreseen the cat is very great whereas thor is low and little beside the huge men who are here with us then said thor little as ye call me let any one come up now and wrestle with me now i am angry then utgarda loki answered looking about him on the benches and spake i see no such man here within 
who would not hold it a disgrace to wrestle with thee and yet he said let us see first let the old woman my nurse be called hither elli and let thor wrestle with her if he will she has thrown such men as have seemed to me no less strong than thor straightway there came into the hall an old woman stricken in years then utgarda loki said that she should grapple with asa thor there is no need to make a long matter of it that struggle went in such wise that the harder thor strove in gripping the faster she stood then the old woman essayed a hold and then thor became toddy on his feet and their tuggings were very hard yet it was not long before thor fell to his knee on one foot then utgarda loki went up and bade them cease the wrestling saying that thor should not need to challenge more men of his bodyguard to wrestling by then it had passed toward night utgarda loki showed thor and his companions to a seat and they tarried there the night long in good cheer chapter forty seven but at morning as soon as it dawned thor and his companions arose clothed themselves and were ready to go away then came there utgarda loki and caused a table to be set for them there was no lack of good cheer meat and drink so soon as they had eaten he went out from the castle with them and at parting utgarda loki spoke to thor and asked how he thought his journey had ended or whether he had met any man mightier than himself thor answered that he could not say that he had not got much shame in their dealings together but yet i know that ye will call me a man of little might and i am ill content with that then said utgarda loki now i will tell thee the truth now that thou art come out of the castle and if i live and am able to prevail then thou shalt never again come into it and this i know by my troth that thou shouldst never have come into it if i had known before that thou hadst so much strength in thee and that thou shouldst so nearly have had us in great peril but i made ready against thee eye illusions and i came upon you the first time in the wood and when thou wouldst have unloosed the provision bag i had bound it with iron and thou didst not find where to undo it but next thou didst smite me three blows with the hammer and the first was least and was yet so great that it would have sufficed to slay me if it had come upon me where thou sawest near my hall a saddle-back mountain cut at the top into three square dales and one the deepest those were the marks of thy hammer i brought the saddle back before the blow but thou didst not see that so it was also with the games in which ye did contend against my henchmen that was the first which loki did he was very hungry and ate zealously but he who was called logi was wildfire and he burned the trough no less swiftly than the meat but when thialfi ran the race with him called hugi that was my thought and it was not to be expected of thialfi that he should match swiftness with it moreover when thou didst drink from the horn and it seemed to thee to go slowly then by my faith that was a wonder which i should not have believed possible the other end of the horn was out in the sea but thou didst not perceive it but now when thou comest to the sea thou shalt be able to mark what a diminishing thou hast drunk in the sea this is henceforth called ebb tides and again he said it seemed to me not less noteworthy when thou didst lift up the cat and to tell thee truly then all were afraid who saw how thou didst lift one foot clear of the earth that cat was not as it appeared to thee it was the midgard serpent which lies about all the land and scarcely does its length suffice to encompass the earth with head and tail so high didst thou stretch up thine arms that it was then but a little way more to heaven it was also a great marvel concerning the wrestling match that thou didst withstand so long and didst not fall more on one knee wrestling with ellie since none such has ever been and none shall be if he become so old as to abide old age that she shall not cause him to fall and now it is truth to tell that we must part and it will be better on both sides that ye never come again to seek me another time i will defend my castle with similar wiles or with others so that ye shall get no power over me when thor had heard these sayings he clutched his hammer and brandished it aloft but when he was about to launch it forward then he saw utgarda loki nowhere then he turned back to the castle purposing to crush it to pieces and he saw there a wide and fair plain but no castle 
so he turned back and went his way till he was come back again to thrudvangar but it is a true tale that then he resolved to seek if he might bring about a meeting between himself and the midgard serpent which afterward came to pass and i think no one knows how to tell thee more truly concerning this journey of thor's section forty eight then said gangleri very mighty is utgarda loki and he deals much in wiles and in magic and his might may be seen in that he had such henchmen as have great prowess now did thor ever take vengeance for this har answered it is not unknown though one be not a scholar that thor took redress for this journey of which the tale has but now been told and he did not tarry at home long before he made ready for his journey so hastily that he had with him no chariot and no he-goats and no retinue he went out over midgard in the guise of a young lad and came one evening at twilight to a certain giant's who was called hymir thor abode as guest there overnight but at dawn hymir arose and clothed himself and made ready to row to see a fishing then thor sprang up and was speedily ready and asked hymir to let him row to sea with him but hymir said that thor would be of little help to him being so small and a youth and thou wilt freeze if i stay so long and so far out as i am wont but thor said that he would be able to row far out from land for the reason that it was not certain whether he would be the first to ask to row back thor became so enraged at the giant that he was forthwith ready to let his hammer crash against him but he forced himself to forbear since he purposed to try his strength in another quarter he asked hymir what they should have for bait but hymir bade him get bait for himself then thor turned away thither where he saw a certain herd of oxen which hymir owned he took the largest ox called hymin briotur and cut off its head and went therewith to the sea by that time hymir had shoved out the boat thor went aboard the skiff and sat down in the stern seat took two oars and rowed and it seemed to hymir that swift progress came of his rowing hymir rowed forward in the bow and the rowing proceeded rapidly then hymir said that they had arrived at those fishing banks where he was wont to anchor and angle for flatfish but thor said that he desired to row much farther and they took a sharp pull then hymir said that they had come so far that it was perilous to abide out farther because of the midgard serpent thor replied that they would row a while yet and so he did but hymir was then sore afraid now as soon as thor had laid by the oars he made ready a very strong fishing line and the hook was no less large and strong then thor put the ox head on the hook and cast it overboard and the hook went to the bottom and it is telling thee the truth to say that then thor beguiled the midgard serpent no less than utgarda loki had mocked thor at the time when he lifted up the serpent in his hand the midgard serpent snapped at the ox head and the hook caught in its jaw but when the serpent was aware of this it dashed away so fiercely that both thor's fists crashed against the gunwale then thor was angered and took upon him his divine strength braced his feet so strongly that he plunged through the ship with both feet and dashed his feet against the bottom then he drew the serpent up to the gunwale and it may be said that no one has seen very fearful sights who might not see that how thor flashed fiery glances at the serpent and the serpent in turn stared up toward him from below and blew venom then it is said the giant hymir grew pale became yellow and was sore afraid when he saw the serpent and how the sea rushed out and in through the boat in the very moment when thor clutched his hammer and raised it on high then the giant fumbled for his fish-knife and hacked off thor's line at the gunwale and the serpent sank down into the sea thor hurled his hammer after it and men say that he struck off its head against the bottom but i think it were true to tell thee that the midgard serpent yet lives and lies in the encompassing sea but thor swung his fist and brought it against hymir's ear so that he plunged overboard and thor saw the soles of his feet and thor waited to land end of gilfagening section forty eight the beguiling of gilfi section forty nine then spake gangleri have any more matters of note befallen among the aesir a very great deed of valour did thor achieve on that journey hor made answer 
now shall be told of those tidings which seemed of more consequence to the aesir the beginning of the story is this that baldr the good dreamed great and perilous dreams touching his life when he told these dreams to the aesir then they took counsel together and this was their decision to ask safety for baldr from all kinds of dangers and frigg took oaths to this purport that fire and water should spare baldr likewise iron and metal of all kinds stones earth trees sicknesses beasts birds venom serpents and when that was done and made known then it was a diversion of baldr's and the aesir that he should stand up in the thing note the thing was the legislative assembly of iceland less specifically a formal assembly held for judicial purposes or to settle questions of moment an assembly of men End note. and all the others should some shoot at him some hew at him some beat him with stones but whatsoever was done hurt him not at all and that seemed to them all a very worshipful thing but when loki laufierson saw this it pleased him ill that baldr took no hurt he went to fensalir to frigg and made himself into the likeness of a woman then frigg asked if that woman knew what the aesir did at the thing she said that all were shooting at baldr and moreover that he took no hurt then said frigg neither weapons nor trees may hurt baldr i have taken oaths of them all then the woman asked have all things taken oaths to spare baldr and frigg answered there grows a tree sprout alone westward of valhalla it is called mistletoe i thought it too young to ask the oath of then straightway the woman turned away but loki took mistletoe and pulled it up and went to the thing hudr stood outside the ring of men because he was blind then spake loki to him why dost thou not shoot at baldr he answered because i see not where baldr is and for this also that i am weaponless then said loki do thou also after the manner of other men and show baldr honour as the other men do i will direct thee where he stands shoot at him with this wand hudr took mistletoe and shot at baldr being guided by loki the shaft flew through baldr and he fell dead to the earth and that was the greatest mischance that has ever befallen among gods and men then when baldr was fallen words failed all the aesir and their hands likewise to lay hold of him each looked at the other and all were of one mind as to him who had wrought the work but none might take vengeance so great a sanctuary was in that place but when the aesir tried to speak then it befell first that weeping broke out so that none might speak to the others with words concerning his grief but odin bore that misfortune by so much the worst as he had most perception of how great harm and loss for the aesir were in the death of baldr now when the gods had come to themselves frigg spake and asked who there might be among the aesir who would fain have for his own all her love and favour let him ride the road to hell and seek if he may find baldr and offer hell a ransom if she will let baldr come home to asgard and he is named hermodr the bold odin's son who undertook that embassy then sleipnir was taken odin's steed and led forward and hermodr mounted on that horse and galloped off the aesir took the body of baldr and brought it to the sea hringhorni is the name of baldr's ship it was greatest of all ships the gods would have launched it and made baldr's pyre thereon but the ship stirred not forward then word was sent to jutunheim after that giantess who is called hirokin when she had come riding a wolf and having a viper for bridle then she leaped off the steed and odin called to four berserks to tend the steed but they were not able to hold it until they had felled it then hirokin went to the prow of the boat and thrust it out at the first push so that fire burst from the rollers and all lands trembled thor became angry and clutched his hammer and would straightway have broken her head had not the gods prayed for peace for her then was the body of baldr borne out on shipboard and when his wife nanna the daughter of nep saw that straightway her heart burst with grief and she died she was borne to the pyre and fire was kindled then thor stood by and hallowed the pyre with mjolnir 
and before his feet ran a certain dwarf which was named litir thor kicked at him with his foot and thrust him into the fire and he burned people of many races visited this burning first it to be told of odin how frigg and the valkyrie went with him and his ravens but freyr drove in his chariot with a boar called gold mane or fearful tusk and heimdallr rode the horse called gold top and freya drove her cats thither came also much people of the rime giants and the hill giants odin laid on the pyre that gold ring which is called draupnir this quality attended it that every ninth night there dropped from it eight gold rings of equal weight Baldr's horse was led to the bale fire with all his trappings now this is to be told concerning hermodr that he rode nine nights through dark dales and deep so that he saw not before he was come to the river gjul and rode unto the gjul bridge which bridge is thatched with glittering gold modgudr is the maiden called who guards the bridge she asked him his name and race saying that the day before there had ridden over the bridge five companies of dead men but the bridge thunders no less under thee alone and thou hast not the colour of dead men why ridest thou hither on hellway he answered i am appointed to ride to hell to seek out baldr hast thou perchance seen baldr on hellway she said that baldr had ridden there over gjul's bridge but down and north lieth hellway then hermodr rode on till he came to hellgate he dismounted from his steed and made his girths fast mounted and pricked him with his spurs and the steed leaped so hard over the gate that he came nowise near to it then hermodr rode home to the hall and dismounted from his steed went into the hall and saw sitting there in the high seat baldr his brother and hermodr tarried there overnight at morn hermodr prayed hell that baldr might ride home with him and told her how great weeping was among the aesir but hel said that in this wise it should be put to the test whether baldr were so all beloved as had been said if all things in the world quick and dead weep for him then he shall go back to the aesir but he shall remain with hel if any gainsay it or will not weep then hermodr arose but baldr led him out of the hall and took the ring draupnir and sent it to odin for a remembrance and nanna sent frigg a linen smock and yet more gifts and to fulla a golden finger ring then hermodr rode his way back and came into asgard and told all those tidings which he had seen and heard thereupon the aesir sent over all the world messengers to pray that baldr be wept out of hell and all men did this and quick things and the earth and stones and trees and all metals even as thou must have seen that these things weep when they come out of frost and into the heat then when the messengers went home having well wrought their errand they found in a certain cave where a giantess sat she called herself thuk they prayed her to weep baldr out of hell she answered thuk will weep waterless tears for baldr's bale fare living or dead i love not the churl's son let hell hold to that she hath and men deem that she who was there was loki laufiarsson who hath wrought most ill among the aesir fifty then said gangleri exceeding much loki had brought to pass when he had first been caused that baldr was slain and then that he was not redeemed out of hell was any vengeance taken on him for this hor answered this thing was repaid him in such wise that he shall remember it long when the gods had become as wroth with him as was to be looked for he ran off and hid himself in a certain mountain there he made a house with four doors so that he could see out of the house in all directions often throughout the day he turned himself into the likeness of a salmon and hid himself in the place called franangr falls then he would ponder what manner of wile the gods would devise to take him in the waterfall but when he sat in the house he took twine of linen and knitted meshes as a net is made since but a fire burned before him then he saw that the aesir were close upon him and odin had seen from hlidskjalf where he was he leaped up at once and out into the river but cast the net into the fire when the aesir had come to the house he went in first who was wisest of all 
who was called Kvasir. And when he saw in the fire the white ash where the net had burned, then he perceived that that thing must be a device for catching fish, and told it to the Isir. Straightway they took hold, and made themselves a net after the pattern of the one which they perceived by the burnt-out ashes that Loki had made. When the net was ready, then the Isir went to the river and cast the net into the fall. Thor held one end of the net, and all of the Isir held the other, and they drew the net. But Loki darted ahead and lay down between two stones. They drew the net over him and perceived that something living was in front of it. A second time they went up to the fall and cast out the net, having bound it to something so heavy that nothing should be able to pass under it. Then Loki swam ahead of the net, but when he saw that it was but a short distance to the sea, then he jumped up over the net rope and ran into the fall. Now the Aesir saw where he went, and went up again to the fall and divided the company into two parts. But Thor waded along in midstream, and so they went out toward the sea. Now Loki saw a choice of two courses. It was a mortal peril to dash out into the sea, but this was the second, to leap over the net again. And so he did. He leaped as swiftly as he could over the net cord. Thor clutched at him and got hold of him, and he slipped in Thor's hand so that the hand stopped at the tail, and for this reason the salmon has a tapering back. Now Loki was taken truceless, and was brought with them into a certain cave. Thereupon they took three flat stones, and set them on edge, and drilled a hole in each stone. Then were taken Loki's sons, Vali and Nari or Narfi, the Aesir changed Vali into the form of a wolf, and he tore asunder Narfi his brother and the aesir took his entrails and bound loki with them over the three stones one stands under his shoulders the second under his loins the third under his huffs and those bonds were turned to iron then skadi took a venomous serpent and fastened it up over him so that the venom should drip from the serpent into his face but sigin his wife stands near him and holds a basin under the venom drops and when the basin is full, she goes and pours out the venom, but in the meantime the venom drips into his face. Then he writhes against it with such force that all the earth trembles. Ye call that earthquakes. There he lies in bonds till the weird of the gods. 51. Then said Gangleri, What tidings are to be told concerning the weird of the gods? Never before have I heard aught said of this har answered great tidings are to be told of it and much the first is this that there shall come that winter which is called the awful winter in that time snow shall drive from all quarters frost shall be great then and winds sharp there shall be no virtue in the sun those winters shall proceed three in succession and no summer between but first shall come three other winters such that over all the world there shall be mighty battles in that time brothers shall slay each other for greed's sake, and none shall spare father or son in manslaughter and in incest, so it says in Voluspa. Brothers shall strive and slaughter each other, own sisters' children shall sin together. Ill days among men, many a whoredom, an axe age, a sword age, shields shall be cloven, a wind age, a wolf age, ere the world totters. Then shall happen what seems great tidings. The wolf shall swallow the sun, and this shall seem to men a great harm. Then the other wolf shall seize the moon, and he also shall work great ruin. The stars shall vanish from the heavens. Then shall come to pass these tidings also. All the earth shall tremble so, and the crags, the trees shall be torn up from the earth, and the crags fall to ruin. And all fetters and bonds shall be broken and rent then shall fenris wolf get loose then the sea shall gush forth upon the land because the midgard serpent stirs in giant wrath and advances up onto the land then that too shall happen that nagelfar shall be loosened the ship which is so named it is made of dead men's nails wherefore a warning is desirable that if a man die with unshorn nails that man adds much material to the ship nagelfar which gods and men were fain to have finished late. Yet in this sea flood, Nagelfar shall float. Hrimir is the name of the giant who steers Nagelfar. Fenriswolf shall advance with gaping mouth, 
and his lower jaw shall be against the earth but the upper against heaven he would gape yet more if there were room for it fires blaze from his eyes and nostrils the midgard serpent shall blow venom so that he shall sprinkle all the air and water and he is very terrible and shall be on one side of the wolf in this din shall the heaven be cloven and the sons of muspel ride thence surtur shall ride first and both before him and after him burning fire his sword is exceeding good from it radiance shines brighter than from the sun when they ride over bifrost then the bridge shall break as has been told before the sons of muspel shall go forth to that field which is called vigridr thither shall come fenris wolf also and the midgard serpent then loki and hrymir shall come there also and with him all the rime giants all the champions of hell follow loki and the sons of muspel shall have a company by themselves and it shall be very bright the field vigridr is a hundred leagues wide each way when these tidings come to pass then shall heimdallr rise up and blow mightily in the gjallar horn and awaken all the gods and they shall hold counsel together then odin shall ride to mimir's well and take counsel of mimir for himself and his host then the ash of yggdrasil shall tremble and nothing then shall be without fear in heaven or in earth then shall the aesir put on their war weeds and all the champions and advance to the field odin rides first with a gold helmet and a fair burney and his spear which is called gungnir he shall go forth against fenris wolf and thor stands forward on his other side and can be of no avail to him because he shall have his hands full to fight against the midgard serpent freyr shall contend with surtur and a hard encounter shall there be between them before freyr falls it is to be his death that he lacks that good sword of his which he gave to skirnir then shall the dog garmer be loosed which is bound before gnipa's cave he is the greatest monster he shall do battle with tyr and each become the other's slayer thor shall put to death the midgard serpent and shall stride away nine paces from that spot then shall he fall dead to the earth because of the venom which the snake has blown at him the wolf shall swallow odin that shall be his ending but straight thereafter shall vidar stride forth and set one foot upon the lower jaw of the wolf on that foot he has the shoe materials for which have been gathering throughout all time there are the scraps of leather which men cut out of their shoes at toe or heel therefore he who desires in his heart to come to the aesir's help should cast those scraps away with one hand he shall seize the wolf's upper jaw and tear his gullet asunder and that is the death of the wolf loki shall have battle with heimdallr and each shall be the slayer of the other then straightway shall surtur cast fire over the earth and burn all the world so is said in voluspa high blows heimdallr the horn is aloft odin communes with mimir's head trembles yggdrasil's towering ash the old tree wails when the etin is loosed what of the aesir what of the elf folk all jutunheim echoes the aesir are at council the dwarves are groaning before their stone doors wise in rock walls wit ye yet or what hrymir sails from the east the sea floods onward the monstrous beast twists in mighty wrath the snake beats the waves the eagle is screaming the gold neb tears corpses nagelfar is loosed from the east sails the keel come now muspel's folk over the sea waves and loki steereth there are the warlocks all with the wolf with them is the brother of beleister faring surtur fares from southward with switch-eating flame on his sword shimmers the sun of the war-gods the rocks are falling and fiends are reeling heroes tread hellway heaven is cloven then to the goddess a second grief cometh when odin fares to fight with the wolf and beli's slayer the bright god with surtur there must fall frigg's beloved odin's son goeth to strife with the wolf vidar speeding to meet the slaughter beast the sword in his hand to the heart he thrusteth of the fiend's offspring avenged is his father
now goeth hludin's glorious son not in flight from the serpent a fear unheeding all the earth's offspring must empty the homesteads when furiously smiteth midgard's defender the sun shall be darkened earth sinks in the sea glide from the heaven the glittering stars smoke reek rages and reddening fire the high heat licks against heaven itself and here it says yet so vigridir height the field where in fight shall meet surtur and the cherished gods an hundred leagues it has on each side unto them that field is fated fifty two then said gangleri what shall come to pass afterward when all the world is burned and dead are all the gods and all the champions and all mankind have ye not said before that every man shall live in some world throughout all ages then thridi answered in that time the good abode shall be many and many the ill then it shall be best to be in gimle in heaven moreover there is plenteous abundance of good drink for them that esteem that a pleasure in the hall which is called brimir it stands in okolnir that too is a good hall which stands in nida fells made of red gold its name is sindri in these halls shall dwell good men and pure in heart in nostrand is a great hall in evil and its doors face to the north it is all woven of serpent backs like a wattle house and all the snake heads turn into the house and blow venom so that along the hall run rivers of venom and they who have broken oaths and murderers wade those rivers even as it says here i know a hall standing far from the sun in nostrand the doors to northward are turned venom drops fall down from the roof holes that hall is bordered with backs of serpents there are doomed to wade the weltering streams men that are man sworn and they that murderers are but it is worse in hvergelmir there the cursed snake tears dead men's corpses fifty three then spake gangleri shall any of the gods live then or shall there be then any earth or heaven hor answered in that time the earth shall emerge out of the sea and shall then be green and fair then shall the fruits of it be brought forth unsown vidar and vali shall be living inasmuch as neither sea nor the fire of surtur shall have harmed them and they shall dwell at ida plain where asgard was before and then the sons of thor modi and magni shall come there and they shall have mjolnir there after that baldr shall come thither and hudir from hell then all shall sit down together and hold speech with one another and call to mind their secret wisdom and speak of those happenings which have been before of the midgard serpent and of fenris wolf then they shall find in the grass those golden chest pieces which the aesir had had thus is it said in the deity's shrine shall dwell vidar and vali when the fire of surtur is slackened modi and magni shall have mjolnir at the ceasing of thor's strife in the place called holdmimir's holt there shall lie hidden during the fire of surtur two of mankind who are called thus leif and leifthrasir and for food they shall have the morning dews from these folk shall come so numerous an offspring that all the world shall be peopled even as is said here leif and leifthrasir these shall lurk hidden in the holt of hodmimir the morning dews their meat shall be thence are gendered the generations and it may seem wonderful to thee that the son shall have borne a daughter not less fair than herself and the daughter shall then tread in the steps of her mother as is said here the elfin beam shall bear a daughter ere fenris drags her forth that maid shall go when the great gods die to ride her mother's road but now if thou art able to ask yet further then indeed i know not whence answer shall come to thee for i never heard any man tell forth at greater length the course of the world and now avail thyself of that which thou hast heard fifty four thereupon gangleri heard great noises on every side of him and then when he had looked about him more lo he stood out of doors on a level plain and saw no hall there and no castle then he went his way forth and came home into his kingdom 
and told those tidings which he had seen and heard and after him each man told these tales to the other here vilken closes his edition Jonsson admits the following but the aesir sat them down to speak together and took counsel and recalled all these tales which had been told to him and they gave these same names that were named before to those men and places that were there to the end that when long ages should have passed away men should not doubt thereof that those aesir that were but now spoken of and these to whom the same names were then given were all one their thor was so named and he is the old asa thor all reject what follows he is uku thor and to him are ascribed those mighty works which hector wrought in troy but this is the belief of men that the turks told of ulysses and called him loki for the turks were his greatest foes end of the gefalgening the poesy of skalds section one a certain man was named egir or hler he dwelt on the island which is now called hler's isle and was deeply versed in black magic he took his way to asgard but the aesir had foreknowledge of his journey he was received with good cheer and yet many things were done by deceit with eye illusions and at evening when it was time for drinking odin had swords brought into the hall so bright that light radiated from them and other illumination was not used while they sat at drinking then the aesir came into their banquet and in the high seat sat them down those twelve aesir who were appointed to be judges these were their names thor njordr freyr tyr heimdallr bragi vidar vali ullr hinir forseti loki and in like manner the asinjur frigg freya gefjun idun gerdr sigin fula nanna it seemed glorious to egir to look about him in the hall the wainscotings there were all hung with fair shields there was also stinging mead copiously quaffed the man seated next to egir was bragi and they took part together in drinking and in converse bragi told egir of many things which had come to pass among the aesir he began the story at the point where three of the aesir odin and loki and hinir departed from home and were wandering over mountains and wastes and food was hard to find but when they came down into a certain dale they saw a herd of oxen took one ox and set about cooking it now when they thought that it must be cooked they broke up the fire and it was not cooked after a while had passed they having scattered the fire a second time and it was not cooked they took counsel together asking each other what it might mean then they heard a voice speaking in the oak up above them declaring that he who sat there confessed that he had caused the lack of virtue in the fire they looked thither and there sat an eagle and it was no small one then the eagle said if ye are willing to give me my fill of the ox then it will cook in the fire they assented to this then he let himself float down from the tree and alighted by the fire and forthwith at the very first took unto himself the two hams of the ox and both shoulders then loki was angered snatched up a great pole brandished it with all his strength and drove it at the eagle's body the eagle plunged violently at the blow and flew up so that the pole was fast to the eagle's back and loki's hands to the other end of the pole the eagle flew at such a height that loki's feet down below knocked against stones and rock heaps and trees and he thought his arms would be torn from his shoulders he cried aloud entreating the eagle urgently for peace but the eagle declared that loki should never be loosed unless he would give him his oath to induce idun to come out of asgard with her apples loki assented and being straightway loosed went to his companions nor for that time are any more things reported concerning their journey until they had come home but at the appointed time loki lured idun out of asgard into a certain wood saying that he had found such apples as would seem to her of great virtue and prayed that she would have her apples with her and compare them with these then thiazi the giant came there in his eagle's plumage and took idun and flew away with her 
off into thrymheimr to his abode but the aesir became straitened at the disappearance of idun and speedily they became hoary and old then those aesir took counsel together and each asked the other what had last been known of idun and the last that had been seen was that she had gone out of asgard with loki thereupon loki was seized and brought to the thing and was threatened with death or tortures when he had become well frightened he declared that he would seek after idun in jutunheim if freya would lend him the hawk's plumage which she possessed and when he got the hawk's plumage he flew north into jutunheim and came on a certain day to the home of thiazi the giant thiazi had rowed out to sea but idun was at home alone loki turned her into the shape of a nut and grasped her in his claws and flew his utmost now when thiazi came home and missed idun he took his eagle's plumage and flew after loki making a mighty rush of sound with his wings in his flight but when the aesir saw how the hawk flew with the nut and where the eagle was flying they went out below asgard and bore burdens of plane shavings thither as soon as the hawk flew into the citadel he swooped down close by the castle wall then the aesir struck fire to the plane shavings but the eagle could not stop himself when he missed the hawk the feathers of the eagle caught fire and straightway his flight ceased then the aesir were near at hand and slew thiazi the giant within the gate of the aesir and that slaying is exceeding famous now skadi the daughter of the giant thiazi took helm and burney and all weapons of war and proceeded to asgard to avenge her father the aesir however offered her reconciliation and atonement the first article was that she should choose for herself a husband from among the aesir and choose by the feet only seeing no more of him then she saw the feet of one man passing fair and said i choose this one in balder little can be loathly but that was njordr of noatun she had this article also in her bond of reconciliation that the aesir must do a thing she thought they would not be able to accomplish to make her laugh then loki did this he tied a cord to the beard of a goat the other end being about his own genitals and each gave way in turn and each of the two screeched loudly then loki let himself fall onto skadi's knee and she laughed thereupon reconciliation was made with her on the part of the aesir it is so said that odin did this by way of atonement to skadi he took thiazi's eyes and cast them up into the heavens and made of them two stars then said aegir it seems to me that thiazi was a mighty man now of what family was he bragi answered his father was called ulvaldi and if i tell thee of him thou wilt think these things wonders he was very rich in gold but when he died and his sons came to divide the inheritance they determined upon this measure for the gold which they divided each should take as much as his mouth would hold and all the same number of mouthfuls one of them was thiazi the second idi the third ganger and we have it as a metaphor among us now to call gold the mouth tale of these giants but we conceal it in secret terms or in poesy in this way that we call it speech or word or talk of these giants then said aegir i deem that well concealed in secret terms and again said aegir whence did this art which ye call poesy derive its beginnings bragi answered these were the beginnings thereof the gods had a dispute with the folk which are called vanir and they appointed a peace meeting between them and established peace in this way they each went to a vat and spat their spittle therein then at parting the gods took that peace token and would not let it perish but shaped thereof a man this man is called kvasir and he was so wise that none could question him concerning anything but that he knew the solution he went up and down the earth to give instruction to men and when he came upon invitation to the abode of certain dwarves fjallar and galar they called him into privy converse with them and killed him letting his blood run into two vats and a kettle the kettle is called odrerir and the vats sun and bodin they blended honey with the blood and the outcome was that mead by the virtue of which he who drinks becomes a skald or scholar the dwarves reported to the aesir that kvasir had choked on his own shrewdness since there was none so wise there as to be able to question his wisdom 
Then these dwarves invited the giant, who is called Gillingr, to visit them, and his wife with him. Next the dwarves invited Gillingr to row upon the sea with them. But when they had gone out from the land, the dwarves rowed into the breakers and capsized the boat. Gillingr was unable to swim, and he perished, but the dwarves righted their boat and rowed to land. They reported this accident to his wife, but she took it grievously and wept aloud. Then Fjallar asked her whether it would ease her heart if she should look out upon the sea at the spot where he had perished, and she desired it. Then he spoke softly to Galar, his brother, bidding him go up over the doorway, when she should go out and let a millstone fall on her head, saying that her weeping grew wearisome to him, and even so he did. Now when the giant Sutungr, Gilingr's son, learned of this, he went over and took the dwarves and carried them out to sea, and set them on a reef which was covered at high tide. They besought Sutungr to give them respite of their lives, and as the price of reconciliation offered him the precious mead in satisfaction of his father's death, and that became a means of reconciliation between them. Sutungr carried the mead home, and concealed it in the place called Nitbjorg, placing his daughter Gunlud there to watch over it. Because of this we call poesy Kvasir's blood, or dwarves' drink, or fill, or any kind of liquid of Odririr, or of Bodin, or of Sun, or a ferryboat of dwarves, since this mead brought them life ransom from the reef, or Sutungr's mead, or liquor of Nitbjörg. Then Ygir said, These seem to me dark sayings to call poesy by these names. But how did ye Isir come at Sutungr's mead? Bragi answered, That tale runs thus. Odin departed from home and came to a certain place where nine thralls were mowing hay. He asked if they desired him to wet their sides, and they assented. Then he took a hone from his belt and wetted the sides. It seemed to them that the sides cut better by far, and they asked that the hone be sold them. But he put such a value on it that whoso desired to buy must give a considerable price. Nonetheless, all said that they would agree and prayed him to sell it to them. He cast the hone up into the air, but since all wished to lay their hands on it, they became so intermingled with one another that each struck with his scythe against the other's neck. Odin saw a knight's lodging with the giant who was called Baugi, Sutungr's brother. Baugi bewailed his husbandry, saying that his nine thralls had killed one another, and declared that he had no hope of workmen. Odin called himself Bulverker, in Baugi's presence, he offered to undertake nine men's work for Baugi, and demanded for his wages one drink of Sutungr's mead. Baugi declared that he had no control whatever over the mead, and said that Sutungr was determined to have it to himself, but promised to go with Bulverker and try if they might get the mead. During the summer, Bulverker accomplished nine men's work for Baugi, but when winter came, he asked Baugi for his hire. Then they both set out for Sutungr's. Baugi told Sutungr his brother of his bargain with Bulverker, but Sutungr flatly refused them a single drop of the mead. Then Bulverker made suggestion to Baugi that they try certain wiles, if perchance they might find means to get at the mead, and Baugi agreed readily. Thereupon Bulverker drew out the auger called Rati, saying that Baugi must bore the rock if the auger cut. He did so. At last Baugi said that the rock was bored through, but Bulverker blew into the auger hole and the chips flew up at him. Then he discovered that Baugi would have deceived him, and he bade him bore through the rock. Baugi bored anew, and when Bulverker blew a second time, then the chips were blown in by the blast. Then Bulverker turned himself into a serpent and crawled into the auger hole. But Baugi thrust at him from behind with the auger and missed him. Bulverker proceeded to the place where Gunlud was, and lay with her three nights, and then she gave him leave to drink three draughts of the mead. In the first draught, he drank every drop out of Odrerir, and in the second, he emptied Bodin, and in the third, Sun, and then he had all the mead. Then he turned himself into the shape of an eagle and flew as furiously as he could. But when Sutungr saw the eagle's flight, he too assumed the fashion of an eagle and flew after him. When the Aesir saw Odin flying, straightway they set out their vats in the court, and when Odin came into Asgard, 
he spat up the mead into the vats. Nevertheless, he came so near to being caught by Sutungr that he sent some mead backwards, and no heed was taken of this. Whosoever would might have that, and we call that the poetaster's part. But Odin gave the mead of Sutungr to the Aesir, and to those men who possess the ability to compose. Therefore we call poesy Odin's booty and find, and his drink and gift, and the drink of the Aesir. Then said Ygir, in how many ways are the terms of skaldship variously phrased? Or how many are the essential elements of the skaldic art? Then Bragi answered, the elements into which all poesy is divided are two. Ygir asked, what two? Bragi said, metaphor and meter. What manner of metaphor is used for skaldic writing? Three are the types of skaldic metaphor. Which? Thus, first, calling everything by its name. The second type is that which is called substitution. The third type of metaphor is that which is called periphrasis, and this type is employed in such manner. Suppose I take Odin or Thor or Tyr or any of the Aesir or elves, and to any of them whom I mention, I add the name of a property of some other of the Aesir, or I record certain works of his. Thereupon he becomes owner of the name, and not the one whose name was applied to him. Just as when we speak of victory tier, or tier of the hanged, or tier of cargoes. That then becomes Odin's name, and we call these periphrastic names. So also with the title tier of the wane. But now one thing must be said to young skalds, to such as yearn to attain to the craft of poesy, and to increase their store of figures with traditional metaphors, or to those who crave to acquire the faculty of discerning what is said in hidden phrase. Let such an one, then, interpret this book to his instruction and pleasure. Yet one is not so to forget or discredit these traditions as to remove from poesy those ancient metaphors with which it has pleased chief skalds to be content. Nor, on the other hand, ought Christian men to believe in heathen gods, nor in the truth of these tales otherwise than precisely as one may find here in the beginning of the book. Section 2 Now you may hear examples of the way in which chief skalds have held it becoming to compose, making use of these simple terms and paraphrases, as when Arnor Earl's skald says that Odin is called All-Father. Now I'll tell men the virtue of the terrible Jarl, All-Father's song surf streams, late my sorrows lighten here moreover he calls poesy the song surf of allfather havardr the halt sang thus now is the flight of eagles over the field the sailors of the sea-horses hie them to the hanged god's gifts and feasting thus sang viga glumer with the hanged god's helmet the hosts have ceased from going by the brink not pleasant the bravest held the venture thus sang refer oft the gracious one came to me at the holy cup of the raven god the king of the stem ploughed sea's gold from the skald in death is sundered thus sang eivindr skald despoiler and sigurdur he who sated the ravens of cargo god with the gore of the host of slain haddings of life was spoiled by the earth rulers at uglo thus sang glumer geirison there the tear of triumph himself inspired the terror of ships. The gods of breezes that favor good men steered them. Thus sang Eivindr. Gundul and Skugul Gauta Tyr sent to choose from kings who of Ingvi's kin should go with Odin and be in Valhalla. Thus sang Ulfr Ugason. Swiftly the far-famed rideth, the foretelling god to the fire speeds, to the wide pyre of his offspring. Through my cheeks praise songs are pouring. Thus sang Tjoldolfr of Vin. The slain lay there sand strewing, spoil for the single-eyed dweller in Frigg's bosom. In such deeds we rejoiced. Alfreder sang thus, the doughty ship-possessor, with sharpened words and soothfast lures our land, the patient, barley-locked wife of Thridi. Here is an example of this metaphor, that in poesy the earth is called the wife of Odin. Here is told what Eivindr sang. 
Hermodr and Bragi spake Hraptaltir. Go ye to greet the prince, for a king who seemeth a champion cometh to the hall hither. Thus sang Kormakr, the giver of lands who bindeth the sail to the top, with gold lace honors him who pours God's verse mead. Odin wrought charms on Rinder. Thus sang Steintor. Much have I to laud the ancient maid, though little, liquor of the valiant load of Gunlud's arm clasp. Thus sang Ulfr Ugason. There I think the Valkyrs follow, and ravens, victorious Odin to the blood of holy Baldr. With old tales the hall was painted. Thus sang Egil Skalagrimson. No victims for this to Vili's brother, the high god, I offer, glad to behold him. Yet hath Mimir's friend on me bestowed amends of evil, which I account better. He has given me the art, he, the wolf's opposer, accustomed to battle, of blemish blameless. Here he is called high god and friend of Mimir, an adversary of the wolf. Thus sang Refer, swift god of slain, that wieldeth the snowy billows wave hawks the ships that drive the sea road to thee we owe the dwarves drink thus sang einar tinkling scale tis mine to pour the liquor of the host gods mead cask freely before the ship's swift speeder for this i win no scorning thus sang ulfr ugason his steed the lordly heimdallr spurs to the pyre gods builded for the fallen son of odin the all-wise raven ruler this is said in eiriksmal what dream is that quoth odin i thought to rise ere daybreak to make valhalla ready for troops of slain i roused the champions bade them rise swiftly benches to strew to wash beer flagons the valkyrs to pour wine as a prince were coming kormakr sang this i pray the precious ruler of ingvi's people or me to hold his hand bow shaking propter bore with him gungnir toralfr sang this the mighty one of hlidskalf spoke his mind unto them where the hosts of fearless rocker were slaughtered thus sang eyvinder the mead which forth from surtur's sunk dales the strong through spells swift flying bore so sang bragi to seen on my shield's surface how the son of the father of peoples craved to try his strength full swiftly gainst the rain-beat snake earth circling thus sang einar since less with besla's offspring prevail most lordly princes than thou my task is singing thy praise in songs of battle thus sang torvaldr blending skald now have i much in the middle grasp of the son of bor of buri's heir End of Skalds Kaparma, section 2. The Poesy of Skalds, section 3. Now you shall hear how the Skalds have termed the art of poesy in these metaphorical phrases, which have been recorded before. For example, by calling it Kavasir's Gore and Ship of the Dwarves, Dwarves' Mead, Mead of the Aesir, Giant's Father Ransom, Liquor of Odrerir, and of Bodin and of Son, and fullness of these, liquor of Nitbjurg, booty and find and gift of Odin, even as has been sung in these verses which Einar Tinkling Scale wrought. I pray the high souled warder of earth to hear the ocean of the cliff of dwarves, my verses, hear, Earl, the gore of Kvasir. And as I near Tinkling Scale sang further, the dwarves' crag's song wave rushes or all the dauntless shield host of him who speeds the fury of the shield walls piercing sword bane even as ormir steintorsen sang the body of the dame and my dead be borne into one hall the drink of dvalin franklin's here and as refer sang i reveal the thought's drink of the rock folk to torstein the billow of the dwarf crag plashes i bid men hearken even as egil sang the prince requires my lore and bound his praise to pour odin's mead i bore to english shore and as glumr geirison sang let the princely giver hearken 
i hold the god king's liquor let silence then be granted while we sing the loss of thanes and as avinder sang a hearing i crave for the high one's liquor while i utter gillinger's atonement while his kin in the kettle brewing of the gallows lord to the gods i trace even as einar tinkling scale sang the wave of odin surges of odrerir's sea a billow gainst the tongue's song blade crashes i our king's works are goodly and as he sang further now that which bodin's billow bodes forth will straight be uttered let the war king's host make silence in the hall and hear the dwarf's ship and as eilifur gudrunarson sang grant shall ye gifts of friendship since grows of sun the seedling in our tongue's fertile sedge-bank true praise of our high lord even as vulustein sang egil hear the heart-streams of odin beat in cadence gainst my palate scary the god's spoil to me is given thus sang ormir steintorsen no verse of mine men need to fear no mockery i intertwine in odin's spoil my skill is sure in forging songs of praise thus sang ulfr ugason i show to host glad eilifir i show to host glad eilifir the heart fjord shoal of odin my song him do i summon to hear the gift of grimnir poesy is called sea or liquid of the dwarves because kvasir's blood was liquid in odrerir before the mead was made and then it was put into the kettle wherefore it is called odin's kettle liquor even as eyvinder sang and as we have recorded before while his kin in the kettle brewing of the gallows lord to the gods i trace moreover poesy is called ship or ale of the dwarves ale is lid and lid is a word for ships therefore it is held that it is for this reason that poesy is now called ship of the dwarves even as this verse tells the wit of gunlud's liquor in swelling wind-like fullness and the everlasting dwarves ship i own to send the same road section four what figures should be employed to paraphrase the name of thor thus one should call him son of odin and of jord father of magni and modi and thrudr husband of sif stepfather of ullr wielder and possessor of mjolnir and of the girdle of strength and of bilskirnir defender of asgard and of midgard adversary and slayer of giants and troll women smiter of hrungnir of geirudr and of trivaldi master of thialvi and ruskva foe of the midgard serpent foster-father of vingnir and hlora so sang bragi the skald the line of odin's offspring lay not slack on the gunwale when the huge ocean serpent uncoiled on the sea's bottom thus sang ulvir cut nose and crop ears the encircler of all regions and Eurd's son sought each other thus sang eilifr wroth stood ruskva's brother and magni's sire wrought bravely with terror thor's staunch heartstone trembled not nor thialfi's and thus sang eystein valdesson with glowing eyes thrudir's father glared at the sea-road circler ere the fish's watery dwelling flowed in the boat confounding eystein sang further swiftly sif's husband bound him to haste forth with the giants for his hardy fishing well sing we hrimnir's horn stream again he sang the earth-fish tugged so fiercely that ullr's kinsmen clenched fists were pulled out past the gunwale the broad planks rent asunder thus sank bragi the strong fiend's terrifier in his right hand swung his hammer when he saw the loathly sea-fish that all the lands confineth thus sang gamli while the lord of high bilskirnir whose heart no falsehood fashioned swiftly strove to shatter the sea-fish with his hammer thus sang torbjorn lady skald bravely thor fought for asgard and the followers of odin thus sang bragi and the vast misshapen circler of the ship's sea-path fierce-minded stared from below in anger at the skull-splitter of hrungnir again sang bragi 
well hast thou hewer in sunder of the nine heads of trivaldi kept thy goats thus sang eilifer the merciless destroyer of the people of the giants grasped with ready forearms at the heavy red-hot iron thus sang ufr ugason faintly the stout frame thickling a fearful peril called it at the great draught wondrous heavy drawn up by the lord of he-goats thus ulfr sang further the very mighty slayer of the mountain man brought crashing his fist on hymir's temple that was a hurt full deadly yet again sang ulfr vimur's ford's wide grappler against the waves smote featly the glittering serpent's head off with old tales the hall was gleaming here he is called giant of vimur's ford there is a river called vimur which thor waded when he journeyed to the garth of geirudr thus sang vetrlidi the skald thou didst break the leg of lycan didst cause to stoop starkadr didst bruise trivaldi thus sang torbjorn's lady skald thou didst smite the head of kaila smash kjalandi altogether ere thou slewest luter and lydi did spill the blood of busera did hold back hengyankyapta hirokin died before yet sooner in like fashion svivur from life was taken section five how should one periphrase baldur by calling him son of odin and frigg husband of nanna father of forseti possessor of hringhorni and draupnir adversary of hudr companion of hell god of tears ulfr ugason following the story of baldr has composed the long passage in the hustrapa and examples are recorded earlier to the effect that baldr is so termed section six how should one paraphrase nyrdr by calling him god of the vanir or kinsman of the vanir or wain father of freyr and freya god of wealth bestowal so says tordr sjarekson gudrun's self by ill her sons did kill the wise god bride at the wain side grieved men tell odin tamed steeds well twas not the saying hamdir spared sword-playing here it is recorded that skadi departed from jordir as has already been written section seven how should one paraphrase freyr thus by calling him son of njordr brother of freya and also god of vanir and kinsman of the vanir and wain and god of the fertile season and god of wealth gifts thus sang egil skalagrimson for that grotbjorn in goods and gear freyr and njordr have fairly blessed freyr is called adversary of belly even as ivinder spoiler of skalds sang when the earl's foe wished to inhabit the outer bounds of belly's hater he is the possessor of skidbladnir and of that boar which is called gold bristle even as it is told here ivaldi's offspring in ancient days went to shape skidbladnir foremost of ships fairly for freyr choicely for njordr's child thus speaks ulfr ugason the battle-bold freyr rideth first on the golden bristled barrow boar to the balefire of baldr and leads the people the boar is also called fearful tusk section eight how should one paraphrase heimdallr by calling him son of nine mothers or watchman of the gods as already has been written or white god foe of loki seeker of freya's necklace a sword is called heimdallr's head for it is said that he was pierced by a man's head the tale thereof is told in heimdallr galdr and ever since a head is called heimdallr's measure a sword is called man's measure heimdallr is the possessor of guldtopper he is also frequenter of vagasker and singastein where he contended with loki for the necklace brisingamen he is also called vindler ufr ugason composed a long passage in the Husdrapa on that legend and there it is written that they were in the form of seals heimdallr also is son of odin section nine how should one paraphrase tyr by calling him the one-handed god and fosterer of the wolf god of battles son of odin section ten how should one paraphrase bragi 
by calling him husband of idun first maker of poetry and the long-bearded god after his name a man who has a great beard is called beard bragi and son of odin section eleven how should one paraphrase vidar he may be called the silent god possessor of the iron shoe foe and slayer of fenris wolf avenger of the gods divine dweller in the homesteads of the fathers son of odin and brother of the aesir section twelve how should vali be paraphrased thus by calling him son of odur and rindur stepson of frigg brother of the aesir baldur's avenger foe and slayer of hudr dweller in the homesteads of the fathers section thirteen how should one paraphrase hudr thus by calling him the blind god baldur's slayer thrower of the mistletoe son of odin companion of hell foe of vali section fourteen how should ullr be paraphrased by calling him son of sif stepson of thor god of the snowshoe god of the bow hunting god god of the shield section fifteen how should hunir be paraphrased by calling him benchmate or companion or friend of odin the swift of god the long-footed and king of clay section sixteen how should one paraphrase loki thus call him son of farbauti and laufi or of Nal, brother of bielister and of helblindi father of the monster of van that is fenris wolf and of the vast monster that is the midgard serpent and of hel and nari and ali kinsman and uncle evil companion and benchmate of odin and the aesir visitor and chest trapping of geirudr thief of the giants of the goat of brisingamen and of idun's apples kinsman of sleipnir husband of sigin foe of the gods harmer of sif's hair forger of evil the sly god slanderer and cheat of the gods contriver of baldur's death the bound god wrangling foe of heimdallr and of skadi even as ulfr ugason sings here the famed rainbow's defender ready in wisdom striveth at singestein with loki for Bauti's sin sly offspring the son of mothers eight and one mighty in wrath possesses the stone ere loki cometh i make known songs of praise here it is written that heimdallr is the son of nine mothers section seventeen now an account shall be given of the source of those metaphors which have but now been recorded and of which no accounts were rendered before even such as bragi gave to aegir telling how thor had gone into the east to slay trolls and odin rode sleipnir into jutunheim and visited that giant who was named hrungnir hrungnir asked what manner of man he with the golden helm might be who rode through air and water and said that the stranger had a wondrous good steed odin said he would wager his head there was no horse in jutunheim that would prove equally good hrungnir answered that it was a good horse but declared that he had a much better paced horse which was called gold mane hrungnir had become angry and vaulted up onto his horse and galloped after him thinking to pay him for his boasting odin galloped so furiously that he was on the top of the next hill first but hrungnir was so filled with the giant's frenzy that he took no heed until he had come in beyond the gates of asgard when he came to the hall door the aesir invited him to drink he went within and ordered drink to be brought to him and then those flagons were brought in from which thor was wont to drink and hrungnir swilled from each in turn but when he had become drunken then big words were not wanting he boasted that he would lift up valhalla and carry it to jutunheim and sink asgard and kill all the gods save that he would take freya and sif home with him freya alone dared pour for him and he vowed that he would drink all the ale of the aesir but when his overbearing insolence became tiresome to the aesir they called on the name of thor straightway thor came into the hall brandishing his hammer and he was very wroth and asked who had advised that these dogs of giants be permitted to drink there or who had granted hrungnir safe conduct to be in valhalla or why freya should pour for him as at a feast of the aesir 
Then Hrungnir answered, looking at Thor with no friendly eyes, and said that Odin had invited him to drink, and he was under his safe conduct. Thor declared that Hrungnir should repent of that invitation before he got away. Hrungnir answered that Asa Thor would have scant renown for killing him, weaponless as he was. It were a greater trial of his courage if he dared fight with Hrungnir on the border at Grotunagard. And it was a great folly, said he, when I left my shield and home behind at home. If I had my weapons here, then we should try single combat. But as matters stand, I declare thee a coward if thou wilt slay me, a weaponless man. Thor was by no means anxious to avoid the fight when challenged to the field, for no one had ever offered him single combat before. Then Hrungnir went his way and galloped furiously until he came to Jutunheim. The news of his journey was spread abroad among the giants, and it became noised abroad that a meeting had been arranged between him and Thor. The giants deemed that they had much at stake, who should win the victory, since they looked for ill at Thor's hands if Hrungnir perished, he being strongest of them all. Then the giants made a man of clay at Grotunagard. He was nine miles high and three broad under the armpits, but they could get no heart big enough to fit him until they took one from a mare. Even that was not steadfast within him with Thor came. Hrungnir had the heart which is notorious, of hard stone and spiked with three corners, even as the written character is since formed, which men call Hrungnir's heart. His head also was of stone. His shield, too, was stone, wide and thick, and he had the shield before him when he stood at Grotunagard and waited for Thor. Moreover, he had a hone for a weapon, and brandished it over his shoulders, and he was not a pretty sight. At one side of him stood the clay giant, which was called Mukurkalfi. He was sore afraid, and it is said that he wet himself when he saw Thor. Thor went to the meeting-place, and Thjalfi with him. Then Thjalfi ran forward to the spot where Hrungnir stood, and said to him, Thou standest unwarily, giant, having the shield before thee, for Thor has seen thee, and comes hither down below the earth, and will come at thee from beneath. Then Hrungnir thrust the shield under his feet, and stood upon it, wielding the hone with both hands. Then speedily he saw lightnings, and heard great claps of thunder. Then he saw Thor in godlike anger, who came forward furiously, and swung the hammer, and cast it at Hrungnir from afar off. Hrungnir lifted up the hone in both hands, and cast it against him. It struck the hammer in flight, and the hone burst in sunder. One part fell to the earth, and thence are come all the flint rocks. The other burst on Thor's head, so that he fell forward to the earth. But the hammer Mjolnir struck Hrungnir in the middle of the head, and smashed his skull into small crumbs, and he fell forward upon Thor, so that his foot lay over Thor's neck. Thjalfi struck at Mukarkafi, and he fell with little glory. Thereupon Thjalfi went over to Thor, and would have lifted Hrungnir's foot off him, but could not find sufficient strength. Straightway all the Aesir came up, when they learned that Thor was fallen, and would have lifted the foot from off him, and could do nothing. Then Magni came up, son of Thor and Jarnsaxa. He was then three nights old. He cast the foot of Hrungnir off Thor and spake, See how ill it is, father, that I came so late. I had struck this giant dead with my fist, methinks, if I had met with him. Thor arose and welcomed his son, saying that he should surely become great. And I will give thee, he said, the horse gold mane, which Hrungnir possessed. Then Odin spake, and said that Thor did wrong to give the good horse to the son of a giantess, and not to his father. Thor went home to Thrudvangar, and the hone remained sticking in his head. Then came the wise woman who was called Groa, wife of Arvandil the valiant. She sang her spells over Thor until the hone was loosened. But when Thor knew that, and thought that there was hope that the hone might be removed, he desired to reward Groa for her leechcraft and make her glad, and told her these things, that he had waded from the north over icy stream, and had borne Arvandril in a basket on his back from the north out of Jutunheim. And he added for a token that one of Arvandil's toes had stuck out of the basket, and became frozen, wherefore Thor broke it off and cast it up into the heavens, and made thereof the star called Arvandil's toe. Thor said that it would not be long ere Arvandil came home, but Groa was so rejoiced that she forgot her incantations, 
and the hone was not loosened and stands yet in thor's head therefore it is forbidden to cast a hone across the floor for then the hone is stirred in thor's head theodofer of vin has made a song after this tale in the hauslung it says there on the high and painted surface of the hollow shield still further one may see how the giant's terror sought the home of gjotun the angry son of jord drove to the play of steel below him thundered the moonway rage swelled in the heart of mili's brother all the bright god's high mansions burned before ullr's kinsman with hail the earth was beaten along his course when the he-goats drew the god of the smooth wain forward to meet the grisly giant the earth the spouse of odin straightway reft asunder no truce made baldr's brother with a bitter foe of earth folk rocks shook and crags were shivered the shining upper heaven burned i saw the giant of the boat sailed sea reef waver and give way fast before him seeing his warlike slayer swiftly the shining shield rim shot neath the cliff ward shoe soles that was the wise god's mandate the war of valkyries willed it the champion of the wasteland not long thereafter waited for the speedy blow delivered by the friend of the snout troll's crusher he who of breath despoileth belly's baleful hirelings felled on the shield rim circled the fiend of the roaring mountain the monster of the glenfield before the mighty hammer sank when the hill dane's breaker struck down the hideous caitiff then the hone hard broken hurled by the ogress lover whirred into the brain ridge of earth's sun that the wetter of steel sticking unloosened in the skull of odin's offspring stood there all besprinkled with einridi's blood until the wise ale goddess with wondrous lays enchanted the vaunted woe rust ruddy from the wain god's sloping temples painted on its circuit i see them clearly pictured the fair boss shield with stories figured i had from torleifer End of section 17. The Poesy of Skalds, section 18. Then said Egir, Methinks Hrungnir was of great might. Did Thor accomplish yet more valorous deeds when he had to do with the trolls? And Bragi answered, It is worthy to be told at length how Thor went to Geiruder's dwelling. At that time he had not the hammer Mjolnir with him nor his girdle of might nor the iron gauntlets and that was the fault of loki who went with him for once flying in his sport with frigg's hawk plumage it had happened to loki to fly for curiosity's sake into geiruder's court there he saw a great hall and alighted and looked in through the window and geiruder looked up and saw him and commanded that the bird be taken and brought to him but he who was sent could scarce get to the top of the wall so high was it and it seemed pleasant to loki to see the man striving with toil and pains to reach him and he thought it was not yet time to fly away until the other had accomplished the perilous climb when the man pressed hard after him then he stretched his wings for flight and thrust out vehemently but now his feet were stuck fast so loki was taken and brought before geiruder the giant but when geiruder saw his eyes he suspected that this might be a man and bade him answer but loki was silent then geiruder shut loki into a chest and starved him there three months and now when geiruder took him out and commanded him to speak loki told who he was and by way of ransom for his life he swore to geiruder with oaths that he would get thor to come to geiruder's dwelling in such a fashion that he should have neither hammer nor girdle of might with him thor came to spend the night with that giantess who is called grider mother of vidar the silent she told thor the truth concerning geiruder that he was a crafty giant and ill to deal with and she lent him the girdle of might and iron gloves which she possessed and her staff also which is called greeter's rod then thor proceeded to the river named vimur greatest of all rivers there he girded himself with the girdle of might and braced firmly downstream with greeter's rod and loki held on behind by the girdle of might 
When Thor came to mid current, the river waxed so greatly that it broke high upon his shoulders. Then Thor sang this Wax thou not now, Vimur, for I fain would wade thee into the giant's garth. Know thou, if thou waxest, then waxeth God's strength in me as high up as the heavens. Then Thor saw Gjalp, daughter of Geirudr, standing in certain ravines, one leg in each, spanning the river, and she was causing the spate. Then Thor snatched up a great stone out of the river, and cast it at her, saying these words, At its source should a river be stemmed. Nor did he miss that at which he threw. In that moment he came to the shore and took hold of a rowan clump, and so climbed out of the river whence comes the saying that rowan is thor's deliverance now when thor came before geirudr the companions were shown first into the goat fold for their entertainment and there was one chair there for a seat and thor sat there then he became aware that the chair moved under him up toward the roof he thrust greeter's rod up against the rafters and pushed back hard against the chair then there was a great crash and screaming followed under the chair had been geirudr's daughters gelp and greip and he had broken both their backs then geirudr had thor called into the hall to play games there were great fires the whole length of the hall when thor came up over against geirudr then geirudr took up a glowing bar of iron with the tongs and cast it at thor thor caught it with his iron gloves and raised the bar in the air but geirudr leapt behind an iron pillar to save himself thor lifted up the bar and threw it and it passed through the pillar and through geirudr and through the wall and so on out even into the earth eilifr gudrunarson has wrought verses on this story in thor's drapa the winding sea snake's father did while from home the slayer of the life of the god's grim foeman ever was lopter a liar the never faithful searcher of the heart of the fearless thunderer declared green ways were lying to the walled stead of geirudr no long space thor let loki lure him to the going they yearned to overmaster thorn's offspring when the seeker of Edi's garth then giants greater in might made ready in ancient days for faring to the giant's seat from odin's further in the faring forward went warlike thjalfi with a divine host cheerer than the deceiving lover of her of enchanted singing i chant the ale of odin the hill dame's mocker measured the moor with hollow foot soles and the war wanted journeyed till the hill women's waster came to ganger's blood the vimur then loki's bale repeller eager in anger lavish of valour longed to struggle against the maid kinswoman of the sedge cowled giant and the honour lessener of the lady of the sea crag one foothold in the surging of the hail rolled leaping hill spate the rock knave's swift pursuer passed the broad stream of his staff's road where the foam flecked mighty rivers frothed with raging venom there they set the staves before them in the streaming grove of dogfish the windward slippery pebbles smitten to speech slept not the clashing rod did rattle against the worn rocks and the rapid of the fells howled storm smitten on the river's stony anvil the weaver of the girdle beheld the washing slope stream fall on his hard-grown shoulders no help he found to save him the minisher of hill folk caused might to grow within him even to the roof of heaven till the rushing flood should ebb the fair warriors of the aesir in battle wise fast waited and the surging pool sward sweeping streamed the earth drifts billow blown by the mighty tempest tugged with monstrous fury at the terrible oppressor of the earth-born tribe of cave folk till thialfi came uplifted on his lord thor's wide shield strap that was a mighty thew test for the prop of heaven the maidens of the harmful giant stiffly held the stream stubborn against them the giantess destroyer with greeter's staff fared sternly nor did their hearts of rancor droop in the men unblemished nor courage gainst the headlong fall of the current fail them a fiercer daring spirit flamed in the dauntless god's breast with terror thor's staunch heartstone trembled not 
nor Tialfi's. And afterward the haters of the host of sword companions, the shatterers of bucklers, dinned on the shield of giants, ere the destroying peoples of the shingle drift of monsters wrought the helm play of Hedin, gainst the rock dwelling marksmen. The hostile folk of sea heights fled before the oppressor of headland tribes, the dalesmen of the hilltops imperilled fled when odin's kindred stood enduring staunchly the danes of the flood reef's border bowed down to the flame shaker where the chiefs with thoughts of valour imbued marched into thorn's house a mighty crash resounded of the cave's ring wall the slayer of the mountain reindeer people on the giant maiden's wide hood was brought in bitter peril there was baleful peace talk and they pressed the high head bearing the piercing brow moon's eye flame against the hill hole's rafters on the high roof tree broken he crushed those raging women the swinging storm car's guider burst the stout ancient back ridge and breast bones of both women earth's son became familiar with knowledge strange the cavemen of the land of stone o'ercame not nor long with ale were merry the frightful elm strings plucker the friend of sudri hurtled the hot bar in the forge fused into the hand of odin's gladdener so that gunnar's swift speeder seized the friend of Feia with quick hand gulps the molten high raised draught of metal when the firebrand glowing flew with maddened fury from the giant's gripping fingers to the grim sire of trudur the hall of the doughty trembled when he dashed the massy forehead of the hill white gainst the bottom of the house wall's ancient column ullr's glorious stepsire with the glowing bar of mischief struck with his whole strength downward at the hill knave's mid girdle the god with gory hammer crushed utterly glamour's lineage the hunter of the kindred of the hearth dame was victorious the plucker of the bowstring lacked not his people's valour the chariot god who swiftly wrought grief to the giant's bench thanes he to whom hosts make offering hewed down the dolt-like dwellers of the cloud abyss of elfholm crushing them with the fragment of greeter's rod the litter of hawks the race of listy could not harm the help-strong queller of ella's stone folk section nineteen how should one paraphrase frigg call her daughter of fjorgin wife of odin mother of baldr co-wife of jord and rinder and gunlud and gridr mother-in-law of nanna lady of the aesir and asinjur mistress of fulla and of the hawk plumage and of fensalir section twenty how should one paraphrase freya thus by calling her daughter of fjordur sister of freyr wife of odir mother of hnas possessor of the slain of sesrumnir of the gibcats and of brisingamen goddess of the vanir lady of the vanir goddess beautiful in tears goddess of love all the goddesses may be paraphrased thus by calling them by the name of another and naming them in terms of their possessions or their works or their kindred section twenty one how should sif be paraphrased by calling her wife of thor mother of ullr fair-haired goddess co-wife of jarnsaxa mother of trudir section twenty two how should idun be paraphrased thus by calling her wife of bragi and keeper of the apples and the apples should be called age elixir of the aesir idun is also called spoil of the giant tiazi according to the tale that has been told before how he took her away from the aesir Childolfer of finn composed verses after that tale in the Hauslung. how shall i make voice payment meetly for the shield bridge of the war wall torleifer gave me i survey the truceless fairing of the three gods strife foremost and tiazis on the shining cheek of the shield of battle the spoiler of the lady swiftly flew with tumult to meet the high god rulers long hence in eagle plumage 
the urn in old days lighted where the aesir meat were bearing to the fire pit the giant of the rocks was called no faint heart the skilful god deceiver to the gods proved a stern sharer of bones the high instructor of aesir helmet hooded saw some power checked the seething the sea-mew very crafty spake from the ancient tree trunk loki was ill-willed toward him the wolfish monster ordered Miley's sire to deal him food from the holy trencher the friend of him of ravens to blow the fire was chosen the giant king flesh greedy sank down where the guileless craft sparing gods were gathered the comely lord of all things commanded loki swiftly to part the bull's meat slaughtered by skadi's ringing bowstring among the folk but straightway the cunning food defiler of the aesir filched the quarters all four from the broad table and the hungry sire of giants savagely ate the yoke beast from the oak tree's sheltering branches that was in ancient ages ere the wise-minded loki warder of war spoil smote him boldest of foes of earth folk with a pole betwixt the shoulders the arm burden then of sigin whom all the gods in bonds see firmly forthwith was fastened to the fosterer of skadi to jutunheim's strong dweller the pole stuck and the fingers of loki too companion of hunir clung to the pole's end the bird of blood flew upward blithesome in his quarry a long way off with loki the lither god that almost wolf sire was rent asunder thor's friend must sue for mercy such peace as he might purchase to pray nigh slain was luptir then hymir's kinsman ordered the crafty god pain maddened to wile to him the maiden who warded the aesir's age cure ere long the necklace robber brisinga's thief lured slyly the dame of brunnacher's brooklet into the base one's dwelling at that the steep slope dwellers no sorrow felt then idun was from the south by giants new stolen come among them all ingvi frere's high kindred hoary and old to counsel hasted gruesome of fashion and ugly all the gods were this heard i that the staunch friend of hynir oft thereafter with wiles he tricked the aesir flew in hawk wings hidden and the vile sire of giants vigorous wing plume wielder hurtled on eagle pinion after the hawk-shaped loki swiftly the gods have kindled a fire and the sovereign rulers sustained the flame with shavings scorched was the flying giant he plunged down in mid-soaring tis pictured on the giant's soul bridge the shield which painted with stories tore lifer gave me this is the correct manner of paraphrasing the aesir to call each of them by the name of another and to designate him in terms of his works or his possessions or his kindred end of sections eighteen to twenty two the poesy of skalds section twenty three how should the heaven be paraphrased thus call it skull of emir and hence giant skull task or burden of the dwarves or helm of vestry and austry sudri or nordri land of the sun of the moon and of the stars of heaven of the wains and the winds helm or house of the air and the earth and the sun so sang arnor earl's skald so large of gifts ne'er mounted young lord of shields on ship deck neath the ancient skull of emir splendid this prince's largess and as he sang again bright grows the sun at dusking the earth sinks into the dark sea the toil of austri bursteth all the ocean on the fells breaks thus sang budvar the halt for never neath the sun's plain shall come a nobler landward keener in battle onset nor a brother of ingi better and as Tjoldifer of Finn sang, Hjord's son drove to the steel play, high swelled the godlike anger in the mind of Miley's brother, and the moonway neath him quivered. Even as sang Ormir Beriskald, Lady of Draupnir's gore streak, however great I know him, 
the wielder by right he ruleth of the wain's road sees me gladly even as the skald bragi sang he who threw the dead eyes of tiazi skadi's father into the wind's wide basin o'er the abodes of menfolk many and as marcus sang tis long since the dear loved warder of seamen was born on the wave-girt earth-bottom of the storm container each man praises the sublime age of the ring dispenser even as stein herdesarsen sang i sing the holy ruler of the high world tent rather than men for very precious is he his praises tell i and as arnor earl skald sang help dear king of heaven the day's plain help my hermunder and as arnor sang further soothfast king of the sun tents help stout-hearted rogenvalder and as hallvarder sang knuter wards the land as the ruler of all wards the radiant fell hall as arnor sang michael wise of understanding weighs what seems done ill and good things then the monarch of the sun's helm at the doom seat parts all mortals section twenty four how should one paraphrase the earth thus by calling her flesh of emir and mother of thor daughter of onar odin's bride co-wife of frigg and rinder and gunlod mother-in-law of sif floor and bottom of the storm hall sea of beasts daughter of night sister of Auder and of day even as eyvinder skald despoiler sang now the beaming gold is hidden in the body of the mother of the giant's foe the counsels of a kindred strong are mighty as sang halfredder troublous skald in council twas determined that the king's friend wise in council should wed the land sole daughter of onar greenly wooded and he said further the raven abode's brave ruler got the broad-faced bride of odin the land with kingly counsels of weapons lured unto him even as tjoldrifer sang the ruler glad in warriors in the road hull doth fasten the ships of men to the strand's end at the head of the sea keel ridden as halfredder sang full loath to let the land slip i hold the lordly spear prince outer's sister is subjected to the splendid treasure spender thus sang tjoldrifer far off when the dart slow sluggard stood when the sword inciter in ancient days took to him the unripe co-wife of rinder section twenty five how should one paraphrase the sea thus by calling it emir's blood visitor of the gods husband of ran father of egir's daughters of them who are called himingleva dufa blodughada hefring uder hrun bilgya bara kolga land of ran and of egir's daughters of ships and of ships names of the keel of beaks of planks and seams of fishes of ice way and road of sea kings likewise encircler of islands house of sands and of kelp and of reefs land of fishing gear of sea fowls and of fair wind even as ormer berry's skald sang on the gravelly beach of good ships grates the blood of emir as refer sang the mild deer of the masthead beareth o'er the murky water from the westward her wave pressed bows the land i look for before the beak the whale home shallows even as stein sang when the fallow fell walls whirlwinds wove o'er the waves full fiercely and eager's storm-glad daughters tore of grim frost begotten and as refer sang gymir's wet cold spay wife wiles the bear of twisted cables oft into egir's wide jaws where the angry billow breaketh it is said here that egir and gymir are both the same and he sang further and the sea peak slight near slitteth the stormy breast rain driven the wave with red stain running out of white ron's mouth as einar skulason sang the stern snow-wind has thrust out with strength the ship from landward 
the swanland steed sees iceland into the surf receding and as he sang further many a stiff rowlock straineth and the noisy strand of fish gear the sea the lands o'ercometh men's hands oft span the stays and he sang yet further the grey isle fetter urges hyte's raven ship onward gold beaks the fleet ships carry rich that faring to the chieftain and he sang again the isle rim autumn chilly impels the dock's cold snowshoe and thus also the cool land's surging girdle before the beak springs asunder as snabjorn sang they say nine brides of skerries swiftly move the sea churn of grotti's island flower bin beyond the earth's last outskirt they who long the corny ale ground of amlodi the giver of rings now cuts with ship's beak the abiding place of boat sides here the sea is called amlodi's churn as einar skulason sang the sturdy drive nails weaken in the swift swirl where paleth rockney's heaving plain wind puffs the reefs against the stays section twenty six how should one paraphrase the sun by calling her daughter of mundilfari sister of the moon wife of glenner fire of heaven and of the air even as skuli thorsteinsson sang glenner's godblithe bedmate wadeth into the goddess's mansion with rays then the good light cometh of grey sark mani downward thus sang einar skulason where so the lofty flickering flame of the world's hall swimmeth o'er our loved friend who hateth and lavisheth the sea gold section twenty seven how should the wind be paraphrased thus call it son of fornjotr brother of the sea and of fire scathe or ruin or hound or wolf of the wood or of the sail or of the rigging thus spake svein in the nordersetu drapa first began to fly fornjotr's sons ill-shapen section twenty eight how should one paraphrase fire thus call it brother of the wind and the sea ruin and destruction of wood and of houses halfer's bane son of houses section twenty nine how should winter be paraphrased thus call it son of vin's valor destruction of serpents tempest season thus sang ormer steintorsen to the blind man i proffer this blessing vin's valor's son thus sang asgrimer the warlike spoil bestower lavish of wealth that winter snake's woe in trondheim tarried the folk knew thy true actions section thirty how should one paraphrase summer thus call it son of Svasudr, and comfort of serpents and growth of men even as egil skalagrimson sang we shall wave our swords o dyer of wolf's teeth make them glitter a deed we have for reeking in the comfort of dale serpents section thirty one how should man be paraphrased by his works by that which he gives or receives or does he may also be paraphrased in terms of his property those things which he possesses and if he be liberal of his liberality likewise in terms of the families from which he is descended as well as of those which have sprung from him how is one to paraphrase him in terms of these things thus by calling him accomplisher or performer of his goings or his conduct of his battles or sea voyages or huntings or weapons or ships and because he is a tester of weapons and a winner of battles the words for winner and wood being the same as are also those for tester and rowan therefore from these phrases skalds have called man ash or maple grove or other masculine tree names and paraphrased him in such expressions in terms of battles or ships or possessions it is also correct to paraphrase man with all the names of the aesir also with giant terms and this last is for the most part for mocking or libelous purposes paraphrasis with the names of elves is held to be favourable woman should be paraphrased with reference to all female garments gold and jewels 
ale or wine or any other drink or to that which she dispenses or gives likewise with reference to ale vessels and to all those things which it becomes her to perform or to give it is correct to paraphrase her thus by calling her giver or user of that of which she partakes but the words for giver and user are also names of trees therefore woman is called in metaphorical speech by all feminine tree names woman is paraphrased with reference to jewels or agates for this reason in heathen times what was called a stone necklace which they wore about the neck was a part of a woman's apparel now it is used figuratively in such a way as to paraphrase woman with stones and all names of stones woman is also metaphorically called by the names of asinir or the valkyrs or norns or women of supernatural kind it is also correct to paraphrase woman in terms of all her conduct or property or family section thirty two how should gold be paraphrased thus by calling it egir's fire and needles of glacier hair of sif snood of fulla freya's tears talk and voice and word of giants draupnir's drop and rain or shower of draupnir or of freya's eyes otter's ransom forced payment of the aesir seed of firis plain cairn roof of hulgi fire of all waters and of the hand stone and reef or gleam of the hand section thirty three wherefore is gold called egir's fire this tale is to the same purport as we have told before egir went to asgard to a feast but when he was ready to return home he invited odin and all the aesir to visit him in three months time first came odin and njuldr freyr tyr bragi vidar loki likewise the asinjur frigg freya gefjun skadi idun sif thor was not there having gone into the eastern lands to slay trolls when the gods had sat down in their places straightway egir had bright gold brought in on to the floor of the hall and the gold gave forth light and illumined the hall like fire and it was used there for lights at his banquet even as in valhalla swords were used in place of fire then loki bandied sharp words with all the gods and slew one of egir's thralls him who was called five finger another of his thralls was named fire kindler ran is the name of egir's wife and their daughters are nine even as we have written before at this feast all things were self-served both food and ale and all implements needful to the feast then the aesir became aware that ran had that net wherein she was wont to catch all men who go upon the sea now this tale is to show whence it comes that gold is called fire or light or brightness of egir of ran or of egir's daughters and now such use is made of these metaphors that gold is called fire of the sea and of all names of the sea even as egir or ran had names associated with the sea therefore gold is now called fire of waters or of rivers and of all river names but these names have fared just as other figures also have done the later skalds have composed after the examples of the old skalds even those examples which stood in their poems but were later expanded into such forms as seemed to later poets to be like what was written before as a lake is to the sea or the river to the lake or the brook to the river therefore all these are now called new figures when terms are expanded to greater length than what was recorded before and all this seems well and good so far as it concurs with verisimilitude in nature as bragi the skald sang i was given by the battler the fire of the brook of sea fish he gave it me with mercy for the drink of the mountain giant section thirty four why is gold called the needles or leaves of glacier in asgard before the doors of valhalla there stands a grove which is called glacier and its leafage is all red gold even as is sung here glacier stands with golden leafage before the high god's halls far and wide this tree is the fairest known among gods and men section thirty five why is gold called sif's hair loki lafayarsson for mischief's sake cut off all sif's hair but when thor learned of this he seized loki and would have broken every bone in him 
had he not sworn to get the black elves to make Sif hair of gold, such that it would grow like other hair. After that, Loki went to those dwarves who are called Ivaldi's sons, and they made the hair in Skidbladnir also, and the spear which became Odin's possession, and was called Gungnir. Then Loki wagered his head with the dwarf called Broker, the broker's brother Sindri could not make three other precious things equal in virtue to these. Now when they came to the smithy, Sindri laid a pigskin in the hearth and bade Broker blow, and did not cease work until he took out of the hearth that which he had laid therein. But when he went out of the smithy, while the other dwarf was blowing, straightway a fly settled upon his hand and stung. Yet he blew on as before, until the smith took the work out of the hearth, and it was a boar, with mane and bristles of gold. Next he laid gold in the hearth, and bade Broker blow and cease not from his blast until he should return. He went out, but again the fly came and settled on Broker's neck, and bit now half again as hard as before, yet he blew even until the smith took from the hearth that gold ring which is called Draupnir. Then Sindri laid iron in the hearth, and bade him blow, saying that it would be spoiled if the blast failed. Straightway the fly settled between Broker's eyes and stung his eyelid, but when the blood fell into his eyes so that he could not see, then he clutched at it with his hand as swiftly as he could, while the bellows grew flat, and he swept the fly from him. Then the smith came thither, and said that it had come near to spoiling all that was in the hearth. Then he took from the forge a hammer, put all the precious works into the hands of Broker his brother, and bade him go with them to Asgard and claim the wager. Now when he and Loki brought forward the precious gifts, the Aesir sat down in the seats of judgment, and that verdict was to prevail which Odin, Thor, and Freyr should render. Then Loki gave Odin the spear Gungnir, and to Thor the hair which Sif was to have, and Skidbladnir to Freyr and told the virtues of all these things, that the spear would never stop in its thrust, the hair would grow to the flesh as soon as it came upon Sif's head, and Skidbladnir would have a favoring breeze as soon as the sail was raised, in whatsoever direction it might go, but could be folded together like a napkin, and be kept in Freyr's pouch if he so desired. Then Broker brought forward his gifts, he gave to Odin the ring, saying that eight rings of the same weight would drop from it every ninth night. To Freyr he gave the boar, saying that it could run through air and water better than any horse, and it could never become so dark with night or gloom of the murky regions that there should not be sufficient light where he went, such was the glow from its mane and bristles. Then he gave the hammer to Thor, and said that Thor might smite as hard as he desires whatsoever might be before him, and the hammer would not fail, and if he threw it at anything it would never miss, and never fly so far as not to return to his hand. And if he desired he might keep it in his sark it was so small, but indeed it was a flaw in the hammer that the forehaft was somewhat short. This was their decision, that the hammer was best of all the precious works, and in it there was the greatest defense against the rhyme giants and they gave sentence that the dwarf should have his wager. Then Loki offered to redeem his head, but the dwarf said that there was no chance of this. Take me then, quoth Loki, but when Broker would have laid hands on him, he was a long way off. Loki had with him those shoes with which he ran through air and over water. Then the dwarf prayed Thor to catch him, and Thor did so. Then the dwarf would have hewn off his head, but Loki said that he might have the head, but not the neck. So the dwarf took a thong and a knife, and would have bored a hole in Loki's lips and stitched his mouth together, but the knife did not cut. Then Broker said that it would be better if his brothers all were there, and even as he named it the all was there and pierced the lips. He stitched the lips together, and Loki ripped the thong out of the edges. That thong with which Loki's mouth was sewn together is called Vartari. End of Skald's Kaparmal, section 35. Section 36. One may hear how gold is metaphorically called Fula's snood in this verse which Ivinder Skald Despoiler wrought. Fula's shining fillet, the forehead sun at rising. 
shone on the swelling shield hill for scalds all hawkon's life days section thirty seven gold is called freya's tears as was said before so sang skuli torsteinsson many a fearless swordsman received the tears of freya the more the morn when foemen we murdered we were present and as einar skulason sang where mounted twixt the carvings the tear of mardul lieth we bear the axe shield splitting swollen with serpent's lair gold and here einar has further paraphrased freya so as to call her mother of Fnos, or wife of odor as standeth below the shield tempest strong roof ice with tear gold is unminished i reign of odor's bedmate his age the king so useth and again thus horn's child the glorious adornment i own gold wound a jewel most fair to the shield's rim fast is the golden sea flame on the gem freyr's niece the tear drift of the forehead of her mother she bears the raven feeder gave me frodi's seed gold's fostering it is also recorded here that one may paraphrase freya by calling her sister of freyr and thus also a defense of songs full goodly he freely gave me neighbor of sea scales i praise gladly njordr's daughter's golden gem child here she is called daughter of njordr and again thus the awesome stately urger of odin he who raises the struggle stern gave to me the courage stalwart daughter of the vana bride my fair axe the valorous sword motes ruler led geffen's girl to the scald's bed set with the sea flames gold work here she is called geffen and bride of the vanir it is proper to join tears with all the names of freya and to call gold by such terms and in diverse ways these paraphrases have been varied so that gold is called hail or rain or snowstorm or drops or showers or waterfalls of freya's eyes or cheeks or brows or eyelids section thirty eight in this place one may hear that gold is called word or voice of giants as we have said before thus sang bragi the skald then had i the third friend fairly praised the poorest in the voice of the botched knobs ali but best of all to me he called a rock botched knob and a giant ali of rock and gold voice of the giant section thirty nine for what reason is gold called otter's Weregild? it is related that when certain of the aesir odin and loki and hynir went forth to explore the earth they came to a certain river and proceeded along the river to a waterfall and beside the fall was an otter which had taken a salmon from the fall and was eating blinking his eyes the while then loki took up a stone and cast it at the otter and struck its head and loki boasted in his catch that he had got otter and salmon with one blow then they took up the salmon and the otter and bore them along with them and coming to the buildings of a certain farm they went in now the husbandman who dwelt there was named hreidmar he was a man of much substance and very skilled in black magic the aesir asked him for a night's lodging saying that they had sufficient food with them and showed him their catch but when hreidmar saw the otter straightway he called to him his sons fafnir and regin and told them that the otter their brother was slain and who had done that deed now father and sons went up to the aesir seized them bound them and told them about the otter how he was hreidmar's son the aesir offered a ransom for their lives as much wealth as hreidmar himself desired to appoint and a covenant was made between them on those terms and confirmed with oaths then the otter was flayed and hreidmar taking the otter skin bade them fill the skin with red gold and also cover it altogether and that should be the condition of the covenant between them thereupon odin sent loki into the land of the black elves and he came to the dwarf who was called anvari who was as a fish in the water loki caught him in his hands and required of him in ransom of his life 
all the gold that he had in his rock and when they came within the rock the dwarf brought forth all the gold he had and it was very much wealth then the dwarf quickly swept under his hand one little gold ring but loki saw it and commanded him to give over the ring the dwarf prayed him not to take the ring from him saying that from this ring he could multiply wealth for himself if he might keep it loki answered that he should not have one penny left and took the ring from him and went out but the dwarf declared that that ring should be the ruin of every one who should come into possession of it loki replied that this seemed well enough to him and that this condition should hold good provided that he himself brought it to the ears of them that should receive the ring and the curse he went his way and came to hreidmar's dwelling and showed the gold to odin but when odin saw the ring it seemed fair to him and he took it away from the treasure and paid the gold to hreidmar then hreidmar filled the otter skin as much as he could and set it up when it was full next odin went up having the skin to cover with gold and he bade hreidmar look whether the skin were yet altogether hidden but hreidmar looked at it searchingly and saw one of the hairs of the snout and commanded that this be covered else their covenant should be at an end then odin drew out the ring and covered the hair saying that they were now delivered from their debt for the slaying of the otter but when odin had taken his spear and loki his shoes and they had no longer any need to be afraid then loki declared that the curse which anvari had uttered should be fulfilled that this ring and this gold should be the destruction of him who received it and that was fulfilled afterward now it has been told wherefore gold is called otter's weirgild or forced payment of the aesir or metal of strife section forty what more is to be said of the gold hreidmar took the gold for his son's weirgild but Fafnir and Regin claimed some part of their brother's blood money for themselves. Hreidmar would not grant them one penny of the gold. This was the wicked purpose of those brethren. They slew their father for the gold. Then Regin demanded that Fafnir share the gold with him, half for half. Fafnir answered that there was little chance of his sharing it with his brother, seeing that he had slain his father for its sake. And he bade Regin go hence, else he should fare even as hreidmar fafnir had taken the helmet which hreidmar had possessed and set it upon his head this helmet was called the helm of terror of which all living creatures that see it are afraid and the sword called hrati regin had that sword which was named rafael so he fled away and fafnir went up to Genita heath and made himself a lair and turned himself into a serpent and laid him down upon the gold then regin went to king hjelprekker at tjod and there he became his smith and he took into his fostering sigudur son of sigmundur fulsunger son and of hjordis daughter of eilimi sigudur was most illustrious of all host kings in race in prowess and in mind Regin declared to him where Fafnir lay on the gold and incited him to seek the gold. Then Regin fashioned the sword Grammer, which was so sharp that Sigurdur, bringing it down into running water, cut asunder a flock of wool which drifted downstream onto the sword's edge. Next, Sigurdur clove Regin's anvil down to the stock with the sword. After that they went, Sigurdur and Regin, to Gnita Heath, and there sigurdor dug a pit in fafnir's way and laid himself in ambush therein and when fafnir glided toward the water and came above the pit sigurdor straightway thrust his sword through him and that was his end then regin came forward saying that sigurdor had slain his brother and demanded as a condition of reconciliation that he take fafnir's heart and roast it with fire and Regin laid him down and drank the blood of Fafnir and settled himself to sleep. But when Sigurdur was roasting the heart and thought that it must be quite roasted, he touched it with his finger to see how hard it was, and then the juice ran out from the heart on to his finger so that he was burned and put his finger to his mouth. As soon as the heart's blood came upon his tongue, 
straightway he knew the speech of birds and he understood what the nuthatches were saying which were sitting in the trees then one spake there sits sigurdur blood besprinkled fafnir's heart with flame he roasteth wise seemed to me the spoiler of rings if the gleaming life fibre he ate there lies regin sang another reed he ponders would betray the youth who trusteth in him in his wrath he plots wrong accusation the smith of bale would avenge his brother then sigurdr went over to regin and slew him and thence to his horse which was named grani and rode till he came to fafnir's lair he took up the gold trussed it up in his saddle-bags laid it upon grani's back mounted up himself and then rode his ways now the tale is told why gold is called lair or abode of fafnir or metal of Ganita heath or grani's burden section forty one then sigurdur rode on till he found a house on the mountain wherein a woman in helm and burney lay sleeping he drew his sword and cut the burney from her she awoke then and gave her name as hildr she is called brynhildr and was the valkyr sigurdur rode away and came to the king who was named gjuki whose wife was grimhildr their children were gunnar hugni gudrun gudni gotthomer was gjuki's stepson sigurdur tarried there a long time and then he obtained the hand of gudrun daughter of gjuki and gunnar and hugni swore oaths of blood brotherhood with sigurdur thereafter sigurdur and the sons of gjuki went unto atli budli's son to sue for the hand of brynhildr his sister in marriage to gunnar brynhildr abode on hinda fell and about her hall there was a flaring fire and she had made a solemn vow to take none but that man who should dare to ride through the flaring fire then sigurdur and the sons of gjuki who were also called niflungs rode up on to the mountain and gunnar should have ridden through the flaring fire but he had the horse named goti and that horse dared not leap into the fire so they exchanged shapes sigurdur and gunnar and names likewise for grani would go under no man but sigurdur then sigurdur leapt on to grani and rode through the flaring fire that eve he was wedded with brynhildr but when they came to bed he drew the sword grammer from its sheath and laid it between them in the morning when he arose and clothed himself he gave brynhildr as linen fee the same gold ring which loki had taken from andvari and took another ring from her hand for remembrance then sigurdr mounted his horse and rode to his fellows and he and gunnar changed shapes again and went home to gjuki with brynhildr sigurdr and gudrun had two children sigmundr and svanhildr it befell on a time that brynhildr and gudrun went to the water to wash their hair and when they came to the river brynhildr waded out from the bank well into the river saying that she would not touch to her head the water which ran out of the hair of gudrun since herself had the more valorous husband then gudrun went into the river after her and said that it was her right to wash her hair higher up stream for the reason that she had to husband such a man as neither gunnar nor any other in the world matched in valor seeing that he had slain fafnir and regin and succeeded to the heritage of both and brynhildr made answer it was a matter of greater worth that gunnar rode through the flaring fire and sigurdr durst not then gudrun laughed and said dost thou think that gunnar rode through the flaring fire now i think that he who went into the bride bed with thee was the same that gave me this gold ring and the gold ring which thou bearest on thine hand and didst receive for linen fee is called anvari's yield and i believe that it was not gunnar who got that ring on Ganita heath then brynhildr was silent and went home after that she egged on gunnar and hugni to slay sigurdur but because they were sigurdur's sworn blood brothers they stirred up gothormr their brother to slay him he thrust his sword through sigurdur as he slept but when sigurdur felt the wound he hurled his sword grammer after gothormr so that it cut the man asunder at the middle 
there fell sigurdur and sigmundur his son of three winters whom they slew then brynhildr stabbed herself with a sword and she was burned with sigurdur but gunnar and hugni took fafnir's heritage and anvari's yield and ruled the lands thereafter king atli budli's son and brother of brynhildr then wedded gudrun whom sigurdur had had to wife and they had children king atli invited to him gunnar and hugni and they came at his invitation yet before they departed from their land they hid the gold fafnir's heritage in the rhine and that gold has never since been found now king atli had a host in readiness and fought with gunnar and hugni and they were made captive king atli bade the heart be cut out of hugni alive and that was his end gunnar he caused to be cast into a den of serpents but a harp was brought secretly to gunnar and he struck it with his toes his hands being bound he played the harp so that all the serpents fell asleep saving only one adder which glided over to him and gnawed into the cartilage of his breastbone so far that her head sank within the wound and she clove to his liver till he died gunnar and hugni were called niflungs and gukungs for which reason gold is called treasure or heritage of the niflungs a little while after gudrun slew her two sons and caused flagons to be made of their skulls set with gold and silver then the funeral feast was held for the niflungs and at this feast gudrun had mead poured into the flagons for king atli and the mead was mixed with the blood of the boys moreover she caused their hearts to be roasted and set before the king that he might eat of them and when he had eaten then she herself told him what she had done with many scathing words there was no lack of strong drink there so that most of the company had fallen asleep where they sat that night she went to the king while he slept and hugni's son with her they smote the king and that was the death of him then they set fire to the hall and burned the folk that were within after that she went to the shore and leaped into the sea desiring to make an end of herself but she was tossed by the billows over the firth and was born to king jonakr's land and when he saw her he took her to him and wedded her and they had three sons called surli hamdir and erper they were all raven black of hair like gunnar and hugni and the other niflungs there svanhildr daughter of the youth sigurdur was reared and of all women she was fairest king jormunrekr the mighty learned of her beauty and sent his son ranver to woo her and bring her to be his wife when ranver had come to the court of jonakr svanhildr was given into his hands and he should have brought her to king jormunrekr but earl biki said that it was a better thing for ranver to wed svanhildr since he and she were both young whereas jormunrekr was old this counsel pleased the young folk well thereupon biki reported the matter to the king straightway king jormunrekr commanded that his son be seized and led to the gallows then ranver took his hawk and plucked off its feathers and bade that it be sent so to his father after which he was hanged but when king jormunrekr saw the hawk suddenly it came home to him that even as the hawk was featherless and powerless to fly so was his kingdom shorn of its might since he was old and childless then king jormunrekr riding out of the wood where he had been hunting beheld svanhildr as she sat washing her hair they rode upon her and trod her to death under their horses feet but when gudrun learned of this she urged on her sons to take vengeance for svanhildr when they were preparing for their journey she gave them burnies and helmets so strong that iron could not bite into them she laid these instructions upon them that when they were come to king jormunrekr they should go up to him by night as he slept surli and hamdir should hew off his hands and feet and erper his head but when they were on their way they asked erper what help they might expect from him if they met king jormunrekr he answered that he would render them such aid as the hand affords the foot they said that that help which the foot received from the hand was altogether nothing 
they were so wroth with their mother that she had sent them away with angry words and they desired so eagerly to do what would seem worse to her that they slew erper because she loved him most of all a little later while surly was walking one of his feet slipped and he supported himself on his hand and he said now the hand assists the foot indeed it were better now that erper were living now when they came to king jormunrekker by night where he was sleeping and hewed hands and feet off him he awoke and called upon his men and bade them arise and then hamdir spake saying the head had been off by now if erper lived then the henchmen rose up and attacked them but could not overmaster them with weapons and jormunrekker called out to them to beat them with stones and it was done there surly and hamdir fell and now all the house and offspring of gjuki were dead a daughter named aslaug lived after young sigurdur she was reared with heimir and himdalir and great houses are sprung from her it is said that sigmundr volsungr's son was so strong that he could drink venom and receive no hurt and sinfjutli his son and sigurdur were so hard-skinned that no venom from without could harm them wherefore bragi the skald has sung thus when the wriggling serpent of the Vulsung's drink hung writhing on the hook of the foeman of hill giants kindred most skalds have made verses and diverse short tales from these sagas bragi the old wrote of the fall of surli and hamdir in that song of praise which he composed on ragnar lodbrook once your moonwrecker awakened to an ill dream mid the prince's blood stained while swords were swirling a brawl burst into the dwelling of ranvir's royal kinsman when the raven swarthy brothers of erper took vengeance for all the bitter sorrows the bloody dew of corpses o'er the king's couch streaming fell on the floor where severed feet and hands blood dripping were seen in the ale cup's fountain he fell headlong gore blended on the shield leaf of the bushes of lyfe's land tis painted there stood the shielded swordsman steel biting not surrounding the king's couch and the brethren hamdir and surli quickly to the earth were beaten by the prince's order to the bride of odin with hard stones were battered the swirling weapons urger bade gjuki's race be smitten sore who from life were eager to ravish svanhildr's lover and all pay yonaker's offspring with a fair piercing weapon the render of blue burnies with bitter thrusts and edges i see the hero's slaughter on the fair shield rim surface ragnar gave me the ship moon with many tales marked on it End of Skald's Kaparmo, section 41. The Poesy of Skalds, section 42. Why is gold called Frodi's meal? This is the tale thereof. One of Odin's sons, named Skjuldur, from whom the Skjuldungs are come, had his abode and ruled in the realm which now is called Denmark, but then was known as Gotland skjuldr's son who ruled the land after him was named fridleifr fridleifr's son was frodi he succeeded to the kingdom after his father in the time when augustus caesar imposed peace on all the world at that time christ was born but because frodi was mightiest of all kings in the northern lands the peace was called by his name wherever the danish tongue was spoken and men call it the peace of frodi no man injured any other even though he met face to face his father's slayer or his brother's loose or bound neither was there any thief nor robber then so that a gold ring lay long on jalangr's heath king frodi went to a feast in sweden at the court of the king who was called funir and there he bought two maidservants fenya and menya they were huge and strong in that time two millstones were found in denmark so great that no one was so strong that he could turn them the nature of the mill was such that whatsoever he who turned asked for was ground out by the millstones this mill was called groti he who gave king frodi the mill was named hengikuper 
King Frodi had the maidservants led to the mill and bade them grind gold, and they did so. First they ground gold and peace and happiness for Frodi, then he would grant them rest or sleep no longer than the cuckoo held its peace, or a song might be sung. It is said that they sang the song which is called the Lay of Groti, and this is its beginning. Now are we come to the king's house, the two foreknowing, Fenya and Menya. These are with Frodi, son of Friedleifer, the mighty maidens, as maid thralls held. And before they ceased their singing, they ground out a host against Frodi, so that the sea king called Mizinger came there that same night and slew Frodi, taking much plunder. Then the peace of Frodi was ended. Mizinger took Groti with him, and Fenya and Menya also, and bade them grind salt. And at midnight they asked whether Mizinger would not weary of salt. He bade them grind longer. They had ground but a little while when down sank the ship. And from that time there has been a whirlpool in the sea where the water falls through the hole in the millstone. It was then that the sea became salt. The Lay of Groti they to the flour mill were led those maidens and bidden tirelessly to turn the grey millstone he promised to neither peace nor surcease till he had heard the handmaid singing they chanted the song of the ceaseless millstone lay we the bins right lift we the stones he urged the maidens to grind on ever they sung and slung the whirling stone till the men of frodi for the most part slept then spake Menya to the mill coming, Wealth grind we for Frodi, we grind it in plenty, Fullness of fee at the mill of fortune. Let him sit on riches and sleep on down, Let him wake and wheel, then well tis ground. Here may no one harm another, contrive evil, Nor cast wiles for slaying, Nor slaughter any with sword well sharpened, Though his brother's slayer in bonds he find. But he spake no word save only this, Sleep ye no longer than the whole cuckoo's silence, Nor longer than so while one song is sung. Thou wast not, Frodi, full in wisdom, Thou friend of men, when thou boughtest the maidens, Didst choose for strength and outward seeming, But of their kindred didst not inquire. Hardy was Hrungnir and his father, Yet was Tiazi than they more mighty, Edi and our near of us twain are kinsmen brothers of hill giants of them were we born groti had not come from the grey mountain nor the hard boulder from the earth's bosom nor thus would grind the hill giant's maiden if any had known the news of her we nine winters were playmates together mighty of stature neath the earth's surface the maids had part in mighty works ourselves we moved mighty rocks from their place we rolled the rock o'er the giant's roofstead so that the ground quaking gave before us so slung we the whirling stone the mighty boulder till men took it and soon after in sweden's realm we twain foreknowing strode to the fighting bears we hunted and shields we broke we strode through the grey-mailed spear host we cast down a king, we crowned another. To goat Hormer good we gave assistance. No quiet was there, ere Canui fell. This course we held those years continuous, That we were known for warriors mighty. There with sharp spears wounds we scored, Let blood from wounds and reddened the brand. Now are we come to the king's abode Of mercy bereft, and held as bondmaids, clay eats our foot soles cold chills us above we turn the peace grinder tis gloomy at frodi's hands must rest the stone must halt enough have i turned my toil ceases now may the hands have no remission till frodi hold the meal ground fully the hands should hold the hard shafts the weapons gore stained wake thou frodi wake thou frodi if thou wouldst hearken to the songs of us twain and to ancient stories fire i see burning east of the burg war tidings waken a beacon of warning a host shall come hither with swiftness and fire the dwellings above king frodi thou shalt not hold the stead of hlider 
the red gold rings nor the god's holy altar we grasp the handle maiden more hardly we were not warmer in the wound gore of corpses my father's maid mightily ground for she saw the fayness of men full many the sturdy post from the flower box started made staunch with iron grind we yet swifter grind we yet swifter the son of irsa half donner's kinsman shall come with vengeance on frodi's head him shall men call irsa's son and brother we both know that the maidens ground their might they tested young and fresh in giant frenzy the bin poles trembled and burst the flower box in sunder burst the heavy boulder and the sturdy bride of hill giant spake we have ground o frodi soon we cease from grinding the women have labored o'er long at the grist thus sang einar skulason i have heard that frodi's handmaids ground in the mill full gladly the serpent's couch with gold meal the king lets peace be broken the fair cheeks of my axe head fitted with maple show forth fenya's grist exalted is the scald with the good king's riches so sang egil glad are full many men in frodi's meal section forty three why is gold called kraki's seed in denmark there was a king called hrolfr kraki he was most renowned of all ancient kings for munificence valor and graciousness one evidence of his graciousness which is often brought into stories is this a little lad and poor vugr by name came into the hall of king hrufr at that time the king was young and of slender stature vugr came into his presence and looked up at him and the king said what wouldst thou say lad for thou lookest at me vugr answered when i was at home i heard say that hrulfr the king at hleider was the greatest man in the northern lands but now there sitteth in the high seat a little pole and he is called king then the king made answer thou boy hast given me a name so that i shall be called hrulfr the pole kraki and it is the custom that the giving of a name be accompanied by a gift now i see that with the name which thou hast fastened on me thou hast no gift such as would be acceptable to me wherefore he that has wherewith to give shall give to the other and he took from his hand a gold ring and gave it to him then vugr said above all kings be thou most blessed of givers now i swear an oath that i shall be that man's slayer who slays thee then spake the king laughing loudly vugr is pleased with a small thing another example is the tale told concerning the valor of hrolfr kraki that king whom men call adils ruled over upsala he had to wife irsa mother of hrolfr kraki he was at strife with the king who ruled over norway whose name was ali the two joined battle on the ice of the lake called vaeni king adils sent an embassy to hrolfr kraki his stepson praying him to come to his aid and promised wages to all his host so long as they should be away king hrolfr himself should have three precious gifts whatsoever three he might choose from all sweden king hrolfr could not make the journey in person owing to the strife in which he was engaged with the saxons but he sent to adils his twelve berserks budvar bjarki was there for one and hjalti the stout-hearted fit zerker the stern vutur vesedi and the brethren Svitdagr and Baigudr. In that battle King Ali fell, and the great part of his host with him. And King Adils took from him in death the helm battle swine and his horse raven. Then the berserks of Hrofer Kraki demanded for their hire three pounds of gold for each man of them. And in addition, they required that they might bear to Hrofer Kraki those gifts of price which they had chosen for him which were the helm battle bore and the burney finn's heritage on neither of which iron would take hold and the gold ring which was called pig of the swedes which adil's forefathers had had but the king denied them all these things nor did he so much as pay their hire the berserks went away ill-pleased with their share and told the state of things to hrulfr kraki 
straightway he began his journey to upsala and when he had brought his ships into the river Firi, he rode at once to upsala and his twelve berserks with him all without safe conduct irsa his mother welcomed him and led him to lodgings but not to the king's hall fires were made there before them and ale was given them to drink then men of king adils came in and heaped firewood on to the fire and made it so great that the clothes were burnt off hrolfr and his men and the fellow spake is it true that hrolfr kraki and his berserks shun neither fire nor iron then hrolfr kraki leapt up and all they that were with him and he said add we to the fire in adil's dwelling took his shield and cast it onto the fire and leapt over the flames while the shield burnt and he spake again he flees not the flames who o'er the fire leapeth even so did his men one after another and they laid hands on those fellows who had heaped by the fire and cast them into the flames then irsa came and gave hrolfr kraki a deer's horn full of gold the ring pig of the swedes being with the gold and she bade them ride away to the host they vaulted onto their horses and rode down into the plain of the fury and soon they saw king adils riding after them with his host all in armor hoping to slay them then hrolfr kraki plunged his right hand down into the horn grasped the gold and strewed it all about the road when the Swedes saw that, they leapt down out of their saddles, and each took up as much as he could lay hold of. But King Adils bade them ride on, and himself rode furiously. His horse was called Slungvir, swiftest of all horses. Then Hrulfr Kraki saw that King Adils was drawing close up to him, took the ring, pig of the Swedes, and threw it toward him, and bade him receive it as a gift king adils rode at the ring and thrust at it with his spear-point and let it slide down over the shaft socket then hrulfr kraki turned back and saw how he bent down and spake now i have made him who is mightiest of swedes stoop as a swine stoops thus they parted for this cause gold is called seed of kraki or of fury's plain thus sang eyvinder skald despoiler god of the blade of battle we bear through hakon's life days the seed of fury's valley on our arms where sits the falcon even as tildofer sang the king sows the bright seed corn of knuckle splendid gold rings with the crop of irsa's offspring in his company's glad hand grasp the guileless land director with crocky's gleaming barley sprinkles my arms the flesh-grown seat of the hooded falcon section forty four it is said that the king called hulgi from whom halogaland is named was the father of torgerdor holgabrudr sacrifice was made to both of them and a cairn was raised over hulgi one layer of gold or silver that was the sacrificial money and another layer of mould and stones thus sang skuli torsteinsson when i redden reifnir's roof bane the ravening sword for wealth's sake at svoldr i heaped with gold rings warlike hulgi's cairn thatch in the ancient bjarkamal many terms for gold are told it says there the king most gift gracious his guardsmen enriched with fenya's labor with fafnir's midgard glasir's bright needles grani's fair burden draupnir's dear dripping down of grafvitnir the free-handed lord gave the heroes accepted sif's firm-grown tresses ice of the bow force otter guild unwilling weeping of mardul fire flame of orun edi's fine speeches the warrior rejoiced we walked in fair garments in tiazi's councils the people's host countless in the rhine's red metal wrangling of niflungs the leader war daring warded balder not section forty five gold is metaphorically termed fire of the hand or of the limb or of the leg because it is red but silver is called snow or ice or hoarfrost because it is white in like manner 
gold or silver may be paraphrased in metaphors of purse or crucible or lather and both silver and gold may be called handstone or necklace of any man who was wont to have a necklace necklaces and rings are both silver and gold if no other distinction is raised as torleikir the fair sang the kindly prince the load casts of crucibles on the hawk seats of thanes the wrists embellished gives embers of the arm joint and as einar tinkling scale sang the land strong king of lund breaks the golden limb brands i think the prince of warriors lacks not the rhine's bright pebbles thus sang einar skulason the purse snow and the sea fire lie on both sides of the axe-head blood spilling tis my office to praise our foeman scather and as he sang further the sea-glow each day standeth o'er the crucible's white snowdrift and the shield ship's cheeks protecting shelters a heart most lavish ne'er can one melt the silver flagon snow in the fire-flame of the eel's stream-road the feller of hosts all feats performeth here gold is called fire of the eel's stream-road and silver snow of flagons thus sang tordor miri's skald the glad giver of the hand waist of the gold minisher perceiveth that the hermoder of the snake's lair hath had a lordly father section forty six man is called breaker of gold even as otar the swarthy sang i needs must use the breaker of the battle-glow of good men here is the watch war doughty of the wise king assembled or gold sender as einar tinkling scale sang the sender of gold permitteth the silent earth to hearken to song his gifts i gather the prince his young men gladdens gold caster as torleikr sang gold caster makes loyal to him his guard with kingly armor gold's adversary as sang torvaldr blending skald the gold's foe hot coals casteth of the arm the king gives red wealth the vile folk's desolator dispenseth the freight of grani gold towerer as is written here the gold towerer in friendship i got and of the warrior son of the glowing war-blade i make a song of praise woman is paraphrased in metaphors of gold being called willow or giver of gold as hallerstein sang he who casts the amber of vidblindi's boars cool salt drink long will recall the willow of the reed snake's golden river here the whale is called boar of vidblindi this vidblindi was a giant who drew whales out of the sea like fishes the drink of whales is the sea amber of the sea is gold woman is the willow or dealer of that gold which she gives and the willow is a tree therefore as is already shown woman is paraphrased with all manner of feminine tree names she is also called user of that which she gives and the word for user also signifies a log the tree which falls in the forest thus sang gunnlaugr's serpent's tongue that dame was born to stir strife among the sons of menfolk the war-bush caused that madly i yearned to have the wealth log woman is called forest so sang hallerstein with a well-trained plane of singing the tongue i have planed my lady dame of the first song's ale vats forest fair of flagons faggot as stein sang thou shalt o fresh sift tender of the flood's gold fire like other faggots of hjadning's gravel break with thy good fortune prop as ormer stein torsen sang the prop of stone was clothed in garments clean and seemly a new cloak did the hero cast over the meads bright valkyr post as steinar sang all my dreams of the gracious goddess of the bracelet girded soft arms have lied to me the stream moon's unsteadfast prop beguiled me birch as ormer sang for a mark of the birch of the bright hollow ring the palm flame i laid on the dwarf flag in my song oak 
even as stands here the fair-shaped oak of riches stands our mirth forestalling linden even as is written here o dreadful towering elm tree of the dinning shower of weapons our courage shall not lessen so bade the linen's linden man is paraphrased in tree metaphors as we have written before he is called rowan or tester of weapons or of combats of expeditions and of deeds of ships and of all that which he wields and tests thus sang ulfr ugesson but the flashing-eyed stiff edge rope of the earth stared past the gunwale at the rowan tree of the people of stone the giant tester tree and beam as Kormakr sang the beam of the murdering sword twig is taller than our many in the din of darts the sword wins the land for dauntless sigurdr grove as sang halfredr troublous scald the mighty grove and faithful of the shield murderer budded with hair stands in the eastlands safe with ullr's ash warriors here he is also called ash box as arner sang the box of ships bade the regear bring the shields together at early dusk through the spear rain of strife clouds held the autumn night ash as refer sang the strife lord gracious giver sought the maid's bed gold sprinkled the ash of odin's war sleet won the estate of manhood maple as here hail maple of the ice lumps of the hand so spake the burney tree as refer sang since i have appointed to proffer odin's breast sea the war god's verse to torstein the tree of swords so wills it staff as otar sang thou fierce war staff maintainest maugre two kings thy borders with heroes kin where the ravens starved not keen-hearted art thou thorn as arnor sang he gathered the young wealth thorn many great heaps of corpses for the eagles and his henchmen guided and helped the hero end of section forty six the poesy of skalds section forty seven how should battle be paraphrased by calling it storm of weapons or of sheltering shields or of odin or of the valkyrs or of host kings and din and clashing thus sang hornklofi the king hath held a spear storm with heroes where the eagles screamed at the din of skugul the red wounds spat out blood thus sang eyvinder and that hero at har's tempest wore a sark of gray wolf skin thus sang bersi in earlier days i seem not to guns war bushes useful in the sleet of hluk when younger we were so tis said thus sang einar the stark prince lets hildr's shield sails take the sternest crashing storm wind of the valkyr where hail of bowstrings drives the sword blade hammers as einar tinkling scale sang the mail sarks of the warriors firm woven did not shelter the seemly youths gainst hugni's showers of hakun's onset even as here they set the point net's edge band against the point crash urger and again neath eagle's claws the king's foes sank at the clash of gundul section forty eight weapons and armor should be paraphrased in figures of battle and with reference to odin and the valkyrs and host kings one should call a helmet cowl or hood a burney sark or kirtle a shield tent and a shield wall is termed hall and roof wall and floor shields paraphrased in figures of warships are called sun or moon or leaf or sheen or garth of the ship the shield is also called ship of ullr or paraphrased in terms of hrungnir's feet since he stood upon his shield on ancient shields it was customary to paint a circle which was called the ring and shields are called in metaphors of that ring hewing weapons axes or swords are called fires of blood or of wounds swords are called odin's fires 
but men call axes by the names of troll women and paraphrase them in terms of blood or wounds or a forest or wood thrusting weapons are properly paraphrased by calling them by names of serpents or fishes missile weapons are often metaphorically termed hail or sleet or storm variants of all these figures have been made in many ways for they are used chiefly in poems of praise where there is need of such metaphors so sang viga glumer with the hanged god's helmet the hosts have ceased from going by the brink not pleasant the bravest held the venture thus sang einar tinkling scale helm folded strife bold buoy who from the south went forth into guns crash and din swift sigvaldi offered battle sark of rodi as tinder sang when came the burnied hakon to cast away the ring-rent streaming sark of odin rodi's rocking sea-steeds were cleared hamdir's kirtle as halfredder sang the war-sleet hard and streaming of Aegil's weapons breaketh fiercely on hamdir's kirtles of the foremost wave-deer's warriors surli's garments as he sang further thence the bright weeds of surli in men's blood must be reddened i hear it clearly wound fire in cutting showers of iron shields are called tents of hluk as grettir sang hluk's tent razors held their noses together and the heroes of the rainstorm of hildr's shield wall hewed at each other's beards rodi's roof as einar sang rodi's roof's great ice lump for the reign of freya's eyelids grows not less my fair axe head his age my lord so useth wall of hildr as grettir sang and as we have written before ship son as einar sang in the sea olafr's kinsman reddens the flame of the ship sun moon of the ship's cheek as refer sang fair was the day when scatterers of arm fire thrust the clear moon of the cheek into my hand-clasp the coiling track of red rings ships garth as here the swift seller of the spear crash shot through the stained dyed prow garth as it were birch bark truly he was a bitter battler ash of uller as here the snow gusts of uller's ash ship grimly o'er our prince shoot with fullness where are tossing the fearsome covered spike spars blade of hrungnir's foot soles as bragi sang wilt hear o hrafen ketil how i shall praise the soul blade of truder's thief stain covered with skill and praise my king bragi the skald sang this concerning the ring on the shield unless it be that sigurdur's renowned son would have payment in good kind for the ring knave of the ringing wheel of hildr he called the shield wheel of hildr and the ring the knave of the wheel ring earth as halvaldr sang the chief of ranks of combat sees the red gleaming ring earth fly in two parts the white disc the pictured bursts in sunder it is also sung a ring befits the shield best arrows befit the bow a sword is odin's fire as kormakr sang the fight swelled when the warrior the wolf's blithe feeder in tumult fared with odin's ringing fire flame urdur came forth from the well fire of the helm as ulfr ugason sang the very mighty maiden of the mountain made the sea-horse roll forward but the champions of odin's helm fire felled her wolf steed fire of the burney as gloomer gyrison sang at that the land protector let the burney's streaming fire whine hone wedded he who warded him strongly against the warriors ice of the rim and hurt of sheltering weapons as einar sang i received the ice of red rims with freya's golden eye thaw from the upright prince high-hearted we bear in hand the helm's hurt an axe is called troll woman of sheltering weapons as einar sang rye fields sea steeds riders may see how richly carven 
the dragons close are brooding gainst the brow of the helm ogress a spear is called serpent as refer sang my angry murky serpent of the markings of the shield board savagely doth sport in my palms where men in strife meet arrows are called hail of the bow or bowstring or of the shelters or of battle as einar tinkling scale sang the hammering king of swords shook from the sails of hluk the bow hail bravely the wolf's supporter warded his life in battle and hall fredder and the armor of the spear sleet knitted with iron saved not the satyrs of hungry ravens from the shaft hail of the bowstring and i vinder's scald despoiler they said o hurd's land warder thy spirit little faltered when the burnies hail in the wound burst bent were the stringed elm bows section forty nine battle is called storm or snow shower of the hjadnings and weapons are turned fire or wands of hjadnings and this is the tale thereof that king who was called hugni had a daughter named hildr her king hedin son of hjarandi took as the spoils of war while king hugni attended an assembly of kings but when he learned that there had been raiding in his realm and his daughter had been borne off he departed with his host to seek hedin and heard tidings of him that he was proceeding northward along the land when hugni had come into norway he learned that hedin had sailed westward over the sea then hugni sailed after him even to the orkneys and when he landed at the place called hoy hedin was already there before him with his boat then hildr went to meet her father and offered him a necklace on hedin's behalf for reconciliation and peace but if it were not accepted she said hedin was ready to fight and hugni might hope for no mercy at his hands hugni answered his daughter harshly and when she returned to hedin she told him that hugni desired no reconciliation and she bade him make ready for battle so did both parties they went to the island and marshalled their hosts then hedin called to hugni his father-in-law offering him reconciliation and much gold in compensation but hugni answered thou hast made this offer over late if thou wouldst make peace for now i have drawn dine's life which the dwarves made and which must cause a man's death every time it is bared nor ever fails in its stroke moreover the wound heals not if one be scratched with it then said hedin thou dost boast in the sword but not in the victory i call any sword good which is faithful to its lord then they began that famous battle which is called the hjadning strife and they fought all that day but at evening the kings went to their ships now hildr went to the slain by night and with magic quickened all those that were dead the next day the kings went to the battlefield and fought and so did all those that had fallen on the day before so the fight went one day after the other all who fell and all those weapons which lay on the field and the shields also were turned to stone but when day dawned uprose all the dead men and fought and all weapons were renewed it is said in songs that in this fashion the haddenings shall continue until the weird of the gods bragi the skald composed verses after this tale in ragnar lodbrok's song of praise and the beloved maiden of the vein's bloodletting purpose to bring for wrath's sake the bow-storm to her father when the ring-wearing lady the woman full of evil bore the neck-ring of war-doom to the battler of the wind's steeds that gory wound amender to the glorious monarch offered the necklace not for fear's sake at the moat of fatal weapons even as restraining battle she seemed although she goaded warriors to walk the death road with the ravening wolf's dire sister the prince of folk the land god let not the fight wolf gladdening halt nor slaughter on the sand cease hate deadly swelled in hugni when the stern lords of sword din sought hedin with stern weapons rather than receive the necklet rings of hildr and that baleful witch of women wasting the fruits of victory took governance on the island or the axe the burnies ruin 
all the ship king's war hosts went wrathful neath the firm shields of hjarandi swift marching from reifnir's fleet sea-horses on the fair shield of svilnir one may perceive the onslaught ragnar gave me the ship moon with many tales marked on it battle is called storm of odin as is recorded above so sang viga glumer i cleared my way aforetime like earls to lands the word went of this among the storm staves the men of vidrir's sword wand here battle is called storm of vidrir and the sword is the wand of battle men are staves of the sword here then both battle and weapons are used to make metaphors for man it is called inlaying when one writes thus the shield is the land of weapons and weapons are hail or rain of that land if one employs figures of later coinage section fifty how should the ship be paraphrased call it horse or deer or snowshoe of the sea king or of ship's rigging or of storm steed of the billow as horn clofi sang the council stern destroyer of the pale steed of the billow when full young let the ship's prows press on the sea at flood tide geitir's steed as eringarstein sang but though to the scald all people this strife from the south are telling we shall yet load geitir's sea steed with stone we voyage gladly Svaidi's reindeer o son of Svaein, strife valiant thou comest with Svaidi's reindeer long of seam on the seat of sulci the sound deer from land glided so sang halvadr here the ship is also called deer of the sound and the sea is called zulzi's seat thus sang tordr sjareksen the swift steed of the gunnel around sig veered from northward the gust shoved gilfi's stream's mirth the gull's wake horse to southward of almar laying fleetly both kormt and agdir's coastline along the stern by listy the leek steed lightly bounded here the ship is called steed of the gunnel and the sea is gilfi's land the sea is also called gull's wake the ship is called horse and further horse of the leek for leek means mast and again as marcus sang the stream's winterling waded stoutly the firth snake's snow heaps the tusker of the masthead leaped o'er the whale's spumed housetops the bear of the flood strode forward on the ancient paths of sea ships the stays bear shower breasting broke the reef's plashing fetter here the ship is called winterling of the stream a bear cub is called a winterling and a bear is called tusker the bear of the stay is a ship the ship is also called reindeer and so halvadr sang as we have written before and hart as king haraldr sigurdarson sang by sicily then widely the seam cut we were stately the sea heart glided swiftly as we hoped beneath the heroes and elk as einar sang the ring's mild peace dispenser the princely hero may not long bide with thee if something aid not we bound the flood's elk an otter as mani sang what laggard carl with grey cheeks canst do among keen warriors on the otter of the sea waves for thy strength is ebbing from thee wolf as refer sang and the horde diminisher hearkened to torstein true my heart is to the lord of the wolf of billows in the baleful wrath wand's conflict and ox also the ship is called snowshoe or wagon or wain thus sang eyjolfr the valiant scald late in the day the young earl in the snowshoe of landless waters fared with equal following to meet the fearless chieftain thus sang styrkar odasan Hugni's host drove the wagons of rollers or Haiti's snow heaps angrily pursuing the great giver of flood embers and as torbjorn sang the freighter of wave crest seawain was in the font of christening horde scatterer who was given the white christ's highest favor 
Section 51. How should one paraphrase Christ? Thus, by calling him fashioner of heaven and earth, of angels and of the sun, governor of the world and of the heavenly kingdom, and of Jerusalem and Jordan and the land of the Greeks, counselor of the apostles and of the saints. Ancient skalds have written of him in metaphors of Urdur's well and Rome. As Eilifer Gunrunerson sang, so has Rome's mighty ruler in the rocky realms confirmed his power. They say he sitteth south at the well of Urdur. Thus sang Skapti Torodson, The king of monks is greatest of might, for God all governs. Christ's power wrought this earth all, and raised the hall of Rome. King of the heavens, as Marcus sang, The king of the wind house fashioned earth, sky, and faithful peoples. Christ, sole prince of mortals, hath power o'er all that liveth. Thus sang Eilifir Kulnasvain, The host of the beaming world's roof and the band of illustrious bow down to the holy cross, then all glory else the sole sun's king is brighter. Son of Mary, as Eilifir sang further, The bright host of heaven boweth to Mary's bairn, he winneth the gentle prince, of glory the true might, God and man both. King of angels, as Eilifer sang again, The goodly might of God's friend is better than men guess of, Yet the gracious king of angels is dearer than all and holier. King of Jordan, as Sigvater sang, Four angels the king of Jordan sent long ago through ether to earthward, And the stream washed the holy head of the world's lord. King of Greeks, as Arnor sang, I have lodged for the hero's ashes prayers with the lordly warder of Greeks and men of Gardar. Thus I pay my prince for good gifts. Thus sang I Lifur Kulnasvain. The glory of heaven praises man's prince. He is king of all things. Here he called Christ first king of men, and again king of all. Einar Skulason sang, he who compasseth bright in mercy all the world and gently careth for all cause the realm of heaven to ope for the valiant ruler section fifty two there the metaphors coincide and he who interprets the language of poesy learns to distinguish which king is meant for it is correct to call the emperor of constantinople king of greeks and similarly to call the king who rules over the land of Jerusalem king of Jerusalem, and also to call the emperor of Rome king of Rome, and to call him king of Angles who governs England. But that periphrasis which was cited but now, which called Christ king of men, may be had by every king. It is proper to periphrase all kings by calling them land rulers or land warders or land attackers or leader of henchmen or warder of the people. Thus sang Ivinder Skald Despoiler, Who filled the ravens from life was reft By the earth rulers at Uglo. And as Gloomer Gyrison sang, The prince beneath the helmet reddened the sword, Hone hollowed on the geats. There the land warder was found In the grinding spear din. As Tjodolfer sang, Tis my wish that the glorious leader of henchmen, The glad-hearted, should leave his sons the heritage and the sod of his fair freehold. As Einar sang, the valiant souled earth warder on his stern head the helm bears. The bard before heroes telleth the fame of the king of Hordland. It is right also to call him king of kings, under whom are tributary kings. An emperor is highest of kings, and next under him is that king who reigns over a nation and each of these is equal to the other in the paraphrases made of them in poesy. Next to them are those men who are called earls or tributary kings, and they are equal in paraphrases with a king, save that one may not term them kings of nations. And thus sang Arnor Earl Skald concerning Earl Torfinner. Let the men hear how the earl's king, hardy of mind, the sea sought. The overwhelming ruler failed not to thwart the ocean. Next to these, in the figures of poesy, are those men who are called chiefs. One may paraphrase them as one might a king or an earl, 
calling them dispensers of gold, wealth munificent, men of the standards, and captains of the host, or van leaders of the array or of battle. Since each king of a nation who rules over many lands appoints tributary kings and earls in joint authority with himself, to administer the laws of the land and defend it from attack in those parts which lie far removed from the king. And in those parts they shall be equal with the king's self in giving judgment and meeting punishment. Now there are many districts in one land, and it is the practice of kings to appoint justiciars over as many districts as one chooses to give into their hands. These justiciars are called chiefs or landed men in the Danish tongue, reeves in saxony and barons in england they are also to be righteous judges and faithful warriors over the land which is entrusted to them for governance if the king is not near then a standard shall be borne before them in battle and then they are quite as lawful war captains as kings or earls next under them are those men who are called franklins they are those freeholders who are of honorable kindred and possessed of full rights one may paraphrase them by calling them wealth givers and protectors and reconcilers of men headmen also may have these titles kings and earls have as their following the men called henchmen and housecarls landed men also have in their service those who are called henchmen in denmark and sweden and housecarls in norway and these men swear oaths of service to them even as henchmen do to kings the house carls of kings were often called henchmen in the old heathen time. Thus sang Torvaldr Blending Skald, Hail king swift in the onset, and thy sturdy house carls with thee. In their mouths men have my verses made for a song of praising. King Haraldr Sigurdarson composed this The man full mighty waiteth the filling of the king's seat. Oft I find to the earl's heels throngs my host of housecarls. Henchmen and housecarls may be paraphrased by calling them houseguard or wage band or men of honor. Thus sang Sigvater, I learned the warrior's wage band on the water fought that battle newly. Tis not the smallest snow shower of shields I tell of. And thus also, when on the steed of cables the clashing steel was meeting, "'Twas not as when a maid bears the chief's mead to the honor winners. "'The service fee which headmen give is called wages and gifts. "'Thus sang Otar the swarthy. "'I needs must use the breaker of the battle-glow of good men. "'Here is the watch war doughty of the wise king assembled. "'Earls and chiefs and henchmen are paraphrased by calling them counselors or speech friends "'or seatmates of the king.' as Halfreder sang. The counsellor battle-mighty of the prince, whom boldness pleases, lets the feud fiery weeds of Hugni, hammer-beaten, clash upon him. As Snaebjorn sang, the speech-friend of kings letteth the long-hulled steer-rope's race-horse steady the sword-like steel beak of the ship against the stern wave. Thus sang Arnor, my young sons do bear for my sake grave sorrow for the slaughter of the earl, destroyed by murder, the benchmate of our monarch. King's counsel friend, as Halfreder sang. In counsel t'was determined that the king's friend, wise in counsel, should wed the land, sole daughter of Onar, greenly wooded. One should paraphrase men by their kindred, as Kormakr sang. Let the son of Haraldr's true friend give ear and hearken to me. I raise my song, the yeast stream of Seer's snow-covered monsters. He called the earl true friend of the king, and Hakon, son of Earl Sigurdur. And Tildofer sang thus concerning Haraldr, About Alafr's sire waxed the steel knife storm's ire, that of whiteness each deed is worthy fame's mead. And again, Yari's lifer could espy where the king passed by. The brave sainted lord's kin stoutly praised did win. And again he sang, Breath bereft is he who o'er all bore the gree, Of chief's kinsman mild, Haraldr's brother's child. 
Arnor also sang thus in Rugenwalder's song of praise. Heiti's war-good kinsman made wedlock kindred with me. The earl's strong tie of marriage made honor to us rendered. And again concerning Earl Torfinner he sang, the thin made swords bit keenly old Rugenwalder's kin to southward of man where rushed the strong hosts under the sheltering shield rims and he sang further o god guard the glorious kin betterer of great turf einar from harm i pray show mercy to him whom faithful chiefs love and einar tinkling scale sang the house prop of the kindred of hilditun shall not lack hardihood more munificent i am bound to maintain praises end of section fifty two the poesy of skalds section fifty three how are the uninvolved terms of poesy made by calling each thing by its proper name what are the simple terms for poesy it is called poetry glorifying song laud and praise Bragi the old sang this when he was travelling through a forest late at evening a troll woman hailed him in verse asking who passed trolls do call me moon's blank of the giant storm sun's bale fellow in misery of the sibyl warder of the circled ring earth wheel devourer of the heaven what is the troll but that he answered thus skalds do call me vidor's shape smith gauter's gift finder bard not faulty eager's ale-bearer song's arrayer skilled smith of verse what is the skald but this and as kormakr sang i make more glorifying by far or hakon's great son i pay him the song atonement of the gods in his wane thor sitteth and as tordur kolbeinson sang the shield-maple let many swift ships and merchant craft and speedy war-boats or the sea poor the skald's ready song of laud waxed laud as ulfr ugason sang now the stream to the sea cometh but first the laud i sang forth of the messenger of sword rain thus i raised the praise of warriors here poesy is called praise also section fifty four how are the gods named they are called fetters as i Yulfur the valiant skald sang eiriker draws the lands beneath him at the pleasure of the fetters and fashions the spear battle and bonds as till dolfer of finn sang the skilful god deceiver to the bonds proved a stern sharer of bones the helmet hooded saw somewhat hindered seething powers as einar tinkling scale sang i say the mighty powers magnify hakon's empire julnar as i vinder sang we have fashioned the feast of julnar the prince's praise song strong as a stone bridge deities as kormakr sang the giver of lands who bindeth the sail to the top with gold lace honors him who pours deities verse mead odin wrought charms on rinder section fifty five these names of the heavens are recorded but we have not found all these terms in poems and these skaldic terms even as others are not meet for use in skaldic writing methinks unless one first finds such names in the works of chief skalds heaven hlionir heidtornir storm mimir long lying light fairer driving topmost sky wide fathom vet mimir lightning destroyer wide blue the solar planet is called sun glory everglow all bright sight fair wheel healing ray dvalin's playmate elfin beam doubtful beam luminary the lunar planet is called moon waxer waner year teller mock sun fengari glamour haster crescent glare section fifty six which are the simple terms for earth she is called earth as tildofer sang the hardy point rains urger oft caused the harsh sword shower ere under him the broad earth with battle he subjected 
field as otar sang the prince guards the field few kings are so mighty o lifer fattens the eagle foremost is the swede's king ground as hallvardr sang the broad ground neath the venom cold adder bound lies subject to the warrior of the island fetters heaped gold the hone land's lord the hoard dispenseth howder as einar sang brave heroes are defending the hard howder of famous princes with the sword off splits the helmet before the furious edge storm land as tordor kolbeinsen sang the land after the battle was laid low from vaiga northward to agdir south or farther hard is song in conflict fief as otar sang thou fierce war-staff maintainest the fief despite two monarchs with heroes kin where the ravens starved not keen-hearted art thou hludin as Vulustein sang i remember how murky earth yawned with graven mouth for the sender of the gold words of the giant of the hard bones of green hludin country as ulfr ugason sang but the flashing-eyed stiff edge rope of the earth stared past the gunwale at the rowan tree of the country of stone the giant tester fjorgin as is said here i was faithful to the free payer of the stream bed a fjorgin serpent may honor be closely guarded by the giver of the giant stream gold section fifty seven it is correct to paraphrase blood or carrion in terms of the beast which is called strangler by calling them his meat and drink it is not correct to express them in terms of other beasts the strangler is also called wolf as tildolfer sang enough guesting to the ravener was given when the son of sigurdr came from the north the wolf to lure from the wood to the wound here he is called ravener also greedy one as egil sang the greedy one gashed grisly wounds when plashed the red point creek on the raven's beak witch beast as einar sang the guta cold with venom with hot wound gush was reddened the witch beast's warm drink mingled with the water in the sea poured she-wolf as arnor sang the she-wolf's evil kindred swallowed the corpse harm swollen when the green sea was turned to red with gore commingled strangler as ilugi sang there was happiness for the strangler when my lord pursued hosts full many with the sword the necklet miniature pierced the swart snake of the forest thus sang holler he sated the heath beast's hunger the hoar howler in wounds gladdened the king reddened the wild one's mouth hairs the wolf went to drink of the wound and again as tordor sang in blood gelp stud horse waited the dusty pack got fullness of the greedy one's wheat the howler enjoyed the ravener's gore drink the bear is called wide stepper cub winterling ors gibcat tusker youngling roarer yulfudur wolfful sharp she-bear horse chaser scratcher hungry one blomir bustler the heart is called modrudnir dalar dalar dain dvalin dunir durathror these are the names of horses enumerated in the rhymes of torgrimmer hrafin and sleipnir the famous horses valar and letfeti tjaldari was there too goldtoper and goti i heard soti told of moor and lunger with mar fig and stufer were with skevader blacker could well bear thegen silfertopper and senior i heard fakir spoken of gulfaxi and jor with the gods were Blodughofi hight a horse that they said beareth the strength eminent Atridi, Gisel and Falhofnir, Glyer and Skydbrimir, mention too was made of Gilir. These also are recorded in Kalsvisa. Dagger rode Drusil, and Dvalin rode Modnir, Hjalmter, Hafeti, Haki rode Fakir. 
the slayer of Beli rode Blodughofi, and Skevader was ridden by the ruler of Hadings. Vestein rode Valer, and Vifil rode Stufer. Mein Tjofer rode Moor. And Morgin on Fakir, Ali rode Hrafen, they who rode onto the ice. But another southward under Adils, a grey one wandered, wounded with the spear. Bjorn rode Blocker, and Bjar rode Kerter. Atli rode Glaumer, and Adils on Slungvir. Hugni on Hulvir, and Haraldr on Fukvir. Gunnar rode Goti, and Sigurdur Grani. Arvakr and Alsvidr draw the sun as is written before. Hrim Faxi, or Fjorsvartnir draw the night. Skinfaxi and Gladr are the day's horses. These names of oxen are in Torgrimr's rhymes. Of all oxen the names have I accurately learned. Of these, Rauder and Hifir, Rekin and Hir, Himin Hrudar and Apli, Arfur and Arfuni. These are the names of serpents, Dragon, Fafnir, Mighty Monster, Adder, Nidhugger, Lindworm, She-Adder, Goin, Moin, Grafvitnir, Grabakr, Ofnir, Svafnir, Hooded One. Neat Cattle, Cow, Calf, Oxen, Heifer, Yearling, Steer, Bull. Sheep, Ram, Buck, Ewe, Lamb, Weather. Swine, Sow, She-Pig, Boar, Hog, Suckling. Section 58 what are the names of the air and of the winds air is called yawning void and middle world bird abode wind abode wind is called storm breeze gale tempest gust blowing thus does one read in alsvinsmal wind tis called among menfolk and waverer with the gods nayer the great powers name it shrieker the giants and shouter elves call it and hell clamorer tis called the wind is also called blast. Section 59. Two are those birds, which there is no need to paraphrase otherwise than by calling blood and corpses their drink and meat. These are the raven and the eagle. All other male birds may be paraphrased in metaphors of blood or corpses, and then their names are terms of the eagle or the raven. As Theodophor sang, the prince with eagle's barley doth feed the bloody moorfowl. The hoard king bears the sickle of Odin to the gory swan's crop. The satyr of the vulture of the eagle's sea of corpses stakes each shoal to the southward which he wards with the spear point. These are the names of the raven, crow, hugin, munin, bold of mood, yearly flyer, year teller, flesh boder. Thus sang Einar Tinkling Scale. With flesh, the host convoker filled the feathered ravens. The raven, when spears were screaming, with the she wolf's prey was sated. Thus sang Einar Skulason. He who gluts the gull of hatred, our precious lord, could govern the sword. The hurtful raven of Hugin's corpse load eateth. And as he sang further, but the king's heart swelleth his spirit flushed with battle where heroes shrink dark moonin drinks blood from out the wounds as viga gloomer sang when stood the shielded maidens of the gory sword strife eager on the isle the bold of mood then received the meat of wound blood as skuli torsteinsen sang not the hindmost in the hundred might hluk of horns have seen me where to the yearly flyer I fed the wounds full grievous. The urn is called eagle, old one, storm shearer, inciter, sorer, wound shearer, cock. As Einar sang, with blood the lips he reddened of the black steed of Jarnsaxa. With steel, urn's meat was furnished, the eagle slit the wolf's bait. As Otar sang, the urn swills corpse drink, the she wolf is sated. The eagle there feedeth, oft the wolf his fangs reddens. As Tjodorfor sang, the spoiler of the lady swiftly flew with tumult to meet the high god rulers, long hence in old one's plumage. And as stands here, with skill will I rehearse of the storm-shearer my verse. 
and again as schooly sang early and late with sobbing i wake where well is sated the hawk of the cock's blood ocean then the bard heareth good tidings section sixty what are the names of the sea it is called ocean main wintry lee deep way weir salt lake furtherer as arnor sang and as we have written above let men hear how the earl's king hardy of mind the sea sought the overwhelming ruler failed not to resist the main here it is named sea and main also ocean as hornklofi sang when the man scathing meter of the mansion of the rock reefs thrust the forecastle adder and the skiff out on the ocean in the following verse it is called lake as well thus sang einar the lake doth bathe the vessel where the sea gainst each side beateth and the bright wind vanes rattle the surf washes the flood steeds here it is called flood also thus sang refer as was said before wintry one's wet cold spay wife wiles the bear of twisted cables oft into egir's wide jaws where the angry billow breaketh deep as halvader sang the sword shaker bids be pointed the prow of the hardy ship steed westward in the girdle of all lands the watery deep way as here on our course from land we glided on the way to the coast of finland i see from the ship's road eastward the fells with radiance gleaming weir as egil sang i sailed o'er the weir to the west i bear odin's heart sea so it stands with me ocean as einar sang many a day the cold ocean washes the swarthy deck planks neath the gracious prince and snowstorm furrows mona's girdle salt as arnor sang the hardy king the salt ploughed from the east with hull ice laden brown tempest tossed the lessener of surf gold towards sigtun furtherer as bulverker sang thou didst summon from fair norway a levy the next season with din surf ships the furtherer didst shear o'er decks the sea poured here the sea is called din surf also wide one as refer sang to its breast the stay's steed taketh the home of planks beak furrowed and tosses the wide one over the hard side the wood suffers dusky one as njal of the burning sang we sixteen pumped my lady in four oar rooms but the surge waxed the dusky one beat over the hull of the driven sea ship these are other names for the sea such as it is proper to use in paraphrasing ships or gold ron it is said was egir's wife even as is written here to the sky shot up the deeps gleeds with fearful might the sea surged methinks our stems the clouds cut ron's road to the moon soared upward the daughters of egir and ron are nine and their names are recorded before Himingleva, dufa blodughada hefring uder hrun bilgia drufen kolga einar skulison recorded the names of six of them in this stanza beginning Himingleva sternly stirreth and fiercely the seas wailing welling wave as valgarder sang foam rested in the sea's bed swollen with wind the deep played and the welling waves were washing the awful heads of the warships billow as otar the swarthy sang ye shear with shaven rudder billows moisty deep the broad sheet which girls spun on the masthead with the rollers reindeer sported foam fleck as ormer sang the hawk-like heedful lady has every virtue lofen of the foam flecks flame gold faithful as a friend all faults renounceth wave-born as torleiker the fair sang the sea wails and the wave-born bears bright froth o'er the red wood where gapes the ruler's brown ox with mouth gold ornamented shoal as einar sang nor met the forward-minded where the fierce sea on our friends falls i think the shoal be calm not the ship 
wood of the waters downward the fells of fullness fall on the bear of tackle now forward winterling stirreth the ship on glommy's sea path comber as here the comber fell headlong o'er me the main called me home unto it i accepted not the sea's bidding breaker as otar sang in burst the ship sides thin rushed the breaker downward flush stood the wind bane of the wood men endured wild tempest then wave as bragi sang the giver of the waves coals who cut thor's slender tackle the line of the land of sea mews loved not to fight the wroth sea sound as einar sang i sheared the sound from hrun southbound my hand was gold wound when the giver i found fjord as einar sang next i see a serpent carved well on the splendid ale horn let the fjord fire's dispenser learn how for that i pay him wetness as marcus sang i'll not lampoon the chatterer lord of the fearful sword blade who squanders the sun of wetness ill is he who spoileth verses end of section sixty section sixty one what are the names of fire even as is written here not seldom does the fire blaze which magnus sets the stalwart ruler burns habitations houses blow reek before him glow as valgarder sang fierce glow with red-hot embers swiftly from the soot flared straight o'er the tottering dwellings stood up the dense smoke columns bale as here hockey was burned on bale where the sea's broad wake weltered gleeds as grani sang i think the gleeds diminished glami's tracks thus the king kindled embers as atli sang with blood the axe is reddened embers wax burn many houses halls stand aglow now rages the gem good men are falling here fire is called gem also vapor as here half built by the nid side burn the all rulers dwellings i think fire raised the hall's pride vapor shot rhyme on the people hot ashes as arnor sang the isle dane's wrathful harmer with the raumar spared not hard counsel hot ashes made them calmer the hynir's threatening words hushed flames as einar sang flame soon was alight and swiftly took flight all hezing's host the fight they lost flare as valgarder sang the sturdy king's bright flare soared above the castle's bulwark the vikings burst in grimly grief on the maid descended lo as haldor sang there did ye share their jewels while o'er the host the shields low the sword shrieked fiercely never wert thou spoiled of conquest section sixty two these are the time names cycle days of yore generation lang syne year season winter summer spring autumn month week day night morning eve twilight early soon late betimes day before yesterday yester eve yesterday tomorrow hour moment these are more names of night in alsvinsmal night is called among men and among the gods mist time hooded hour the holy powers know it sorrowless the giants and elves name it sleep joy the dwarves call it dream weaver it is autumn from the equinox till the time when the sun sets three hours and a half after noon then winter endures till the equinox then it is spring till the moving days then summer till the equinox the month next before winter is called harvest month the first in winter is the month of cattle slaughter then freezing month then rain month then the month of winter's wane then goi then single month then cuckoo month and seed time then egg time and lamb weaning time then comes sun month and pasture month then haying season then reaping month section sixty three what are the simple terms for men each in himself is man 
the first and highest name by which man is called is emperor next to that king the next thereto earl these three men possess in common all the following titles all ruler as this song showeth i know all all rulers east and south o'er the ship's seat Svein's son in proof is better than any other war prince here he is called war prince also for this reason he is called all ruler that he is sole ruler of all his realm host arrayer as gizur sang the host arrayer feedeth the wolf and the raven in folk moat olafr gladdens in skugul's sharp showers of battle the geese of odin a king is called host arrayer because he divides his war host into companies leader as otar the swarthy sang the leader taketh odin's loved wife the lordless land his a warrior's life lord or lording as arnor sang lord of hjaltland highest of heroes gain the victory in every thunderous sword clash the bard will extol his glory an earl is called host duke and a king also is so termed forasmuch as he leads his host to battle thus sang till dofer he who put to shame the host duke thrust out the eyes of prisoners he who speeds the sacrifices in song i chant his praises signor or senor as sagvater sang o norway's gracious signor grant the wretched as the happy may now enjoy thy wise laws give greatly hold thy word munificent one as marcus sang the munificent prince brought fire's destruction o'er the base people to the pirates death was fated thief compeller south at yom highest flame glow kindle illustrious one as halvarder sang no illustrious one nearer under earth's hazel liveth than thou o monk's upholder the gold miniature danes protecteth land driver as childofer sang the guileless land driver sprinkles crockies gleaming barley as was written before he is called so because he drives his host about the lands of other kings or drives a host out of his own land section sixty four there was a king named halfdan the old who was most famous of all kings he made a great sacrificial feast at midwinter and sacrificed to this end that he might live three hundred years in his kingdom but he received these answers he should not live more than the full life of a man but for three hundred years there should be no woman and no man in his line who was not of great repute he was a great warrior and went on forays far and wide in the eastern regions there he slew in single combat the king who was called sigtrigger then he took in marriage that woman named alvig the wise daughter of king eymundr of humgardr they had eighteen sons nine born at one birth these were their names the first thengil who was called mana thengil the second Rysir, the third grammer the fourth gilfi the fifth hilmir the sixth eufer the seventh tigi the eighth skili or skuli the ninth hari or hera these nine brothers became so famous in foraying that in all records since their names are used as titles of rank even as the name of king or that of earl they had no children and all fell in battle thus sang otar the swarthy in his youth stalwart thengil was swift and staunch in battle i pray his line endureth or all men i esteem him thus sang marcus the reseer let the rhine sun shimmer from the reddened skull's ship on the sea fells thus sang egil the grammar the hood hath lifted from the hair fenced brows of the singer thus sang Ivinder. he played with the land folk who should have defended gilfi the gladsome stood neath the gold helmet thus sang gloomer gyrison hilmir beneath the helmet reddened the sword hone hollowed thus sang otar the swarthy let eufor hear the beginning of his laud all the king's praises shall be maintained and justly let him mark my praise songs measures as stufer sang 
the glory ardent tigi south before niz with two hands beat down the band of heroes glad beneath their shields the host went thus sang hallfredr from skili i am parted this age of swords hath caused it tis greatest of all self-mockings to hope that the king's guard cometh thus sang marcus i bid the hawk-like danish hurry hark to my cunning web of praises halfdan and his wife had nine other sons also these were hildir from whom the hildings are come nefir from whom the niflungs sprang audi from whom the udlungs are come ingvi from whom the inglings are descended dagger from whom come the duglings bragi from whom the bragnings are sprung that is the race of halfdan the munificent budli from whom the budlungs are come from the house of the budlungs atli and brynhildr descended the eighth was lofti who was a great war king that host who were called lofdar followed him his kindred are called lofdungs whence sprang eilimi sigurdur fafnisbani's mother's sire the ninth zigar whence come the Ziklings, that is the house of sigar who was son-in-law of fulsungr and the house of sigar who hanged hagbardr from the race of hilding sprang haraldr the red-bearded mother's father of halfdan the swarthy of the niflung's house was giuki of the house of udlings kjar of the house of the ilfings was eirikr the wise in speech these also are illustrious royal houses from ingvi the inglings are descended from skjoldr in denmark the skjoldungs are come from fulsungr in the land of franks those who are called fulsungs one war king was named skelfir and his house is called the house of skilfings his kindred is in the eastern region these houses which were named but now have been used in skaldship for titles of rank even as einar sang i learned that the hildings sallied to hold the spear assembly on the grey isle the broad shields green lindens burst in sunder as grani sang the dugling to eagle's kindred for drink gave danish blood as gamli naivadarskald sang not long since the young udling with ship's deck and with sword blade joined battle waging fiercely of points the bitter tempest as jorun sang the brogning bade the weapons be dyed in blood of vile folk the people endured his anger houses bowed before red embers thus sang einar the budlung's blade sheared blood on darts was smeared the storm cloud of hildr at whitby spilled thus sang arnor the kin of siklings inureth to the waves the ship's sea tossing with blood he dyes the warships within tis the wheel of ravens as tildofer sang thus the doughty sickling ended his life in dire straits were we the glorious lofdung waited bravely surcease of living the folk who were called lofdar followed king lofdi as arnor sang chief another skjoldung higher than thou shall never be born neath sun's light Vulsung, as Torkel Hamarskald sang, the kin of Vulsungs gave counsel to send me the gold decked weapon o'er the cool waters. Ingling, as Otar the swarthy sang, in the east no mighty Ingling to earth fell, ere o'ertook thee he who subjected to him the sea isles from the westward. Ingvi, that too is a king's title, as Marcus sang, the age shall hear the praise of Eirikir none in the world a prince hath known of lordlier thou holdest ingvi the seat of kings with long-kept glory skilfing as valgarder sang the skilfing kept a great host southward in the broad lands where the swift ships shivered sicily soon was desolated signor as sigvater sang o norway's gracious signor let the poor enjoy give greatly Section 65. Scalds are called bards. 
and in skaldship it is correct to call any man so whom one will those men who served king halfer were called champions and from their name warriors are called champions and it is correct to call all men so in skaldship men are called lofdar also as is written above those men are called skotner who serve the king named skati the munificent from his name every one who is munificent is called skati they who followed bragi the old were called bragnar they who assess the transaction of men are called taxers firdar and firar are they called who defend the land vikings and fleet men form a ship army they who followed king baimuni were called baimar captains of companies are called grooms even as he is called who carries home a bride the goths are named after that king who is called goti from whom gotland is named he was so called after odin's name derived from the name gauter for gautland or gotland was named after odin's name and sweden from the name of svidur which is also a title of odin's at that time all the mainland which he possessed was called ride gotland and all the islands i gotland that is now called the realm of danes or of swedes young men not householders are called drengs while they are acquiring wealth and glory seafaring drengs are they who voyage from land to land kings drengs are they who serve rulers they also are drengs who serve wealthy men or franklins valiant and ambitious men are called drengs warriors are also called champions and troops these are soldiers freeholders are called thanes and yeomen those men who go about reconciling men are called daymen these men are they who are called champions kemps men of war brave men valiant men hardy men overpowerers heroes over against these are the following terms soft weak unleavened leavenless melting one sheath coward skulker weakling qualmish caitiff scamp vile one dog lout feeble one paltry one imbecile bungler son of wretchedness a good man of his hands is called munificent illustrious towerer mighty towerer towering gold giver prince of men wealthy one prosperous heaper up of riches mighty man chieftain in contrast to these are they who are called niggard miser calculator wretched one wealth hiding gift tardy one a man wise in counsel is called wielder of counsel a witless man is called clown oaf gander dupe boor idiot dolt fool madman maniac moonstruck one who thinks much of dress is called gaudy drang glittering one careful of attire tricked out a noisy fellow is called shark skin braggart sheath cleaner fawner brawler good for naught worthless one common folk are called country folk or people a thrall is called kept man serf laborer servant section sixty six each one singly is called man tis twain if they are two three are a thorpe four are a group a band is five men if there are six it is a squad seven complete a crew eight men make a panel nine are good fellows ten are a gang eleven form an embassy it is a dozen if twelve go together thirteen are a crowd fourteen are an expedition it is a gathering when fifteen meet sixteen make a garrison seventeen are a congregation to him who meets eighteen they seem enemies enough he who has nineteen men has a company twenty men are a posse thirty are a squadron forty a community fifty are a shire sixty are an assembly seventy are a line eighty are a people one hundred is a host section sixty seven beside these there are those terms which men prefix to the names of men we call such terms epithets of possession or true terms or surnames it is an epithet of possession when one names a thing by its true name and calls him whom one desires to paraphrase owner of that thing or father or grandfather of that which was named grandsire is a third epithet moreover a son is also called heir heritor 
bairn child and boy inheritor a blood kinsman is called brother twin germain consanguine a relation is also called nephew kinsman kin kith friend kinstave descendant family prop family stem kin branch family bow offshoot offspring head tree scion kinsmen by marriage are further called sib folk minglers of blood a friend is called council mate council giver adviser secret sharer converser bench fellow fondling seat mate bench fellow also means cabin mate a foe is called adversary shooter against one hater attacker scather slayer hard presser pursuer overbearer these terms we call epithets of possession and so also if a man is known by his dwelling or his ship which has a name of its own or by his estate when a name of its own is given to it this we call true terms to call a man wise man man of thought wise in speech sage in counsel wealth munificent not slack and dour illustrious one these are surnames section sixty eight these are simple terms for women in scaldship wife and bride and matron are those women who are given to a man those who walk in pomp and fine array are called dame and lady they who are witty of speech are called women of wisdom they who are gentle are called girls they who are of high countenance are called proud and haughty ones she who is of noble mind is called gentlewoman she who is richest lady she who is bashful as young maids are or those women who are modest is called lass the woman whose husband has departed from the land is called stay-at-home that woman whose husband is slain is called war widow widow is the term for her whose husband has died of sickness maid means first every woman and then carlines that are old then there are those terms for women which are libelous one may find them in songs though they be not in writing those women who have one husband in common are called concubines a son's wife is termed daughter-in-law the husband's mother is called mother-in-law a woman may also be called mother grandmother great-grandmother a mother is called dam woman is further called daughter bairn and child she is also called sister lady and maiden woman is also called bedfellow speech mate and secret sharer of her husband and that is an epithet of possession section sixty nine a man's head is termed thus thus should it be paraphrased call it toil or burden of the neck land of the helm of the hood and of the brain of the hair and brows of the scalp of ears eyes and mouth sword of heimdallr and it is correct to name any term for sword which one desires and to paraphrase it in terms of every one of the names of heimdallr the head in simple terms is called skull brain temple crown the eyes are termed vision or glance and regard swift appraising they may be so paraphrased as to call them sun or moon shields and glass or jewels or stones of the eyelids of the brows the lashes or the forehead the ears are called listeners or hearing one should paraphrase them by calling them land or any earth name or mouth or canal or vision or eyes of hearing if the metaphors employed are new coined the mouth one should paraphrase by calling it land or house of the tongue or of the teeth of words or of the palate of the lips or the like and if the metaphors used are not traditional then men may call the mouth ship and the lips the planks and the tongue oar or tiller of the ship the teeth are sometimes called gravel or rocks of words of the mouth or of the tongue the tongue is often called sword of speech or of the mouth the hair which stands on the lips is called beard mustache or whiskers hair is called nap the hair of women is called tresses hair is termed locks one may paraphrase hair by calling it forest or by some tree name one may paraphrase it in terms of the skull or brain or head and the beard in terms of chin or cheeks or throat section seventy the heart is called grain sheaf one should paraphrase it by terming it grain or stone or apple or nut or ball or the like 
in figures of the breast or of feeling moreover it may be called house or earth or mount of feeling one should paraphrase the breast by calling it house or garth or ship of the heart of breath or of the liver land of energy of feeling and of memory feeling is affection and emotion love passion desire love longing passion should be paraphrased by calling it wind of troll women also it is correct to name what one soever is desired and to name giants paraphrasing giantesses as woman or mother or daughter of the giants feeling is also called mood liking eagerness courage activity memory understanding temper humor good faith it is also wrath enmity mischievousness grimness balefulness grief sorrow ill-will spite falseness faithlessness fickleness light-mindedness baseness hasty temper violence section seventy one the hand and forearm may be called hand arm paw palm parts of the arm are called elbow upper arm wolf's joint finger grip wrist nail fingertip hand edge quick one may term the hand earth of weapons or of defensive armor and together with shoulder and arm the hollow of the hand and the wrist it may be called earth of gold rings of the falcon and the hawk and of all the equivalents thereof and in new coined metaphors leg of the shoulder joint and force of the bow the legs may be called tree of the soles of the insteps of the ankles or the like running shaft of the road or of the way or the pace one may call the leg tree or post of all these the legs are paraphrased in metaphors of snowshoes, shoes, and breeks. The parts of the legs are called thigh, knee, calf, lower leg, upper leg, instep, arch, sole, toe. One may paraphrase the leg in terms of all these, calling it tree, mast, and yard thereof, and in metaphors of them all. Section 72. Speech is called words, language, eloquence, talk, tale gibing controversy song spell recital idle talk babbling din chatter squalling merry noise wrangling mocking quarrelling wish-wash boasting tittle-tattle nonsense idiom vanity gabbling it is also termed voice sound resonance articulation wailing shriek dash crash alarm roaring creaking swoop swooping outburst section seventy three understanding is called wisdom counsel discernment memory speculation intelligence arithmetic far sight craft word wit preeminence it is called subtlety wiliness falsehood fickleness section seventy four expression is of two kinds that which is called voice and that which is called manners manners is also temper writhy also has double meaning writhy is the ill humour of a man and writhy is also the rigging of a ship or the driving gear of a horse far also has double meaning far signifies wrath and far signifies a ship men have made frequent use of such ambiguous expressions as these and this practice is called punning. Lith is that part of a man where bones meet. Lith is a word for ship. Lith means people. When a man renders another assistance, his aid is lith. Lith signifies ale. Hlith signifies the gate in a garth. Hlither men call an ox. And hlith signifies a slope. One may make such use of these distinct meanings in scaldship as to make a pun that is hard to interpret provided one employ other distinctions than those which are indicated by the half lines which precede these cases are there and many others in which diverse things have the same name in common end of section seventy four recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of the prose edda by Snorri Sturluson, translated by Arthur Gilchrist Brodeur, eighteen eighty eight to nineteen seventy one.